everybody, welcome back to Stream 8 of Umineko. We're beginning episode 3 today, and uh, oh boy. I've been looking forward to getting to this one for several reasons, um, all of which I will keep relatively vague at the moment. But uh, I will tell you guys a couple of things. Uh, about this episode, moving into it before we start. Uh, if you know uh, you're one of the people who is here watching this, who is experiencing Umineko for the first time, uh, by the end of this episode, not only will you learn quite a bit of juicy details that you didn't know before about some particular backstories and stuff like that, but also you will gain some knowledge of how exactly to approach. Uh, solving this story. You'll be given a lot of methods to help you do so. Because fun fact about episode 3, uh, so originally when Umineko was being written, uh, Ryukishi released each episode individually and then, you know, he sort of like gathered the responses from the release of said episode and sort of like tweaked his uh, approach moving forward based on like reader feedback basically. And so when he had finished episode two, he was actually pretty much like almost done writing a third episode. But then he saw that people were having so much trouble with episode two and like picking up on what exactly he was trying to lay out that he was like, okay, he tossed the entirety of like the third episode that he was in the progress of writing into like the garbage, basically. He was like, I'm restarting from scratch. Uh, and instead he, like, because, like, the plan originally was that episode 3 was actually going to be even harder to solve than 2. But then when he saw that people were having trouble with it, he's like, okay, I'm going to make episode 3, like, easier. So that people get a leg up and understand how to do this. Uh, so, episode 3 is probably one of the most generous in actually teaching you how to play Umineko, quote-unquote. <clears throat> Menlo Marcells with the $2 Dark Souls voice, easy mode unlocked. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, it's pretty much true. Was the OG uh, episode ever reused for a future one? It was not, although we have heard some details about what it was going to be like. We've seen uh, a char uh, like a scrapped character design for it, uh, and a lot of people have sort of fandomized that never used character as well, so that's fun. But, uh, anywho... Let's go ahead and uh, get going with episode three, Banquet of the Golden Witch. This is a surprise that even now, oh wait, uh, didn't start with the good morning. Let me, let me rectify that. Good morning. This is a surprise that even now you do not surrender. The Golden Witch has exceedingly high expectations of you. Have you perhaps also come to realize the structure of this world? There can be no victory without knowing the rules. Please enjoy a hearty game with the witch. The difficulty level is fair. Fair for you, and fair for the witch. Well, let's get right to it. Oh yeah, and uh, I was testing some things earlier, that's why it's asking me if I want to do chapter select, but we will not do that. We are starting at the beginning. plane immediately. The vase was very, very beautiful, rich with history and value. Even as young as I was, it still forced me to take a deep breath when I witnessed its beauty. Of course, it was one of Grandfather's favorite collection pieces. So that I didn't accidentally destroy its fragile beauty, I was always strictly ordered never to touch it. Hey, welcome to the Little Gizmo, thanks for becoming a channel member. But that just made me want to touch it. You could almost see right through it, and yet it was so elegant, it appeared so weightless, and yet it, it had an indescribable presence. I wanted to see what it felt like to touch a vase like that. However, just as Grandfather had said, it was something that must not be touched. This much beauty arises precisely because it must never be touched. It was a beauty that could only dwell in something so fragile it would break at a touch. 
which is exactly why, if it were to be touched by my impudent finger, it would oh so easily, just like an enjoyable morning dream, fading into nothing as you wake. It vanished, fell, and broke into smithereens. Hey, Iconic Laser with the 10 gifted memberships, thank you so much. I realized that, because of my own foolish curiosity, I had done something that couldn't be taken back. No matter how much I regretted it, no matter how much I apologized, the broken vase would not return to its original form. I would probably be scolded by Grandfather, probably very harshly. Frightened, I ended up breaking into tears and sobbing. As I did, I noticed something beautiful. Lightly dancing, golden butterflies were coming towards me. The beautiful butterflies began to gather, one at a time, glittering fantastically with glowing golden powder. Oh, it's Beatrice. That reliable golden witch, Beatrice, had arrived. The butterflies gathered, one after another, grouped together, and there became her form. She was always on my side. Whenever I was in trouble, she would always appear and help me. Good day to you, princess. Beatrice! Oh. <laughs> oh my, why are you crying so on a day so perfect for a tea party, my princess? I broke Grandfather's precious vase. Oh. Grandfather will get mad at me. I don't know what I should do. <laughs> that is indeed worrying. I believe the master greatly treasured this particular vase. <laughs> It's terrifying even for me to think about what kind of punishment you'll receive. Grandfather was a very frightening person. And once he told you something, if you failed to follow it, he would become mad with a rage that would make even the fallen angels in hell quiver. It, I was intimately familiar with that, which is why I couldn't do anything but shake like this and cry. I hold no magic- oh wait, okay. I hold no magic to scoop up your fallen tears, princess. But if you want magic that will make it possible for you to avoid being scolded by the master, I might be able to do something. R really? If you will believe in my power, princess. The basis of magic power is the power of belief. Miracles will only appear before those who strongly believe. I, I believe. I believe in your magic, Beatrice. I'll start with Canadian two dollars. Are there any, are there any other Beatrices I should know of? Oh, you're gonna be asking that question probably quite a bit. So please, fix this face. Please. If that is what you want, princess. Very well then, leave it to me. When she extended her index finger, a golden butterfly softly landed there and changed its form into her favorite magic wand. Even that was enough to give me a small glimpse at Beatrice's wonderful and great magic power. She pointed her wand at the broken vase, and just like a child's lullaby, she began speaking the magic words. Come, try closing your eyes, and try to remember. What form did you have? It was surely a very, very beautiful form. Please, show me that form one more time. Were they words, or was it a song? No, it was surely magic. After all, can't you see? The pieces of the vase are gathering together in no time at all, and softly returning to the place where they had been displayed, returning to their original beautiful form. Oh, this track is so good. Incredible! See? Now it's back to normal. Hey, thank you for becoming a channel member, member Heartwolf. This way, you will be able to avoid being yelled at by the master. Beatrice, you sure are incredible. It was no trouble for you to repair a broken vase. That's not true. Returning something broken to its original form is a very, very difficult thing. With my magic, I could do no more than make it remember what it was for the time being. Hmm? But the vase really turned back to the way it was, right? That's right. But that doesn't mean that I caused the vase to avoid its fate of being broken. 
I did nothing but make the broken vase remember how it was before it broke for the time being. Magic power that can repair a broken fate to its original form is at a very high level that even I have yet to reach. At that time, the high-pitched scream of a servant could be heard from inside the mansion. When I went to see what had happened, I noticed that several of the servants had gathered and were cleaning up the re remains of the broken vase. From what they said, it seemed that a black cat had sneaked in from somewhere, climbed up on the vase, and toppled it over. I understood the meaning of what Beatrice had said. At the time that I broke the vase, the vase had been broken. Beatrice had shown me that the vase had been restored, but that had been a temporary thing. It didn't mean the fate that the vase had been broken had changed. As a result, the vase had remembered its true fate and broke, but I hadn't broken it. Instead, it had been a cat which had snuck in. That's right. Beatrice hadn't said, let's mend the vase. She said she would make it so that I didn't have to be punished. The fate of the vase breaking hadn't changed, but the fact that I had broken it certainly had. Beatrice had skillfully saved me from danger with that magic. It's very easy to break something. Just like how you, princess, did not require magic in order to break the vase. Fixing something is hard? Is very hard? Yes. So much that you were at a loss what to do and started crying. So it's easier to use magic to do horrible things? To break, to kill is very easy. But fixing and reviving things is very hard, as you say. That's right. With magic, it's much easier to do things like breaking and killing. Therefore, weak witches who lose to temptation become intoxicated with that power which they can easily obtain and neglect their real magic training. Real magic is the power to repair, to revive, to call back happiness which has disappeared, to call back love which has gotten cold. Music's a little loud. Okay, let me turn it down just a tiny bit. And it can call back a forgotten smile to a princess's face. Then, Beatrice, does that mean that since you could fix the vase, you're an incredible witch? My days of training are far from over. After all, I couldn't make the vase forget its fate for even an hour. If it had been my master who taught me magic, I'm sure that, that she would have been able to restore the vase to its original form forever. If, it's, if it broke and broke, she could... Oh, wait, okay. If it broke and broke, she could fix it over and over again? Yes. When one reaches that level, they're possessed of endless magical power. That is the endless level that all witches should strive to reach. As a sign of the highest respect to those witches, we call them an endless witch. Oh wait, an endless witch. That's right. To witches holding the power to mend something endlessly, the concept of breaking doesn't even exist. They are released from all sadness caused by losing things and are promised eternal bliss. Certainly, the human world is full of sadness caused by separation and loss. To escape that sadness, people pray to God and ask for the power to withstand the sadness, believing it to be a test. In other words, a human's life is a journey, searching for a way to withstand sadness. In that case, a witch who could revive all things would be freed from all sadness in the world. In other words, it is eternal bliss. I wonder, if I could become a witch like you and gain eternal happiness, you, princess? <laughs> that would be a long, long, difficult path, you know. I want to be a witch. I want to be happy. I want to be your disciple. Do you have even the slightest doubt in that feeling? No. I want to become a witch, too. All right. Then, until you get tired of it, princess, I will allow you to be my disciple. Will you call me master? Yes, Master. That's a good answer. Then from now on, learn the depths of magic along with me. I'm also in training. Let us both learn magic in the right way, and do our best to reach that blissful level. Yes, Master! Interesting, interesting. But, but enough of that memory. Let's get back to the present with our current Beatrice. Uh, a dream. 
That face brings me back. Endless Witch, was it? A name that I had yearned for in the past as the highest achievement, now just another one of my titles. No, you can even call it a name. Every once in a while, it's nice to feel some satisfaction from that name. Isn't it something that I gained as the result of many days of training? It's a little bit of a waste if I don't feel some gratitude for it every once in a while. <laughs> I shook my head lightly. If it is called the highest level, then that means there is nothing higher. An eternal dead end, the beginning of eternal boredom. Master said it once, that when one is released from all sadness, it is the same as eternal bliss, which is why I think Master couldn't reach that level. Eternal bliss means eternal boredom. That's the beginning of eternal torture. But perhaps all things depend on your point of view. Eternal boredom is the same as a sketchbook that doesn't run out of pages. It means you can draw whatever you want, can put in as much effort to enjoy it as you want. Boredom is the worst poison that kills all witches. To the great witches who hold the title Lady, this is frighteningly true. It is the eternal poison that tortures them because of the eternal bliss that they have reached. Now that I've earned the name of Endless Witch, I truly wish to speak with my master again. Was the result of our training really happiness? <laughs> and I want to talk with her about what true happiness is. Training has no end. When you think you have reached the eternal level, that is the time to regret your immaturity. And it, as if to answer my own words, a memory of her saying something like that entered my mind. <laughs> I see. I'm immature, am I? How nice. How nice. <laughs> Some painfully shrill laughter could be heard. It was from my furniture. Did they break their toy again? Beatrice, Sama! This guy stopped moving again! Even though I haven't played enough at all. What a pathetic man. I hadn't even played at all! Let me play! Let me play! Be silent, you filth. No matter how well Beatrice Sama fixes him, he just breaks right away, because all you do is devour him like starving dogs. You broke him the most, Satan, eh? Because you don't know restraint. My apologies, Beatrice Sama. Please forgive my cretinous younger sisters. Fix him quickly. I'm next, I'm next. Can you not be silent? Shut up! <laughs> just from that single yell, the noisy sisters of the Seven Stakes disappeared and hid. They just mess around, having as much fun as they want breaking him. They only come to me to clean up afterwards. Good grief. My furniture doesn't let me get bored. What remained after the pieces of furniture hid themselves was just the sloppy mess that all, was the... Bleh, that was all that remained of the broken toy. It had no form anymore. Even I find it hard to recall his original form when he looks like this. It's better to make him remember for himself. Oh well. I waved my golden pipe, and I told. I chanted. I made it remember. Come, try to remember. What form did you have? After all, right now you look like nothing but a huge lump of scrap meat to me. I have no idea which parts are the arms and which parts are the legs. If you don't remember from me, I won't even be able to recall your face. <laughs> By the power of the magic, the pitiful pieces of meat began to remember what their form had been. Who was connected to who? Where was joined up with where? That's right, just like that. No, no, you should be a finger on the left hand. And you, the right hand. That's it. Good, good. <laughs> good morning. Feeling awake? Ushiro me a battler. How truly ironic that being awake is even more like a nightmare. <coughs> <coughs> uh, ow, 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 ow! 
If you would just accept that I am a witch, you'll quickly awaken from this nightmare and I'll send you to heaven. I'm the king of Mount Purgatory. There's no way out of this hell without my approval. <laughs> you call this hell? That's no good. Yeah, that's no goddamn good at all. The pain of death, which humans only have to taste once, has been given to you more times than I could count with all my fingers. And yet, how can you keep talking like that? <laughs> That's why I never tire. I never tire of you. Yeah, I'm not tiring either. I mean, I get to pick and choose from those busty babes with dazzling asses in my harem. Thanks to that, I'm not getting tired at all. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Otherwise, I too would be bored. So, my furniture. I fixed him so you can play as much as you want. Thank you very much. Kya <laughs> dibs! Didn't I say you're done? You're done! I'm next! Back off! <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, isn't it, Butler Kun? You're so popular, aren't you? It's hard being a popular guy. Get in line, you beasts. If you stopped acting all tough and started being honest with yourself, this would be much easier on you. It's all right like this. His screams feel so much better this way. All right, let's not break him easily this time. Well, do you hear me? You aren't in control. Soon, Butler Kun. Let's continue where we left off, all right? After locking Jessica Chan's room with the master key, how did they return the key to the pocket of the corpse which was inside the room? For example, uh, uh, that's it. They used a fishing line or something, and just the key went back into the room through the crack in the door. <laughs> Wrong! So naive. Of all the doors that exist on Rokenjima, none has a crack through which a key can slip. He got it wrong? He got it wrong? Right this t Right this time. Wait, right. This time me. My turn. Where should I strike? Me. Back of the hand. That's mean. Then the back of the other hand. I'll take the tip of the nose. <laughs> why, why? Let me do it too. Let me strike too. <laughs> You're just slow, Leviane. You snooze you lose has always been how we've done things. Then I'll take the top of his foot. <laughs> me too, me too. Fine, I don't care. I'll take his shoulder. <laughs> You're sisters, right? Be nice to each other. <laughs> How can you withstand that? Why haven't you realized that your false courage actually makes us more excited? Too bad. False courage and being stubborn are my specialty. No matter how much you try to speak in riddles, I definitely won't accept witches and magic. Even though you can't explain anything with human tricks? Are you a moron? Know your place! It's alright, we don't have to force him to accept it. Any moment now, he'll break down crying with the desire to accept it. Even now, he really wants to kneel down on the ground pitifully and beg for our forgiveness. Ah, <coughs> uh, he's broken already! Beatrice, Emma! Dear me. Since they know that I can revive him over and over, my pieces of furniture don't even hesitate to break him. How troublesome. Endless rebirths give me free reign over endless deaths, too. Before the endless witch Beatrice, all death in life has no meaning. Even death can't serve as the key to an escape from my cage. So, Battler, remember your original form once more. I'll toy with you over and over again. I see, I see. It truly is pleasant to have a toy to play with for all eternity. I see. Could this be the endless blitch, bliss witches gain at the at the endless level? I see, I see. This certainly is a pleasant bliss. <laughs> I'll revive you over and over, kill you over and over. Now then, what kind of murder spree shall I unleash on the next game board? 
Come, bring the noob game board. Why don't we begin the next game? Who's Shiro Mia Battler? <laughs> Listen, don't don't flex on me for endless blitch. <laughs> I I stumble sometimes too. Oh, it's the Opia. Okay, I'll shut up now. After Kronk with the five dollars, common Beatry J W. True. All right, let's jam. What a banger. Also, <laughs> very true about the people's champion, Natsuhi. Sorry about the little freezing. I was just dragging the window. That's why I did that. <clears throat> uh, back to boat physics. Sheesh. Anaki's hatred of cigarettes is a real pain in the neck. Sorry. She's been grumpy since last night. Think you could let it slide? Rudolph and Hideyoshi went out onto the deck and took, some, and took out some cigarettes. Ava had always hated the smell of cigarettes, but when she was in a bad mood, she got even more oversensitive. The two of them had attempted to spend some relaxed time smoking until they made it to the island, but they had gotten yelled at and chased out onto the deck. Hideyoshi tried to use his lighter, but it didn't go well with all of the strong winds on deck. Rudolph took out a zippo with a stylish gesture and let Hideyoshi borrow the flame. When'd you start smoking, Hideyoshi Nissan? Just after the war. In the beginning, I was rolling them. Then I started using what I was selling. <laughs> so, you were already smoking when you met Aniki. I bet she's always telling you to stop. I never listened to her, so she's already completely given up on that. <laughs> Looks like men have got to be stubborn. Hideyoshi laughed heartily, but Rudolph chuckled. After being scolded by Ava and told to smoke outside, they had dejectedly fled to the deck together. There was almost no doubt he was under her thumb. She isn't usually so short-tempered. Nah, she's usually a more gentle, quiet woman. Every year she changes when this day comes. Is that so? To me, she just looked like the Aniki we've all known for so long. That's right. She goes back to being Ava of the Ushiramiya family. But that's different from the Ava who's with me. Well, I can understand why she's grumpy. And this family conference is gonna be a pain. Sure is. The plan to threaten money that plan to threaten money out of Kraus Nissan. It's a family conference only in name. Really, it's just a fight between the siblings. With the family conference ahead of them, the three siblings excluding Kraus had made a secret contract. Each of them had a pressing situation to deal with and urgently needed a lot of money and the only one who could help them was Kraus, who spoke for the Ushiramiya head since Kinzo was shut up in his study. They had long felt that Kraus had started taking advantage of Kinzo's loss of interest in his own wealth, and was embezzling that wealth for his own use. When everything had been going well for the siblings, even though they had found it detestable, they had pretended not to notice. But now that they needed money, they couldn't just quietly accept that. Ava had called Rudolph and Rosa into an alliance, and they were planning to exploit that knowledge in order to draw money out of Kraus. Rudolph can... Both you and I are company presidents. We're responsible for the livelihood of our employees. 
Rosa's a president, too. Well, as a hobby. That's right. Yeah, sorry. In short, all of us are bearing some burden. Now that I've thrown the gauntlet down in front of the executive board, I gotta bring in the money. Even if it means I have to grovel or even drink mud. Same here. I can't betray my employees who've trusted me and followed me for so long. That's why I gotta get some money out of Kraus Nissan, even if I have to grab him by the neck. Aniki's always been at odds with Aniki, and now she has a full-on confrontation with him. That's probably enough to make her grumpy. So, Ava's always been on bad terms with Kraus Nissan, then? She doesn't talk to you about it? Definitely, yeah, in a really big way. She won't tell me about the past even if I ask. She probably doesn't want to remember. Aniki has always been smart and shrewd. Her grades were good, too. Compared to that, Aniki was just average. Her being there beside him should have been enough pressure, but Aniki kept boasting about it and driving Aniki into a corner. Silly girl. Why should be so up openly hostile like that and drive him into a corner? That's not being shrewd. <laughs> Seriously. Aniki regretted being born a woman. She probably couldn't forgive Aniki for getting to succeed the head just because he was a man. So she'd ta always take every opportunity to boast to Dad that she was superior. Father really is an old-fashioned person. His values discriminate between men and women. You think that Father disliked Ava a bit since she tries to make herself conspicuous? Gender politics. <clears throat> Don't you think that schooling for women is like sugar and black tea? Without it, it's a it is bland, but too much of it ruins the tea. God, fuck you, Kraus. Since you can still drink black tea without sugar, it was exactly the same as saying that study was unnecessary for a woman. Those infuriating words were ones that my older brother had abused me with when I had been in despair, wanting to go to college, but denied by father. I had protested that advancing to college was essential if I was to acquire the education in class befitting the eldest daughter of the Ashiramiya family. But the replies I received from father and my brother were, in summary, exactly the same. How conceited for a woman. Since the time I was born into the Ashiramiya family, I hadn't taken that name lightly even once. And furthermore, nor had I ever taken f lightly father's name, Shiramiya Kinzo. It was an old family with a long history, but it had lost all its wealth and its business in the great Kanto earthquake, and almost sank for a time. Then, father, with his ingenious talent, had taken control and revived it to be even greater than it had been before. I hadn't forgotten even once what it meant to be the daughter of that great Shiramiya Kinzo. Therefore, I had always made every effort to become worthy of that name, class worthy of the Ashiramiya family, schooling, manners, and leadership. Even if I was far from reaching father's level, I deepened my knowledge in economics and finance and tried to improve myself so that I could help out with that at any time. However, in the end, there never came a time when father acknowledged that. To father, a woman that was only meant to support a man, uh, wait, to father, a woman was only meant to support a man and nothing further than that was permissible. I wonder when it was that I understood that. I probably understood it ever since, ever since I was a young girl. But to truly accept it, I had to wait until I had, to, I had grown up. Compared to my own effort, you couldn't have said that Kraus, as my older brother by two years, tried at all to become deserving of the Ashiramiya family by name. Ever since we were young, my brother kept saying that it was natural that he'd succeed father, just because he was born a man. He kept repeating that, as though it was an absolute gap between us. I couldn't stand it. Even though I always got better grades than my brother. Even though I became class president while he was stuck as vice president of his class. Even so, my brother was considered to be the appropriate person to succeed the Ushiramiya family just because he was a man. Of course, you could get away with gender discrimination in those days. No, it was even considered a virtue in those days. It was a time when women were looked down upon, and it was said that when a woman is born, she is to obey her parents, when she gets married, she is to obey her husband, and when she gets old, she is to obey her children. But because of the, that way of thinking existed, I wanted to overturn it. 
Innocently, I kept trying to prove that I was the most fit. However, eventually I realized that all of my efforts were doomed from the beginning. Don't you think that schooling for women is like sugar and black tea? Without it, it is bland, but too much of it ruins the tea. What do you mean by that, Nissan? In the same way that there are things that only men can do, there are also things that only women can do, or they're not. I think things like giving birth to children, raising them and supporting their husband can only be done by women. Are you trying to say there's no need for a woman to do things like work and study? I wouldn't go that far. On school, women are just tiring to talk to. However, women who are too smart are even more tiring. I think that a woman like you, who vehemently asserts herself, would cause her future husband a lot of trouble. Are you trying to say that a woman must marry and stay in the shadow of their husband? That's none of your business! I admire you as my little sister for feeling that you should respect father and become a proper daughter for him. Even I can respect that. Disgusting. What is the? Oh, what is this watashi? Neutral, polite, I... You've always used ore! Are you already pretending to be the head? It was decided that I would suc- Oh wait, okay, yeah. It was decided that I would succeed the head from the beginning. And yet you seem to be laboring under the illusion that you can become the head, and have just been making useless and reckless attempts to do that. Reckless attempts, you say? Is my saying that I want to go to college really that odd? Yes, it is odd. Indeed, you're the eldest daughter of the glorious Ushirimiya family. Eventually, you'll bear the responsibility of that family crest and be wed to the partner who is most valuable for father. However, what will be demanded of you then is not an excess of knowledge. It is gentle feelings to care for your husband and ability in housework, and it's a humble demeanor that will support the master of your household. You're completely lacking in all of those things. In the end, is that really proper for a daughter of the Ushirimiya family? I have no intention of being a secluded daughter. I just want to become the best person who can help father with his work. In which case, you should you not be aiming to become worthy as a daughter of the Ushirimiya family? What is it with you? Even at this age, you still act like a man. You're careless with housework and cooking, and you never wear any makeup to please men. Recently, I've heard that you've even begun training to learn how to brawl. Th that's rude! It isn't brawling. The martial arts are the perfect training for the mind. At that, and at that proper time, I can act like a woman well enough. What are you trying to say? That women should be slaves who work for men? That women must not step out in front? Is that what you're trying to say? It isn't elegant to admit that. But in order to correct your mistake, I think that a few unpleasant words are necessary. So, let me say it plainly. Women exist to serve men, and men exist to cultivate women. A woman's job is to protect a man's back, to protect their house and raise their children. Normally, they don't have to be told that to realize it. They realize it by themselves. But no matter how old you get, you haven't realized that about yourself. So as your brother, I will clear away that misunderstanding for you before you exit this house into society. You should thank me. Th that is an insult to all women! No, wait. I've never thought of myself as a woman. I've never depended on anyone because I'm a woman. How am I inferior to you, Nissan? In grades and accomplishments, I'm better than you in everything. So how can you look down on me when you don't have anything I don't except being a man? It's about whether or not you know your place. Every day I've been raised so that I would be prepared to be the next head. In the future, that will definitely be essential. But you are different. Even though you will marry and lose the Ushiramiya family name, you keep seeing this illusion that you don't need to see. What are you so unsatisfied about? Even if you were born as a man, it still wouldn't be you who would succeed the head. What's so unsatisfying that you keep attacking me? What's so unsatisfying, you say? Oops. Nissan, you are always, 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 always! You claim yourself as the successor. Look down on me! And despite that... <coughs> What's so unsatisfying, he says? A billion grudges, hard feelings, humiliations that I'll never forget crossed through the back of my mind. And all of them built up at the same time, coming out of my throat as nothing more than a shameful moan. What is all of this noise? God isn't the only one who values silence. But father... Father! Our sibling fight was probably overheard. Father entered with a clearly displeased face. Krauss, are you fighting with your siblings again? Why do you not have the dignity to lead your siblings? How shameful! You are a joke of an eldest son! In a flash, he struck Krauss's face, 
I prepared myself to be struck in the same way, but I wasn't hit. My apologies, Father. Dignity isn't the only thing you lack. There's much more. You're immature in everything. And even so, you pretend like you're an adult. Realize that it's a hundred years too early for you to talk like that and devote yourself to your studies. Don't make me lament my son's incompetence anymore. Yes, I will continue to strive that I can become a person worthy to succeed you, Father. It was as if those words were directed at me. Even when he was being yelled at by Father, he was still bragging to me about how he was special, about how he was the successor. I just couldn't stand it, and finally spoke what was on my mind, even though I realized that this was improper for a person of the Oshiramiya family. Father! Please, tell me how am I inferior? Until today I've tried so hard, studied so hard to become a person who would not shame your name. Please, tell me, in what way am I inferior? How can I improve myself so that you will accept me? Are you still talking about that? How many times do I have to tell you? I have no expectations for you whatsoever. A woman should just learn cooking and sewing like a woman. You have none of the necessary attitude of a woman. I can't sense any of the disposition needed to serve a husband, the heart to devote yourself to a man. What good are you as a woman? Do you realize that you're a daughter of the Ushiramiya family? And yet the only thing you want to learn is how to act like a man. Your duty is not to act like Kraus. Do you even understand your, your own duty? As a person of the Ushiramiya family, I, I won't embarrass your ne- That's it! Right there! You're already wrong! Your duty is to marry out of the family and bring me a man who is profitable to me. And then devote yourself to your husband, be fruitful and multiply. Be a good wife who brings praise to your husband's family. What can you do that is capable of pleasing a man? Do you think you can make tea? Do you have any talent in cook? I won't let you use the name Ushiramiya! Disinherit it! Disinherit it! <coughs> Father, but stay strong. Oh, stream issues? Uh, yeah, it froze for a bit. Is it back? Seems to be back. Okay. Interesting. Strange. All right. Well, we'll see. Uh, just let me know if anything goes awry again. I suppose. <coughs> Father, stay strong. Please, calm down. Genji-san, could you bring back some water? Yes. Immediately. Ava, leave this place. He doesn't mean what he says. I'll calm him down. <coughs> disinherit it! If you won't listen to me, you'll disinherit it! <coughs> As father struggled with a fit of heavy coughs, my brother patted his back as if that were naturally his duty. It was so vexing for me then to let him monopolize that duty. If I approached father carelessly, I would probably be hit again. However, I fearlessly tried to approach father's back. Genji blocked me. Eva-sama, it would probably be better if you stepped outside for now. The master is not in a good mood today. But... but... <coughs> Why are my children so incompetent? Kraus is lacking in dignity. Ava never moves on from being a stubborn tomboy. I have no manly son, not even a womanly daughter. Where did I go wrong raising them? Why, Genji? When and where and how did I go wrong? My lord, you have done nothing wrong. Kraus sama has grown into a sturdy son, and Ava sama into a lovely daughter. You haven't made any mistakes. In what way? In what way is she lovely? Far from a lady, she's always acting like a man! <coughs> Disinherited! Disinherited! <coughs> Father, I was just warning Ava about that very thing. Ava too promised that she would have a change of heart and begin acting like a lady. Couldn't you postpone that for just a little longer? Lady, my foot! <coughs> Disinherited! Disinherited! <coughs> Go quickly, and I'll handle this for you. Kraus gave me a look, telling me that. Oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy. 
Did I take the wrong path? Just like father and my brother had said. They were right that I had never studied how to become a lady. Everything I had learned was because I had hoped that I could help father someday. Wait, was that really the case? Hadn't I always had a, held a growing sense of rivalry with my brother, with whom I'd had a bad relationship since I was a young girl? And wasn't I just trying to get the better of him by stealing his position as successor to the head? Every time, my brother told me that men should be manly and women should be womanly. I had been tormented by this unreasonable discrimination because of my sex, something I was born with and couldn't do anything about. I had resisted, had endeavored to study until today so that I could prove that I wasn't inferior, even though I was a woman. In that case, wasn't the basis of my love, of learning, just a boring inferiority complex toward my brother? Father had expected me to be a lady with whom he could go out in public and not be embarrassed. Had I betrayed that expectation and earned grades to intimidate my brother, just to clear away that pent-up resentment from my childhood? That's not it. You vowed to me that I would become the successor to the Ashiramiya family. You, the one who came whispering to me, was myself, born in my heart on the day I made that vow. Myself on that day as a little girl. That's right. She was my only ally. Whenever I was suffering, whenever I felt like I could take no more, she would always quietly appear and take my side. Whenever I found myself with my head in my hands, stumbling over difficult problems, she would always appear and support me. As I had grown and forgotten my time as a girl, I'd also begun to forget my conversations with her. I, Ashiramiya Ava, will definitely become the head of the Ashiramiya family, and I'll triumph over that irritating, arrogant Kraus. On that day, we promised to do our best together to achieve that. That's right, we promised, on that day, that I would become the successor to the head. On that day, when I had been overcome with sadness, wondering why I was even alive, you appeared inside me and lent me your strength. I wanted Father to accept me. I wanted to get the better of my brother. I believed that if I could do that, I could forever part ways with that wretched part of myself. In those days, I really believed that I had no other purpose in life than to be looked down upon by my brother. It's painful just remembering those days. The wound, the terror that split open in my heart. She taught me how to sew up that wound. I would change my anger into effort and improve myself, become a person more worthy to be head than Krauss was, and triumph over him by making father accept me. The perfect revenge. I knew more or less that a woman couldn't succeed the head. But if I could become so superior that I could overturn that, then surely even father would select me to be his successor. If that happened, then I could have the greatest, ultimate, most perfect revenge against my brother, who always acted like it was completely natural for him to succeed the head. Right. If we do that, then the wounds in our heart will be healed. We promised each other that we would do our best until that day came. And yet you're breaking this promise? Scum. Coward. Why not give up and die forever? Even though she has the form of my young self, she is still another me. And she has a sharp tongue. After all, she is me. It really makes me mad hearing that from myself. You have no right to speak of me like that. Then let's use that anger and learn from it. Changing anger into power is my magic. I've saved you from several predicaments with that power and allowed you to achieve things that should have been impossible for you. As long as you have my magic, there's nothing you can't do. That's right. Anger has always been my driving force. I wonder when I, when it was that I forgot that. If you have remembered me again, that magic is ours once more. Come on, let's turn that anger into power and endeavor in our studies even more, all right? I'm sure that we will still have a lot more studying that we need to do. Let's go to college, study more and more, get excellent grades and drive Kraus into a corner. That guy makes a face as though we're nothing, but I'm sure he feels pretty well cornered in his heart. If only he would just learn his place and die. If he did, we could become the head. Rudolph would be nice enough to decline. That kid can't go against us. Stop that. Even if I study more, Father won't ex still won't accept me. Why? Father is telling me to be womanly. No matter how hard I try, as long as I'm a woman, Father will never pass on the headship to me. 
Even if I'd been born before Nissan, no matter how much effort I put in, I can't become anything more than a woman. I won't be accepted. I can't surpass Nissan, who doesn't try at all. I will always look, be looked down upon. Father and Krauss are the worst kind of male supremacists. I wish they'd just fucking die already. She wouldn't. She would curse in my place. Words that I couldn't say carelessly, she would say for me. Even though I understood that she was just another part of myself inside of me, I felt like she was the only ally I had who would sympathize with me. However, while sympathy might calm my heart somewhat, it wouldn't do anything to improve my current situation. In the end, she could only console me when I was dejected by reality, and for the amount of time I needed to accept it. Thank you. That's enough now. Now that it's come to this, I'll become such a good lady that I'll surpass father. I'll find an excellent man that Nissan can't even be compared with. No, that's no good. She rejected my timid thoughts. I know why. Because she is me. I know why. Father says, or at least right now he says, that he won't let a woman succeed the head. But that's never been anything more than a rule that Father decided on. Since Father decided on it, he can abolish it. People's feelings can change many more times than there are grains of sand on a beach. Even if we don't prove that Krauss is a stupid man, Father will eventually realize it. At that time, the ridiculous wall that separates man from woman will be demolished by Father who set it up in the first place. That day will surely come. How can you say surely? Because that is my magic. If you'll just believe, this magic will surely create a miracle. The basis of my magic is nothing more than your believing heart. If I can use that magic, then surely, until the day I die, I'll never have to doubt that someday I will become the head. But I don't know if that is the right thing for Ushiramiya Ava. Shouldn't I aim to become the kind of lady that Father hoped for? Someone he can take out into society and boast about? Father might, be, might take a better view of me if I were reborn. Maybe my brother could find his own lifestyle, and I could find mine. Besides, no matter what, I just can't imagine that my father, stubborn as he is, would not only allow a woman to succeed the head, but also skip my older brother and select me for the headship. You don't believe? Um, I was just thinking. Maybe I can't succeed the head, but as a woman I can have a child, and Nissan still isn't engaged. If Nissan doesn't manage to have children, and I do, then wouldn't the next head after Nissan be my child? Wouldn't that basically mean the same thing as stealing the headship from Nissan? Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. It will indeed be quite sad to throw away the determination from my years as a young girl. It will pain my heart to betray you, my younger self. But this way is the most realistic. In that moment, my body changed, and I was no longer myself from back then. But as I am now, a wife and mother, yes, this is a dream. Even so, she still possessed the same ambition and desire as always, and she argued back with her expression displaying clear displeasure at this change. Are you throwing away your dreams? Are you even throwing me away? I'm not throwing anything away. It's just that I've become an adult, and the time has come for us to go our separate ways. That's right. You've already become an adult. You've even forgotten how to use magic. You're now the mother of a child. You've forgotten the magic can grant your own dreams, and are now pushing those dreams onto your son. Even though you had your own life messed up with, messed with so much by father and Kraus, you're trying to push your dreams onto your son and mess with his life too. Is that what being an adult is all about? D George is my pride and joy, who won't embarrass me no matter where he goes. That dream that wasn't granted me might be granted to George. Jessica's grades and behavior aren't good at all. And she's a woman. If only Jessica would step down, George could become the heir. My heart pained even as I said it. Aren't I just forcing my own regrets onto George? I don't have any right to disparage Jessica. And to hit her with the same words that had caused me so much suffering is just horrible. I understand. I understand. Wanting to triumph over my brother was nothing more than my personal revenge. I mustn't use George for that. So I'll take revenge myself. I have a plan to cheat Nissan out of some of his money, with Rudolph and Rosa as my allies. 
I'll surely be able to get back at him. I mean, there's no doubt that Nissan is embezzling father's assets. What a boring plan. Why don't you just give up and cry yourself to sleep forever? We will become the head of the Yoshiramiya family. Don't try to confuse that dream. So believe me that you can definitely achieve it. Believe in my magic. If I believe, will the magic have power, I wonder? Yes, my magic can grant any wish without fail. I'll believe. I'll believe. So create a miracle with that magic. If you don't, the hole in my heart will never heal. Yes. Then listen well to my magic words and understand them. If we can solve the riddle, we can become the Yoshiramiya family head. So lend me your ears and listen carefully. Behold the Sweetfish River running through my beloved home of old. You who seek the Golden Land, follow its path downstream in search of the key. Oh damn, I'll start doing anthropology homework. That sounds uh, kind of difficult. Good luck with that. <clears throat> Evanesan, it looks like we're about to arrive. As her shoulder was tapped by Kyrie, Evo jumped and awoke from her doze. <clears throat> Uh, I'm sorry. I was half asleep. Sorry for surprising you. Auntie Ava, you're out cold. Did you get up early this morning? I suppose. How embarrassing. I must have looked quite disgraceful. I'm sorry. Pretty impressed that you're relaxed enough to sleep, though. Not like Battler. He's been yelling the whole time about how he's gonna fall and drown. <laughs> Can't get bo bored with this dude around. Uh, shut up! Everyone has one or two things they don't like. Battler and Jessica went back out, squabbling merrily. Rudolph also made a face as if asking, Are you all right? Get a hold of yourself. You see the faces of Dad and the rest. All that sleepiness will go right out the window. Let's do our best to stay firm, all right? That's right. We have to stay firm, especially this year. That's it. Let's tense up our assholes and do this thing. Rudolph said these strict words in a small voice that only Ava could hear. Failure would not be tolerated in this year's family conference. All of their companies were hanging in the balance. Even Rudolph's face looked a little tense. Ava's expression look, probably looked tense as well. Mother, I have our luggage. Let's go up onto the deck. Thank you. You really are thoughtful, George. Why are you thanking me so suddenly? It's not like you, Mother. Ava! George! You've arrived! Gather our luggage! Oh, arrived, arrived! <laughs> hey, Maria, you'll fall, so stop running. It seemed that Maria was already getting excited. She ran circles around Hideyoshi, escaping from Rosa, who was trying to catch her. Beloved key. What is it, Mother? Do you feel sick? George, take the luggage and go on ahead. Your mother's probably anemic, so I'll lend her a hand. Really? I understand. I'll go on ahead. By looking at Ava's peculiar expression, Hideyoshi realized that it had not been a pleasant awakening, and made George go on ahead. Rudolph's family and Rosa's family also went up onto the deck, leaving only Ava and Hideyoshi inside the boat. Ava had a vague expression on her face, as though she still hadn't been able to escape from her daydream. What's wrong? Why the meek face? I wonder if I've been using George as a tool for my own revenge. I wonder if my childish hostility towards Nissan has caused me to treat that boy's life like a toy. What have I done? What have I... That isn't true. George is our wonderful son. He'll always perform admirably wherever he goes. Even if your own ends got a little mixed in, everything's turned out all right in the end, hasn't it? You haven't done anything wrong. To the contrary, George is thankful for how you've been strictly disciplining him, right? Really? Hey, really? I wonder, doesn't George think I'm a horrible mother? He, doesn't he? Doesn't he? Doesn't he? Doesn't he? He's never said anything like that. Not even once. That's just your needless anxiety. Hideyoshi sama everyone has left the boat, you know. Oh, did you drop something? 
Uh, shall I help you? Kumasawa had come to check on them when they hadn't come up to the deck. Hideyoshi hid Ava behind his back so that her expression couldn't be seen. Yeah, sorry. My necktie pin just got a little crooked. <laughs> We're all right. We'll be out in a second. Wait outside for us. Is that so? <laughs> then I will wait outside. From that almost incomprehensible excuse, Kumasawa realized that something had come up and disappeared so that she didn't trouble them any further. If they stayed here any longer, they would probably make everyone else worry too. It's about time to go. We'll make George and the rest worry. Am I really not despised by George? Yeah, nothing of the sort. In fact, he's very grateful. Did you have a bad nightmare? Again? Yes. Hideyoshi knew that it wasn't rare for Ava to be tormented by nightmares, and they would always become more striking on the days leading up to the family conference. Hideyoshi knew that Ava's relationship with Krauss was still so full of antagonism that it could even be called trauma, and that she still couldn't separate herself from how she'd felt as a child. That was a dream. I'm with you now. If I grasp your hand tightly like this, that dream will go flying away. Right? Look. Squeeze. <laughs> that hurts. Thank you. I'm fine now. Let's get off the boat. Yeah. Let's get off the boat. Everyone's waiting for us. Um... I'm sorry. Hmm? I'm sorry that I yelled at you about the smoke from your cigarettes just now. Come on, you normally wouldn't apologize for that sort of thing. You go all frail after you've had a bad dream. Don't worry about it. I was wrong for not realizing that the smoke was affecting you. Have you started to hate me? No way, no way. <laughs> if I hated you after something like that, we wouldn't have lasted three days. Come on, stand up, stand up. Off we go, off we go. Hideyoshi-sama, Eva-sama, is everything all right? Are you not feeling well? This time, Gota had come. It looked like they had kept everyone waiting too long after all. Eva also stood up without grumbling this time. She couldn't keep on forcing her bad mood onto her husband and causing him more trouble, because that was not something a good wife would do. Is everything all right? If you're worried about your health, shall I call Dr. Nanjo? Thanks. I'm just a little anemic. I'm all right now. Just your hormones. Don't worry about it. <laughs> For goodness sake. Don't say stuff like that in front of people. It's embarrassing. Oh, sorry, sorry. Ava elbowed Hideyoshi in the gut. By that time, her normal expression had returned, which allowed Hideyoshi to relax a little. The bright sunlight outside was almost enough to really make a person go giddy. A small plank was lowered to get off the boat, and Gota was waiting there, smiling and ready to lend them a hand. Please, Eva-sama. Your hand. Thank you. Welcome to Rokenjima. Welcome back. Huh. When she left the boat, it seemed to Ava as though she had heard the voice of her young self saying, Welcome back. No, it hadn't seemed that way. Someone had said, Welcome back, to her. After becoming a shameless adult, the voice of her young self was distant. What am I living for? What can I do to release myself from this obsession? Hideyoshi heard her talking to herself. He drew Ava close to him by her shoulder, and just by his firmness, he communicated that there was no need to say anything more. Maybe it was just because the typhoon was getting closer. The lively cries of the seagulls, which usually greeted them when they arrived, couldn't be heard at all. Oh man, what a scene, right? Ah, God. What? Moderator? Huh? Oh, you're just... Were you wondering about the, the little wrench thing? Okay, yeah, the blue name and wrench. Yep, that's moderator. 
I thought for a second you were like, Moderator, please do something! Something has happened! <laughs> I was a little... I was like, what? Huh? What's going on? <clears throat> anyway. Six years ago, you say? I mean, six years? That's like the whole of elementary school, isn't it? It's pretty unfair to ask me to remember, don't you think? I agree. Especially since we were so young. We've grown a lot in these six years. Actually, if we hadn't been introduced, maybe we wouldn't have been able to remember you. You think? <clears throat> I knew it was Battler right away. After he opened his mouth, I was even more sure. Oh. If it, I met him for the first time. Don't know about six years ago. That's natural. You were only three, after all. When you say it like that, I'm the same. I only knew Maria when she was three years old, and since she's grown so big, yeah, no wonder I didn't recognize her. After lunch, we had all gone out to the beach to walk around, talk and take it easy, enjoying ourselves. Our parents appeared somehow on edge and seemed to have things to catch up on, so we decided to leave our seats. Just as you'd expect, since it had been six years, the conversation focused on me. Still, you've really gotten taller. I wouldn't call myself short, but anyway, your height surprised me. That's right. I remember well what Battler Sama was like six years ago, but I was surprised even so. <sighs> totally. I could never imagine from how this from how Battler looked six years back. I'm surprised at how any, everyone remembers so much about six years ago. My memory's all hazy. Not surprised. I mean, you seem to take a while even remembering us. That hurts a bit, you know? Come on, this was six years ago, right? It's ridiculous to ask me to remember. So you can't remember the things that happened six years ago very well? I can remember as clearly as if it was yesterday. And that's because your memory's good, Shannon. I bet you remember well what kind of things Badler couldn't did and said six years ago, don't you? Come to think of it, that's right. <laughs> Shannon's memory's surprisingly good when it comes to certain things. Oh. I'm crappy at remembering. Remembering fun stuff well, but horrible at boring stuff. Oh. We all laughed, saying everyone was like that. Shannon, by the way, what was Battler like six years ago? Remember any interesting episodes? Let's see. I'm sure he said something like this when he left. I'll be back. See you again. I'll come for you riding a white horse. Ah! Dude, so embarrassing! <laughs> I bet he did, I bet he did. That's exactly what he was like. Six years ago, he was always full of those stupid lines. <laughs> it really does sound like something Bather Coon would have said back then. Hmm. Embarrassing? Embarrassing? Yeah, <sighs> horribly embarrassing. Uh, Maria, I'm sure that when you're in middle school, you'll want to say embarrassing things like that. When that happens, write it on the back of some leaflet first, and read it three times before you decide to say it out loud. If you don't, you'll definitely regret it. Still, everyone has to pass through that painful period. That's right. That's how you know your place, learn shame, and become an adult. Yes, this is a memory I want to disappear. The bittersweet kind of thing that everyone does in adolescence as they tra transition to becoming, an becoming adults. Ah. Uh. You see, I tend to let my mouth run wild without thinking too much, so I don't remember all the details of everything I say. But when the contents are recited back to me afterwards, it's always something extremely embarrassing. In recent years, I've finally come to understand this weakness, and I've been working hard to refrain from such careless outbursts, but it seems I was just born with the habit of speaking without thinking, and there isn't a whole lot I can do about it. Shannon, do you remember any other embarrassing things? Yes, well... I remember various other things, but since it looks like the person in question wants to forget them, I think I'll refrain from saying anymore. To be blunt, there's nothing else I remember. Please don't remind me. Hmm. Shannon's bullying Battler? Hmm. Bad. Bullying is bad. <laughs> she isn't really bullying him. Let's leave it at that, okay? But Shannon, you'll have to tell me about it sometime Battler Coon isn't around. It sounds pretty interesting. Yes, certainly. No! You can't, Shannon Chan! For a while, George Aniki teased me by pretending to ask Shannon Chan for more of my embarrassing misspeaks.
George Aniki was messing around, teamed up with Shannon Chan, but he seemed, how to describe it, very candid and frank. He was always frank with his cousins, but he usually took on a reserved, gentlemanly attitude when he came in contact with the servants. When I thought about it, I got the feeling that he was acting a little overly familiar, which seemed slightly weird. Maria started scribbling in the sand with a stick, and George Aniki and Shannon Chan joined in, which left me and Jessica off to the side. So I asked her secretively, Hey, Jessica, is George Aniki, um, going out with Shannon Chan? Oh, <laughs> what the, how did you notice? Butler, you got even more of an eye for people than I thought. Huh? What? I was just kidding. They're actually going out? Shh! Your voice is too loud! They're actually keeping it secret for now, uh, apparently, alright? Uh, it'd be better if nobody heard about it, especially Auntie Ava. Uh, I see. In love with a servant. Yeah, but since when? Wow, a lot can happen in six years. Yeah, a lot of cringe stuff can happen in six years on Battler. I love how like everybody erupts into the no. We all knew that it was coming. It's not that we didn't know that it was coming. We just wanted to stave it off as long as humanly possible. But still, Nanaki is really as talented, and Shannon Chan is kind and spirited. They might be a pretty good match. No, Battler. No, no, no. Actually, six years ago, I remember taking notice of her just a little bit. So that's how it is. She really fits well with George Aniki. Nothing I can do about that. Goodbye, my fleeting first love of six years ago. See, it's uh, it's it's much better with Battler. I mean, like, still you still have the the whole servant thing, but like at least Shannon and Battler are only like a couple of years apart in age, so that there's there's not that hanging over them. But uh, oh god. <laughs> Which means that my collection of embarrassing lines that Shannon Chan just held back on. Probably has something to do with that. Ah, uh, can't take it. How long have they been going out? Well, that depends on what you call going out, but I'd say it's definitely been at least a year. If you count the times before either of them confessed, it'd be several years, I guess. Before I realized it, the two of them had separated themselves from the group and were walking down the beach, talking about something. They looked calm, and rather than a light relationship between two lovers, it looked like a more serious relationship as though they were already engaged. Six years. That's a long-ass time. What did these six years mean to me? I've just gotten taller. By the way, uh, I'm obviously keeping it vague. Uh, oh, also, Cristobal Lefort, thanks for becoming a channel member. Welcome. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep my words vague, but I have to reiterate. I have to point to the bottom of the screen for people who have not paid attention to it. Uh, this, I, I'm reading this to a bunch of people who have never read this before, so please don't, like, hint at spoilers or be like, ooh, you know, this, uh, takes on a new meaning or whatever, like, uh, about any particular scenes too much. Like, I, I don't want people to, like, catch on to spoilers before we've gotten to those points, please. So let's, uh, let's, uh, lower down on that, perhaps. <clears throat> I've just gotten taller. It was just a waste of time. Six years I spent obstinately fighting with my dad. What about you, Battler? Have you gotten a girlfriend? Hmm, I wonder. There's a lot of girls that I play with, but I don't have that special one yet. I'm probably just a kid. I think it's more fun to be noisy with a large group of people than being alone with one person. Ah, that's so you, Battler. But take your relationships with your female friends seriously. Girls can be scary with their communities and their wrong impressions, okay? There could be some secret feud going on over you and someone might be crying or being hurt without you noticing it, you know? Ah, <sighs> that's so weird. I think I get the same bit of advice from one of the girls in my class just last week. What's with that? Why can't we all have fun together? Do they all really want to find a special person that badly? It's probably just because you've never had a partner like that, Battler. Well, you'll probably run into a girl like that at some point. Just gotta wait it out. What? Sounds almost like you've already found a partner like that. What about you? Have you gotten a boyfriend? Uh huh? Uh, me? No. <laughs> Come on, that reaction is so easy to understand. From the looks of it, there's some boy that you're thinking about, but you haven't been able to confess to him. Something like that. Uh, no, that's not, um, uh... Cram it, jackass! Who cares about me? 
You're the one who brought up the subject. Why do you have to go and get mad at me? Women are creatures who always ask questions, and yet they almost never answer them. What cruel creatures. Seriously. Well, okay, um, I did try to confess once. Well, um, I struck out pretty badly. Did they say sorry? No, um, well, uh, it was really one-sided, and they were just, like, taken aback, I guess. It was like they didn't even view me that way. I can understand that. You talk just like a man. If you don't act a little more elegant, you won't be able to entice a man's heart, you know. It, is it really... Is the way I speak... Really that bad? Uh-huh. Uh, well, uh, how you talk isn't everything. Uh, but if someone like you, who usually talks badly, suddenly started making an effort to talk nicely, uh... That takes courage, and that might really get some guy's heart stumping, maybe. Really? I see. Yeah. Jessica had started speaking meekly and was faintly blushing. I see. Even though her confession didn't go well, it looks like she still hasn't given up. But yeah, I totally get that. After seeing how close George Anaki and Shannon John have gotten, it's no wonder she'd start wanting a boyfriend. Six years. Those six years of puberty are pretty important. And they go by so fast. With the typhoon approaching, the clouds had grown steadily grayer, and yet even so, I had this really refreshing feeling. Maybe I'll start thinking more seriously about the opposite sex, more than just the size of their boobs. By the way, I know George Heineke is going out with a servant, Shannon John. Not you as well, right? Huh? Huh? Hey? Why do you think that? Come to think of it, that young kid Canon Kun who greeted us in the Rose Garden? You covered for him quite a bit just considering he was bad at talking, didn't you? N no, that's not. <laughs> You're too suspicious. Then just tell me this one thing. Right now, is the boy you're after somewhere within one kilometer? Well, that's, um, I don't know. Kanon-kun is the only boy on this island now who could possibly become her boyfriend. So judging by her reaction, I'm probably spot on. I don't think of the Ashiramiya family as a noble family, but two people in love with servants. I'd never have dreamed that two pairs of Romeo and Juliet would be right next to me. Auntie Abel will probably become an obstacle to George Aniki and Shannon Chan's love. If Auntie, learn, Auntie Ava learns the power of her only partner of her, the power of her only, if she only comprehended a fraction of George's cringe power. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really funny misspeak. <clears throat> if Auntie Ava learns that the partner of her only son, the apple of her eye, is Shannon Chan, she'll probably scream at her with cries of wretched servant, homewrecker, and so forth. And a relationship between Jessica and Kanarkun would probably be just as full of difficulties. Aunt Natsuhi also seemed the type to be strict about that kind of thing. After all, Jessica's husband would probably become the head of the Ushiramiya family in the future. If that person had been a servant working for the family, well, no doubt things would be complicated. Well, everyone finds their own way in love. Who cares as long as you find someone you enjoy being with? Being with someone doesn't require any permission as long as the two people accept each other. If you, don't, if you worry about your parents or family, then you lose. Don't forget that. You can't go out with someone ha with half-hearted feelings. <laughs> I can't believe you're saying something so philosophical sounding when you've never ever been in love. Don't treat love like a matter of profit and loss. It's about heart. That's all I want to say. Well then, see you again. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> George Nissan Shannon, listen, listen. This guy, he said another one of those lines. I didn't say anything! I didn't say anything! <sighs> Don't make fun of me! Don't make fun of me! I heard, I heard! See you again! See you again! For a while, we forgot about the wind getting stronger and played around on the beach. This meeting with my cousins, who had grown so much over these last six years, and were thoroughly enjoying their youth, felt truly refreshing. It was a little late now, but I realized that I should have buried the hatchet a lot sooner, and returned to the Ushiramiya family. Sure is nice to spend time together as cousins every once in a while. Hmm. I like it when all the cousins stick with all the cousins together. It's fun. That's right. We're already old enough. 
<laughs> Madam Zwindy's Maria forgot she hates bullying. Well, yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's a, just a little fun to dunk on cringe fail battler sometimes. We all get the temptation. <laughs> We're all already old enough. It's not like we couldn't meet each other when our parents aren't around. Might not be a bad idea for just us cousins to meet up and play every once in a while. That's a good plan. Maybe we should set up something like that someday. I agree. I'd like for us cousins to at least always be friendly with each other. Hey, hey, if you put the emphasis there, doesn't that make it sound like our normal families don't get along well? <laughs> George Anaki and Jessica laughed, but it felt just a little strained. Did I say too much? Judging by how our parents have made quiet expressions and tired faces every once in a while during the boat ride and at the airport, maybe that was something I shouldn't have said. That's right. Just like Jessica said, let's always be friendly with each other. Ah. Hey, Criminal Sen, thanks for the gifted five memberships. Uh, me too. Everyone friendly. That's right. Yeah, we'll always be together. We'll always be friendly. What was the trophy I just got? I guess it doesn't uh, have a menu. It, it's probably something like, oh, read a certain amount of lines or whatever. But... <clears throat> We'll always be friendly. <laughs> Man, we've been saying some pretty embarrassing stuff. I kind of feel awkward. But I think that's very important. It's very hard for people to always be friendly, let alone always be together unless they wish for it. That's right. You really can't take everyone being friendly for granted. Oh. I wish I knew said it. Uh, Corporal Stack, what are the trophies for? They're pretty much just like cosmetic. They're, like, they don't actually do anything in the game. They're just like, oh, look at you. You got a trophy. You can look at it in the menu and look at that thing you did. That's pretty much it. Happiness won't be granted unless everyone believes in it. That's true. Maybe some magic exists in the power of belief. If we all believe in that, I'm sure it will bring us happiness. All right. Now the, the next embarrassing thing. Let's all swear to believe together, all right? That we'll always be friendly. That we'll always be happy. Screw becoming like our parents. Searching for each other's weaknesses, going after grandfather's fortune. Screw all that forever. All right. We'll always be friendly and happy. And let's all believe that. No matter how long it had been, or how much fun we were having, it didn't stop the dark clouds from appearing on Rokenjima. I wonder if the typhoon will pass and show us the refreshing sky before we leave this island. Who gives a crap about what our parents are plotting? Who gives a crap about the inheritance and the honor of our old family? We're so young and renewing our old friendship. And every one of us believes together that we can all be happy. So, I want this day to end without anything weird occurring, in peace and happiness, calmly. No, not I want it to end. Please let it end. In your dreams! <laughs> damn it! Don't show up! Don't appear! Damn, damn, damn! Sorry to keep you waiting. The new game has finally been prepared. Come, let us begin the tale of this tragedy. Menlo Marseilles with the $2, Mr. Bones' voice. The ride never ends. Yep. Pretty much. Can somebody, like, Photoshop Beato's head onto the, uh, the, like, skeleton ride never ends meme image? <laughs> <clears throat> Come to me. Rain, winds, typhoon. Cut this island off from the real world. Throw Rokenjima into another world, into the netherworld, into a world of fantasy. And so, the tale repeated for the third time. However, before the Endless Witch, what point was there in counting one, two, three? There was probably no point at all. After all, this tale of fantasy would be repeated endlessly, until the match was settled. Oh no, okay, and it's not Battler narrating. And either Battler or the Witch surrendered. And the sky grew dark and cloudy. The rain and wind were summoned together and became a typhoon. And Maria could be seen in the Rose Garden, paying no mind to the rain that had started falling. Going around in circles, searching for that single rose which she had surely marked. Not here. Not here. The rose we marked. My rose isn't here. <laughs> uh. Maria 
Maria definitely remembered it. That rose had been in the flower bed right there. And yet, it wasn't. She didn't know what to do with her irritation at not being able to find something which should have been there. And moaning bitterly, she couldn't help but keep going back and forth in circles around the same spot. She was acting almost as though she would be able to see it if she looked at a different angle. But try as she might, there was no way she would find something that wasn't there. The wind grew increasingly stronger, and the rain turned into cold, large drops. There was no way Maria wasn't bothered by this. However, if she couldn't find her rose here, it would surely disappear forever. Maria believed that. The feeling spurred her on to keep searching for a rose that she had no chance of finding. Just then, the cold drops of rain that were tormenting Maria were suddenly blocked. Mm -hmm. Maria raised her head. When she did, she saw that an umbrella was opened there, protecting her from the rain. And the one holding out that umbrella was... The witch she admired, Beatrice. Beatrice! What are you doing so frantically in the middle of all this rain? You could catch a cold like this. Even witches have to care for their own health. My... my rose. I can't find it. Mm. No matter how many times I search, even though it was definitely here, I can't find it. Maria told Beatrice about how there had been a slightly unhealthy, pitiful rose, and that she was sure they had marked it. Sorry, I'm just gonna move my chair. <clears throat> ho ho, and you can't find it. If you're a witch apprentice, you should use magic to search for the rose. I believe that as long as you search with nearly your eyes, it won't nearly be enough. Hmm. Can't find it. I did my best and tried to search with magic, but can't find it. While this is certainly ideal for practicing your magic, it might be a little too much for you with all this wind and rain. Allow me to lend you some special power. Concern for one's disciples is also among the duties of a master. <laughs> Thank you, Beatrice. Maria's face, which had been full of sadness until just now, split open into a grin. Maria knew. She knew that there was nothing Beatrice's magic couldn't do. So she was sure that Beatrice would be easily be able to find the rose that she couldn't find herself. Beatrice closed her eyes lightly, acting as though she was listening for something in all this wind and rain. Then she heard it, opened her eyes, and spoke. Hmm. All things in this world are transitory. It is unfortunate, Maria. It seems that your rose couldn't withstand all of this wind and rain. Oh, and my rose is? It was uprooted by the wind and is no longer of this world. Hmm. What Beatrice had said was certainly plausible. There was nothing at all odd about the flower being broken off of the stem in this strong wind. However, Maria couldn't accept this and bitterly gave a low-pitched moan. No. Oh. No, no, no. It's my rose. My rose has to come back. I'll bring it back to life with my magic. Beatrice, teach me how to revive a rose with magic. <laughs> it's much too early for an apprentice like you to learn the hidden art of endless magic. Know your place. <sighs> Maria wiped the tears from her eyes, full of regret. Seeing that expression, which so invited pity, Beatrice shrugged her shoulders and chuckled. Very well. I will lend you power for the hidden art that can revive a rose. Really? Yes. Well then, concentrate the power of your heart. Close your eyes. Forget the rain. Forget the wind. Search for the soul of the wandering rose with the eyes of your heart. Maria closed her eyes. Then, she repeated Beatrice's poem-like words. Come, try to remember. Rose, what form did you have? Come, try to remember. Rose, what form did you have? Don't look. Don't listen. And believe. Release the power of your soul from the cage of flesh that imprisoned it. That's it. Good. Around Maria, who was concentrating her power, her eyes tightly shut, small golden butterflies began to dance. Was this the manifestation of the magical power Maria held? Lost soul of the rose, gather into one, 
and remember your form. Come, gather, remember. The glitter of the gold butterflies began to strengthen, and their numbers increased. Then Beatrice raised a finger up to the skies, and they began to gather at the tip of that finger. This was the miracle of the golden magic and the gold butterflies began to condense into a single dazzling grain of gold. It was a single seed, glittering gold. It sat on the tip of Beatrice's finger, budded into a golden sprout, and opened into a golden leaf. It then fell slowly from that fingertip, sank into the mud of the flower bed, and began to grow steadily. Maria, who admired magic and witches, must have really wanted to see this fantastical sight. However, as an apprentice, Maria was still not qualified to see it. No, she was probably afraid that, if she opened her eyes to look, the power of her heart's concentration would be interrupted, and the magic would be lost. Therefore, it was Beatrice, the, on the one permitted to lay eyes on that golden miracle, who was the one and only witch, and the master of many miracles. Then the fully grown rose bloomed, creating one golden flower. And when Beatrice poked it with her finger in just the right way, the gold-colored sparkle scattered, just as if a golden soap bubble had popped, and what remained was a single beautiful rose. Mm hmm It looks like you've remembered a splendid rose. However, if we just leave it mixed in with these other roses, you won't be able to tell it apart. Shall I perform one last service? Beatrice, for the sake of her cute apprentice witch, who was moaning even more now in concentration, decided to cast one more little spell. She snapped her fingers, and a single gold butterfly appeared, fluttered around, and landed on the flower that had just been revived. Then, it suddenly burst open and disappeared, becoming golden lace and marking the rose. That is sufficient. Maria, you may open your eyes now. Huh? Where's the rose? Not here. Not here. Not over there. Over here. Look. I've marked it with the golden lace. Wow, you did. Awesome, 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 awesome. Thank you, Beato. Thank you, Beato. I want to become a witch quickly. A great witch like Beato. And you can. Long ago, I too wished for that innocently, just as you do. And I have attained that level. Maria was ecstatic over the revived rose, clapping her hands and jumping around in joy. Watching that, Beatrice also smiled, looking fairly pleased. Now, if I try, I can break or repair any soul, not just that of a rose, and kill and revive as I please. So, the barrier created by the storm has closed Rokenjima off from the real world. Now is the time for the Golden Witch, the Endless Witch, Beatrice, to descend. Beatrice pulled from her pocket an envelope with the family crest, the one-winged eagle, and gave it to Maria. Maria frolicked around at being selected to be the witch's me messenger. So, Kinzo, I've come to join in on your fun once again. My preparations are already complete. What about you? I assume you've prepared enough coins to bet in tonight's game. Naturally, I'm fully prepared, Beatrice. I've prepared pieces in abundance. I'm ready both physically and mentally. So, let me pay the ante. All that you have given should be returned to you in the end. Now take it! Kinzo flung the window of his study wide open, took off the reasonably large golden ring which had been on his finger, and threw it into the darkness of the raging wind and rain. That ring was struck by lightning, and after twinkling gold for an instant, it disappeared. Kinzo watched it go, grinning broadly and fearlessly. I don't see myself losing. You are mine. Forever! I imagine the ring just smacks Beato on the head. Ow, what the hell? God, damn. Aim better, Jesus. 
The ring that Kinzo had thrown became a single gold butterfly and fluttered around in the wind and rain. It headed for the Rose Garden, almost as though it was being guided there. Elster, I think I commented this on the Salty and Awesome stream. Have you considered playing Uno? It'd be funny and chaotic to watch. I have considered it. I've just like, I, I'm a little wary about like a lot of the ports done by, I forget what company did them, it's but like- Ubisoft. It's Ubisoft? Yeah, okay. It's Ubisoft that did them. Like I, I've heard some kind of bad things about them, especially as it relates to their like service integration with Ubisoft, whatever, whatever it's called. So yeah, um, it's, it's a thought, but. <clears throat> it then found the figure of the Golden Witch and fluttered down. When it arrived right in front of Beatrice, it burst into a flash of gold and returned to its original form of a ring flipping up into the air. Oh, I, I mean, I don't know necessarily what Ubisoft does aside from like the fact that they use AI and shit, which is also annoying. Um, but like, I, I just was referring to the fact that their service sucks. <laughs> it doesn't work very well. When it arrived right in front of Beatrice, it burst into a flash of gold and returned to its original form of a ring, flipping up into the air. It seemed as if it would simply fall back down into a puddle of water, but suddenly it stopped in midair almost as if some transparent person had caught it. Somehow, this seemed unexpected even to Beatrice. However, she soon realized what, who it was, and grinned broadly at it. Also, uh, hi, Panic Pang. Uh, good to see you around. Uh, I very much enjoy all of your art during the Save Data streams. Uh, I look forward to seeing your art some of the most. Thanks for tuning in. <clears throat> As she did, the figure of the person who had caught the ring began to fuzzily appear. It was the figure of a young man wearing a butler's uniform embroidered with the one-winged eagle crest. There was no man like this among the servants who served the Ushirumiya family. Even so, Beatrice laughed as though it was someone she remembered fondly. Ronove, is it? It's been quite some time. It seems you have remembered me. You always were a man who was serious about loyalty. It has been a very long time since you last corresponded. There's not been a single day that I, Ronave, have forgotten that I serve you, milady. Indeed, I was more fearful that you had forgotten about me, milady. <laughs> I have, after all, known you to be quite forgetful. <laughs> I see, yes, it does seem I forget easily. I couldn't even remember your wry speech until I heard it again. For you, milady. With an exaggerated yet elegant gesture, he bowed respectfully, and held out to Beatrice the head's ring that he had just caught. It is the Ushiramiya family's head ring, returned to you from the Ushi from Ushiramiya Kinzo. It's now once again in the possession of its master. Indeed. The proclamation by Kinzo that the game has started. I acknowledge receipt. So, how would you like to play tonight? Shall I prepare the roulette immediately? Or shall I prepare some black tea first? Both sound attractive, but for now I suspect I need you to greet someone. I'm quite sure that that man has, has, has his mouth hanging open and can't shut it. Jim Pop 45 with the five dollars. Run of AA. Well, he can run over, run me over too. <laughs> oh boy, people are gonna get get all wild about this man. I can tell already, which is uh, fair because Run of A is based. I I love Run of A. Right, Battler. Greetings. Allow me to introduce myself. I am called Run of A, and I serve at the side of Milady Beatrice. It is truly a pleasure to meet you. Ronove, one of the 72 great demons, serves a master in exchange for various forms of compensation, presently has a contract with Beatrice as her butler, head furniture, has multiple underlings trained in housekeeping, and he himself is extremely capable as a butler. Employing him has become a kind of status in the high society of witches. Furthermore, the cookies he bakes are superb, and witches will often line up, line up to demand them. Should possess enormous magical power, but as he always shows deference to his master, his power level is an unknown quantity. See? His mouth's hanging open and he can't shut it, right? 
Isn't that obvious? Another incomprehensible guy's just appeared! I grumbled that goat-headed people would start doing the bone dance, and then goathead started showing up in swarms. And since then, not only have those seven sexy-ass babes appear, appeared, but now even a butler has goddamn shown up. Doesn't make sense. Cut it out! By the way, Butler, did you notice? Have you realized that you're meeting him is a true devil's proof? A, a devil's proof? What do you mean? He may not look like it, but this guy's a genuine demon with his name amongst the 72. In other words, I've brought a demon right in front of you, which truly proves they exist. <laughs> Ronave holds a noble rank in hell, the 27th highest rank great demon. He's a pretty useful man. I summoned him at high cost and made him serve me. It's an honor to be introduced to you. While my name is amongst those of the nobles of hell, I now serve as the head furniture of Beatrice Sama, vulgar human and great witch from with whom even demons would flee in fear. <laughs> he's a very useful man, but he's impudent with his words. It's slightly frustrating that he sometimes forgets to respect his master. There is nothing in my contract regarding the way in which I must speak. Would you like to change that contract? It doesn't bore me, so it's fine. <laughs> Beatrice turned her back to him, cackling. After bowing once to her back, Renove turned back to Battler and stuck out his right hand, showing off an innocent smile. Normally, this would mean that he was asking for a handshake. But what's this supposed to be? I'm also one who's been subjected to the lady's whims. In that sense, I'm sure that we could become good friends. This is a handshake of friendship. Of course, it does not mean that you'll be entered into a demon's contract, so rest assured. Sorry, but I'm right in the middle of a big fight with your master. I only shake hands with an enemy after one of those situations like you find in... Uh, after one of those situations like you find in teen dramas. When we've beaten each other up in a rainy schoolyard and are all worn out. Remember that. I see. Then to shake hands with you, Battler Sama, I must create a fitting atmosphere in a suitable location. And we must exchange body language and sweet words that ring true to the heart. I will find a suitable opportunity to prepare such a location. I, too, love those kinds of situations, you know. <laughs> Long, laughing tauntingly, Ronove whispered that to Battler, with his face so close that their noses were almost touching. Battler, his face turning red after getting so close to another of the same sex, pushed him away. Y you're a creepy bastard. I see. Just right for Beato's butler. It is an honor to receive such word of praise. I'm very confident in my tea brewing abilities, so please look forward to tea time. Baking cookies is one of my hobbies, so I encourage you to have high expectations for the tea cakes and such. Just what, what I would expect from a pair of the same gender. You've started to get along very quickly. I'm jealous. My, my. I apologize most humbly for making you jealous, milady. I will not stealthily snatch your guest away from you. Well then, I'll leave for now to greet the rest of the furniture and inform them that I've retaken my post as head furniture. Please, forgive my short absence. Mm-hmm. Only the common goats and the seven sisters used for their ritual have manifested themselves. You'll be able to finish up greeting them with ease. Oh? Those lively seven sisters are here? I wonder whether those naughty girls have grown a little more graceful. <laughs> if that's graceful, I'd have to doubt the definition of graceful. Is that so? It seems you've already enjoyed some playtime with the Seven Sisters. Judging by your expression, it seems that they're just as naughty as they were before. Even though I'm always telling them to act more fitting as a group of those who search, serve Beatrice, Selma. What troublesome kids. Alster with Canadian $2. Xbox achievement, Battlers Bisexuality Unlocked. Oh, he was denying it this whole time. <laughs> but no longer. And Daniel the Spaniel with the five pounds. It took me two minutes to go from thinking this guy looks like an ass to swooning over him. Such a gentleman. He's even making Battler turn his head. That's just how it goes with Ronove, you know? He just sweeps you up off your feet. He's the perfect Butler. <clears throat> if that's your problem, don't worry. They actually act perfectly fitting for their master. <laughs> You've started to grow some guts. However, to have a conversation is to acknowledge the person you're talking to. Now that you have to, now that you've started to respond to my idle chatting, that is proof that you are gradually starting to accept my existence. <laughs> That's because even if the sun starts rising from the west, I'll definitely, definitely, definitely never accept that you're a witch. Maybe if you start crying and kissing my shoes, I might be willing to have a more constructive discussion. Even if Battler was bluffing, he still spoke forcefully, a fearless expression on his face. 
The witch and her butler snickered together, realizing that their guest had regained more than enough of his willpower to take on a new game, and that the preparations were complete. After Ronave exchanged a few words with Beatrice, he bowed silently to Battler, scattered into gold butterflies, and disappeared. <laughs> it is truly pleasing when everything gets so lively. How boring were those days when I was trapped alone on this island, unable to regain my power and without anyone to talk to. I get how that creepy-ass guy is really fitting as your butler. But tell me, why has that butler only appeared now? You said something about how the only go only the goats and the seven steak chicks had manifested themselves. What did that mean? Hmm, yes. You still fight it, but I'm a fully-fledged witch. I'm in contact with a good many non-human entities in the netherworld. I'm sure. None of you con none of your contacts are halfway near decent. First some goat monsters, then those sexy-ass babes. This time a demon butler showed up. I don't want to say it, but there better not be more and more of these weird guys to come. <laughs> How much furniture do you think I have serving up my great golden mansion? How many demons do you think visit me here? Uh, visit me there. They will keep coming. They will appear in any number. When the door to the Golden Land is opened, I will call back all of my furniture and build my new castle here on Rokenjima. Then I plan to invite all of my old friends and we will drink and dance together for three days and three nights. I do also plan to invite Kinzo's family, of course. You too, if you wish. <laughs> So, let me get this straight. Since you've lost your power for a long time, you couldn't summon them. And your magic power has been recovering gradually, so you'll be able to summon more and more monsters. Is that what you're trying to say? It is as you said. You've managed to avoid taking that final step off the cliff. But your heart's already wavering, and you're unable to deny that I am a witch. That wavering in your heart has slightly restored my power as a witch. So, you're saying that creepy butler appeared, because I started to surrender? That's right. Bit by bit, you were surrendering to me. You submitted to me so much in the last game that you received all of that humiliation, did you not? Your back was truly pleasant for throwing my feet up on, I'll have you know. <laughs> D damn it! I thought that as long as I didn't accept you, I'd be able to keep on going. But it seems apparently I was mistaken. That's right. The closer you get to submitting, the more the game will swing in my favor. Isn't chess the same? In the process of cornering each other's kings, we've traded several pieces. It is true that I have yet to corner your king. However, you have had your hands full just enabling your king to escape, and have lost several important pieces to me and conceded a large advantage. It is only natural that further advantages, advances will lean in my favor. D damn. Uh, if it's not too much of a spoiler, what's the last episode we see new characters in? Um... Yeah, you pretty much never stop seeing new characters. <laughs> I, I guess I'll phrase it like that. <laughs> As we continue, you will probably still succeed in it frantically avoiding my checkmates, if nothing else. However, as you do, I will steal your important pieces from you one by one. In the end, you will still have lost everything but your king, and you will receive a true checkmate from which you will de be denied any form of escape. You were talking big last time, weren't you? Something about how since you would never accept me, this would be eternal torture that would torment me? Only witches who have reached the endless level can talk about eternity. You've never possessed that qualification. <laughs> And they never stop coming, and they never stop coming, and they never stop coming. That's true. The Witch of Smash Mouth has declared this. <laughs> In green truth. Oh, that sucks. <clears throat> Kinzo-sama has already publicly displayed the location of the hidden gold within the epitaph under my portrait. The rules apply equally to all who can read the epitaph. If you discover the gold, I shall return everything to you. Tonight, I ask that you enjoy your battle of wits with Kinzo-sama to the fullest. I sincerely pray that this night will be both intellectual and elegant. Beatrice the Golden. Uh, Normal Gabriel, you mentioned before that you have Beatrice hanging above your bed. Is it like a painting on a canvas, or is it a printed poster? It's, uh, it is printed on, like, a sort of, like, canvas-like paper, basically.
When Maria finished reading the letter that Beatrice had handed her, everyone was at a loss for words for a while, and then they all broke the silence at once. R ridiculous What a worthless, vicious prank! I agree wholeheartedly. There's no way that Father would give up the head's ring. Beatrice? Ha! What a transparent prank, hoping that bringing up that name will have us running around like headless chickens. Come on, come on. Who's the one behind this dessert packing a little too much punch? I'll applaud and admire you if you come clean now. Rosa? Uh, of course not. I wouldn't pull a prank assuming Father's name. Then, Aniki? Aniki? Me? Don't be absurd. It was you, wasn't it? Only you could plan something this vulgar. Are you trying to mock me? I'm the one who wants to question you. Who is behind this ill-natured prank? Krauss beat the table and stared at everyone. Since that included the children, too, he scared them greatly. A letter from a mysterious person who claims to have been given full rights to father's assets. And if you think about how this family conference is all about discussing that, I, mean, I think it's too hasty to just call this a prank. I wouldn't be so sure. It really might be one of father's vulgar pranks. He might have planned this to shock us a bit, since we've been discussing the distribution of his inheritance without him. If Dad was the one who planned this, uh, that we, then we can't take what Maria-chan just read aloud as a joke, right? That's right. If you interpret the contents literally, then this is a test from Father. The epitaph of the witch has been displayed in the hall for quite some time now, so that any of us could solve it. There was plenty of notice. So, he's saying that the first person to solve it will be handed the headship along with all of his wealth, right? See? Our magic worked. Ridiculous! There's nothing of the sort! It is an unshakable fact that my husband will become the successor to the Ushiramiya family headship. This letter is the very thing that shakes it. This letter is a message from the person who was given full rights to all of father's wealth. Nissan's right to become the head has been turned, returned to a blank slate. The person who solves the riddle. The person who finds Beatrice's gold will become the next head of the Ushiramiya family. Ludicrous. Are you going to trust the meaningless words in that letter? That seal was the re that, that seal was the real thing? How can we possibly trust that? Let's try going to ask Father directly. We aren't at the level when you can get away with saying that his mood's bad or that he's not feeling well, you know. The sealed wax clearly shows that this letter was from Father's representative. If you doubt that, then show some proof, Nisan. Prove that this letter is not an expression of Father's wishes. Very well. It's just as you say. It no longer matters whether Dad's in a good mood or not. Let us go up and ask him directly. Let's do it. We'll ask Dad directly. Dad's to blame too here. Why did he have to choose such a roundabout way? Well, that is a little like him. I... I wonder if it's alright to talk like that, and taking it for granted that it's Father's letter. Stupid Rosa! Isn't it obviously Father's letter? That letter was Father's. Isn't it obvious that he's giving the four of us an even chance to become the successor? Idiot, die, you useless woman! Rosa really is dumb. Why doesn't she just give up and die forever? I, I, I'm sorry. Th that's right. I'm sorry. In the beginning, the adults had all doubted, doubted the authenticity of the letter. But after just now realizing that this was a once-in-a-lifetime chance for the three siblings other than Krauss in the struggle for the inheritance, Ava had changed her position and had claimed that the letter was authentic. Rudolph and Rosa also realized that and agreed. Good gracious! How could adults like you take a worthless prank this seriously? Even though I am not father, I understand well his exasperation. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not so, son. Won't everything be fine if we just ask father? Everything will be fine if Father simply mentions that he doesn't know about the letter. Nisa, take responsibility and just get him to say that he doesn't know about the letter. This isn't the time to get scared just because he's in a bad mood, you know. He's still scared of Father at his age. What an idiot. Why doesn't he just give up and die forever? Right. Let's get this situation painted in black and white. He's probably eating in his study right now. I think it's time we had him rest his chopsticks for a moment. It's decided. Let's go. Kyrie, wait here for a while. And go to check whether it's true or not and come back quite quickly. Thank you. I will patiently wait for Godasan to bring the dessert. 
The four siblings, Natsuhi and Hideyoshi, all stood from their seats forcefully and flew out into the hallway with a clatter. Afterwards, the only ones left were the children, stunned completely speechless, Nanjo, who looked uncomfortable, and Kirian shrugging her shoulders. Maria, who had been at the center of all this turmoil, looked a little scared at the adult's sudden change. However, judging from her appearance, she didn't look like she realized the full significance of what she had just read out. What in the world was that all about? I don't friggin' get it. Shit it. Every last one of them. <sighs> Do they really want the inheritance so much? Everyone. This is our parents' problem. It has nothing to do with us. But so you mustn't worry about it. Ah, uh, George whipping out the let's look away from the problems once again. He, uh, he really makes a habit of that one. Yeah, if only it was that easy. They were so blatantly. I thought they were better than this. Showing off their greed. Hmm. Everyone has to believe together that we'll be happy. Mm hmm. That's right. We all did promise. Come on, Batherkin. Jessica John. And Jessica John, you too. I feel like crap. We couldn't accept it at all, but we laid down our arms for the time being. We had vaguely known how filthy the family conference was going to be this time. However, after that six year blank, I couldn't help being shocked. Seeing that the children were completely dejected, Dr. Nanjo cleared his throat uncomfortably. It's an adult discussion. It has nothing to do with all of you young people. Let us forget about it. I would if I could, okay? I know that it's hard on you, but please forget it for now, for their sakes. All of your parents are fighting frantically to make your futures just a little brighter. Please don't look at your injured parents with those cold eyes when they come back. Even at your request, curious son, that's a hard one. We could be that cut and dried about it, and we wouldn't be kids in the first place. Mm, everyone happy! Can't get dark! Believe! Unless we all believe we can be happy, the happiness will get away! We'll have- we all have to believe! Mm -hmm. That sounds good. I'll believe too. We can be happy. Hmm. Oh, Kyrie, thank you. Butler and Jessica Nechan, you believe too. Beatrice is always saying that magic won't have any power if you don't believe. Hmm. Curious on rose from her seat quietly, went over to Maria and crouched down so that their eyes met. Hmm. You believed, Aunt Kyrie. Now Butler and Jessica and Nichan have to believe. They're both strong people. They'll feel better soon and do that for you. Yeah. More importantly, I want you to tell me. When Curious on said that, Jessica, George Aniki, Dr. Nanjo and I all listened closely. It looked like our parents' minds had been filled by thoughts of grandfather and the inheritance problem. But we wanted to ask Maria about something simpler. Hmm? What? Who gave you that letter, Maria Chan? Beatrice. The witch drawn in that portrait? Hmm. She gave me this letter and an umbrella. And she used magic to fix my rose that was broken. Beatrice is an awesome witch who can do anything. Could you tell us about it in a bit more detail? I love the thought of Maria as a Naruto kid. That's my ninja way. <laughs> Fuck, I, I forgot the name of the blood bloodline techniques already. Uh, Keke Genkai? Yeah. Right, that's what it was. Maria's Keke Genkai is seeing uh, witches. Ninjutsu. That's good. That's pretty good. Without even being allowed to wait for dessert, we were chased, chased out of the room. I heard that in the end, our parents were unable to get Grandfather to respond. Well, I'm not sure I should be saying this, but I feel like Grandfather deserves a pat on the back. He had to be feeling pretty satisfied with the shock his strange letter had given to his children, who had all been so infatuated with distributing the inheritance while he was still alive. I, too, felt like our despicable parents had gotten what they deserved in all this confusion. But I couldn't really say that I was feeling great. I felt all sulky. 
Grandfather hadn't entertained them for a moment, but he also apparently hadn't denied anything about the letter. Grandfather's name pops up several times in the witch's letter. If Grandfather knew that someone was stealing his name, then considering his character, he would probably be mad with rage. But even though Grandfather now knew the contents of that letter, he had coolly ignored it. In this case, did that count as a silent yes? Auntie Ava and Dad had been trying to interpret the letter in their favor, their greed clearly visible. It wouldn't have mattered so much if that was all, but the adults had then started focusing on Maria, who had received the letter. They kept pounding her with questions about who had given her that letter. Maria repeated over and over again that she had gotten it from Beatrice, but there was no way a mysterious person like that could be mixed in with the others on the island. After all, this is a small island where no one lives except the Ushiromiya family. Maria kept repeating that she had gotten it from Beatrice, no matter how many times she was asked. It seemed that the adults felt she was trying to trick them, so they didn't hold back and questioned her until she broke out in tears. By the time Maria was released, she had cried herself to the point of exhaustion. Our parents ordered us to go to the guest house and take Maria with us, then shut themselves up in the dining hall and started getting louder and louder as they discussed the inheritance. It seemed that, because of that strange letter, the possibility had arisen that Uncle Krause's ability to become the next head could be returned to a blank slate. And in exchange for accepting him, my dad and the rest were trying to swindle Uncle Krause out of a lot of money, or something like that. Jessica and I, both astonished, were happy to move over to the guest house. We didn't want to be under the same roof as those filthy adults, their heads so filled with thoughts about money. George Aniki pleaded on behalf of our parents, saying that he wanted us to understand them. I understood his reasoning. No matter how filthy this talk of money was, it wouldn't go away if you just closed your eyes to it. But even so, how could they so blatantly degenerate into such money-grubbing demons? Maria had cried herself dry and was hiding in her bed. She hadn't even twitched for a while, so she was probably sleeping. Who in the world gave that letter to Maria, Chun? George Nissan, you mustn't ask that anymore. If Maria says she got it from Beatrice, can't we just leave it at that? I mean, we don't want to make her cry any more than this. That said, even we felt a confusion that we couldn't clear away. There's only 18 people on this island now. The thought that in the middle of all this rain, an unknown 19th person gave Maria-chan that letter and is now hiding somewhere honestly doesn't seem realistic at all. Probably. If Shannon or someone put on the dress from that portrait and skillfully planned this ahead of time with Maria. Although, of course, as soon as Maria saw that dress, that might have been enough on its own to convince her that it was Beatrice. Maybe it doesn't really matter who handed her the letter. The important thing is who sent it. The point is that Grandfather wanted to cause an uproar by assuming the name of the witch. Seriously, that old geezer's good at riling people up. The truth was probably that our occult-loving Grandfather was playing around, by choosing a dramatic way of handing the letter over to Maria, who shared the same hobby as he did. Paying no heed, though, to the trouble it would cause Maria, or the rest of us. Seriously. Messing around with Maria's pure heart. Doesn't matter who handed the letter over. Maria says that she got it from Beatrice, so let's just treat it that way. I agree. Well, let's do that. To Maria Chan, Beatrice is kind of like what Santa Claus is to most kids. Whether it be a non existent 19th person or Santa Claus, as long as we accept that they exist, they'll at least exist inside Maria. And I see, it's important to lie to a child to protect their dreams. Hmm? What's up, Jessica? Are you still angry? Jessica had her hand on her chin, as though there was something that she just couldn't understand. When I called out to her, she came to her senses. Uh, sorry. Well, actually, I was wondering if it was possible that Maria actually met Beatrice. What do you mean by that? Are you saying that there's a 19th person on this island? If we take what Maria-chan said to heart, then we do arrive at that answer. No, th that's not what I meant. I'm talking about the story that someone we don't know has been living on this island since long ago. Living, you say? Where? In the forest.
the adults were gathered in the dining hall, spending a very long time continuing the discussion that had been started by Beatrice's letter. Krauss strongly claimed that the letter was a simple prank, but he couldn't overturn the claim that Kinzo's failure to deny the letter wasn't answer enough, was answer enough. Judging by Kinzo's character, if he knew that a letter had been written by someone else in his name, he would be mad with rage. Since all of the siblings knew that, Krauss had no choice but to withdraw his claim. Without even having to summarize it, the contents of the letter were simple. The person who solved the witch's epitaph would receive the headship and assets. This did a lot of damage to Krauss, who was thought to have been guaranteed the succession. And for everyone else who had given up on that long ago, it was better news than they could have ever hoped for. However, there were some points that worried them. The person who solved the epitaph was not limited to a member of the Ushiromiya family. Taken literally, anyone, no matter how doubtful their origin, could succeed the Ushiromiya family. And furthermore, this meant that there was a chance that all of the Ushiromiya family's assets could be stolen by some unknown person. In that sense, it was definitely not a situation where anyone could lower their guard, even the siblings other than Krauss. Had this letter come from a saboteur sent by Kinzo who called themselves Beatrice? Or was this the scheme of some unknown person trying to steal the Ushiromiya family's wealth? They still didn't know the truth. But they could say one thing for certain. Maria had received this problematic letter, today, on this island. In other words, someone who was planning something related to that letter was on this island today. Was the person who set it up Kinzo, one of the four siblings, or maybe some unknown person? No matter how much they suspected each other, they couldn't reach a conclusion. After getting tired of bickering with each other, they finally reached the extremely obvious conclusion that doubting each other was just a waste of time. We've made no progress. We've just been wasting time. That's right. Now that you realize it, we won't have to waste so much. It's not certain that Father is the one who sent that letter. My husband has merely had enough of you being unable to hold a conversation. Which one of us can't hold a conversation? You keep yelling at me every time I say something. Do you truly think that such shameful behavior is fitting for a member of the Ushiromiya family? Give it a rest, Ava. You too, Nazis, huh? That topic's finished for now. Shall we all cool our heads off for now? Let's have some cool drinks brought over. That sounds good. It would probably be wiser if we cooled our heads. Baby, don't you want to go for a smoke too? Anarchy looks like she's in a bad mood. Uh, so I'll pass on that smoke. But I agree about the cool drinks. Rosa, have someone bring some water. A whole pitcher. All right. Rosa headed over to the extension telephone in the corner of the room and called the servant room. She then passed on what Rudolph had told her to the person on the other end. The vicious bickering up until now vanished like it had never happened. That silence continued until Goda finished setting the table and retreated from the room. Is there anything else that you require? No. Please leave us. Yes. Then if you'll excuse me. If you need anything, call me at any time. After listening to the sound of Goda's footsteps disappear off into the distance, everyone took a deep breath at the same time to break that tension. It sure is raining hard. Wonder if our witch, this 19th person, is taking shelter in the arbor in the Rose Garden right about now. I wonder. They might be able to avoid the rain, but it would be quite cold. Mysterious 19th visitor. Sounds pretty interesting, just like a mystery novel. Normally in that kind of story, it's a safe bet that the person doesn't exist and that one of us 18 would be faking it. I suspect Genji and the others. We should have found any excuse we could to dismiss all of the servants of the One-Winged Eagle. Come now, don't say that. We must be grateful for their long years of service. Of course, we can't let our guard down. So then, you also agree that whether or, whether or not Father was behind this, the person who handed Maria-chan the letter was a servant? Indeed. After all, we were all being friendly in our big happy circle the whole time until dinner, weren't we? All of us siblings have alibis. Only a servant could have handed Maria that letter. But all of the servants said that they were too busy with the bed making to have any spare time during which they could have gone to Maria and the Rose Garden. Hey, hey. What are you trying to say then? You aren't saying that the Witch of the Forest Beatrice Alma came over and actually handed Maria Chan that letter, are you? <laughs> Rosa, you used to believe so much that it really frightened you, right? 
You don't mean to say that you still believe at this age. The Witch of the Forest? If she did exist, I'd love for her to appear. But no matter how much I wished, she didn't appear before me even once. She didn't save me from my crisis. Uh, of course not. I just thought that since all 18 of us said we didn't do it, there might really be a 19th person. That can't be. In the first place, we were the only ones who came on that boat. We didn't see any mysterious stranger riding with us. You don't think that they might have swam across this rough sea, right? I can't really imagine that. <laughs> Logically, that's true. It's difficult to imagine that there's a single hidden and uninvited guest on this isolated island. However, it looks like some of us still can't bring themselves to discard that possibility entirely, doesn't it? Hideyoshi had laughed it off, saying that there couldn't be a 19th person. But Kyrie had sensitively picked up on the delicate atmosphere among the four siblings. Just by common sense, there couldn't possibly be any uninvited guests on this small, isolated island. How on earth would they get there, and from where? And where would they be hiding themselves? And why wouldn't they appear openly, even though they had sent a letter in their own name? None of these could be explained. But considering that none of the four siblings had joined in on Hideyoshi's laughing, they seemed unable to completely deny in their hearts the possibility of a 19th person. Curious, son. I'd like to make this clear. We don't remotely believe in that fairy tale about the witch. Another topic to insult father, is it? Simply mentioning that is a betrayal against him. <laughs> well, yes. However, this is father we're talking about. Is it possible that he... you know? Uh, I don't know anything. What's this? What's this? Why has everyone gotten so gloomy? What are you talking about? Are you saying the legend of the witch isn't a joke, but a fact? That's ridiculous. <laughs> of course, nobody believes in some witch riding a broom and flying in the sky. But the woman in the portrait, Beatrice, may really have existed on this island. Hideyoshi-san, it looks like we aren't talking about a witch, but something a little simpler. Let me see if I have this correct. You all suspect that Father had a mistress named Beatrice living in secret somewhere on this island. Is it something like that? Father is a paragon of a man, a model of self-discipline and restraint. It is completely inconceivable that he would bring something so filthy onto this island. Not so he snapped at her immediately, but it looked like the four siblings, including her husband Kraus, didn't think that way. On the contrary, it appeared as though they thought Kinza was exactly the kind of person to, likely to attempt such a stunt. The existence of a mistress who had Kinzo under her spell had been whispered of, uh, whispered of since the very beginning, when he had built the mansion on this island. I'm sorry, Natsui-san. I know how much you respect Dad, but that rumor's been around for a long time. Dad prepared this island by himself and built everything. It's been suspected from the beginning that this mansion might have some hidden tricks or secret rooms known, on, known only to Dad. And it's also been whispered that hidden somewhere on this island there might be a secret mansion none of us know about. Yes, it has. This island might look small on a map, but it's quite large for just the Ashiramea family to live on. So people have wondered whether he might have built a secret mansion somewhere in the uncivilized forest for his mistress to live in. That's a rather large-scale story. In the beginning, we used to say that it might be somewhere inside this mansion. That there might be a hidden basement with a fabulous hidden room where the witch in that portrait was secretly hiding. After seeing that intricate auto-lock on Dad's study, it isn't too hard to imagine, right? Indeed. Father did spread the rumors that he hid a large amount of gold in some secret place, protected by some secret mechanism. It would not surprise me to find there existed some hidden room inside this very mansion that none of us knows about yet. When Mother was alive, she would often scour the entire mansion searching for it when Father was absent. Mother also suspected what Rudolph just said. She believed that there was a hidden door or stairway somewhere, and that this blonde-haired mistress was hidden behind it. It's hard to believe, but there are actu some actual examples in other countries of people cheating with someone over a period of several decades by making them live in a hidden attic room. And this was Kinzo, the mansion this extravagant. There was endless opportunity to suspect the existence of hidden rooms. The Legend of the Rokenjima Witch from what, I've heard, it, from what I've heard, it was just a fairy tale made up to prevent children from entering the uncivilized forest by scaring them. But it's starting to sound like there's a little more to that story. Well, yeah. 
As you know, this is a lonely island without anything but the Ashiramiya Mansion on it. When Rosa and I were little brats on stormy nights, we were so scared by the sound of rustling trees that we could hear from the forest. We had this crazy delusion that something weird might be looking out at us from beyond those trees. It's only natural for any brat to think something like that. But some people heard Rosa and me making those claims and weren't happy to dismiss it as some kid's delusion. Isn't that right, Aniki? Yes. Nissan and I thought that by coincidence you might have spotted Father's mistress, who had been living in secrecy on this island, as she went out for a walk when no one was looking. Uh, Jordan Starr asking about the name of the track. The current track name is Hell's Halls. Of course, Mother did too. Among the older servants too. You often heard that ghost story about how the Witch of the Portrait wanders around the mansion at midnight. Outwardly, I laughed that off as a ghost story. But on the inside, I suspected very much that it referred to the existence of a hidden mistress. In that case, you're saying that the existence of a 19th person might not be completely ridiculous? That they might actually be somewhere around here? Sounds like a case of that devil's proof rudolph San is always talking about. It might be possible to prove that, an, that there is a 19th person, but it's impossible to prove that a 19th person doesn't exist. Should we continue this discussion assuming that there's a person named Beatrice hiding somewhere on this island? It was the first step in crisis management, that's the right way. It's probably way more prudent to say that she might exist, rather than thinking there's no way she does. I... I see. Sorry, I was a bit careless. Rosa-san, sorry for laughing just now. Uh, uh, it's alright. I don't mind. Hideyoshi apologized deeply for not being conscious enough of danger, despite calling himself the president of a company. Silence fell again. By preparing for the existence of a 19th person, they were accepting that some unknown person was hidden on this island. <laughs> they answered voice, Nice argument, furniture. Unfortunately, I am in your walls. Listen to me, and listen to me well. You will go to the GameStop and bring me a copy of Bambi on the PS2. If you fail at this task, there will be punishment waiting for you indeed, young man. <laughs> <clears throat> and since this person might have had something bad planned for them, it was only natural that it came with a certain degree of discomfort. In the past, Father would sometimes suddenly disappear without telling one, anyone where he went. After all, he's a person who appreciates silence. It was not out of the ordinary for him to shut himself up in some archive after purposefully not telling anyone where he was going. However, after the witch theory began to be refined into the theory about his mistress, it was eventually whispered that he was secretly going back and forth to see her. Mom was completely overridden with doubt in her final years. Sometimes she'd start making a racket and asking the servants to look for Dad immediately, saying it was an emergency. Yes, that did happen sometimes. Mother was always doing things like that in her later years, and that frightening atmosphere still hasn't gone away. I can say it for certain now. She was a person to be pitied. So then, were there, what were the results of those large-scale searches of the house? Did they find anything? No. Not on a single occasion did they even find Father, let alone any hidden rooms. And every time, after a lot of time had passed, he would just suddenly show up somewhere. Then he'd say he'd been taking a nap in some archive or that the wind had called him down for a walk on the beach. But it was always some place where the servants had already looked. We never knew where Father had gone. But by, the t by that time, Father was already famous for his adoration of the occult. So some of the servants exaggerated, saying that he might have turned into butterflies and danced around the Rose Garden. So in short, Father frequently disappeared, and no one knew where he went. Yeah. Since we couldn't find him no matter how much we looked inside the mansion, we grew increasingly of the opinion that Dad might have gone somewhere outside it. But there isn't much to speak of in the area outside the mansion, which only leaves the expanse of forest. And if you tie that in with the legend of the witch from the forest, you get a theory like this. Dad had actually built a hidden mansion somewhere in the forest, inside of which a mistress by the name of Beatrice lived, and he sometimes went to see her. I was also young at the time. At one point, I became intent on catching Father cheating, and I tried to follow him when he went outside. I failed, of course. Every time Dad went outside, he was oddly intent on staying out of sight. He was extremely cautious that he wasn't being watched. He was like that to a very odd extent. But that actually made sense. He must have gone, been going out for some reason, but the members of his family couldn't have, couldn't have known about. 
And that would be going to meet his mistress, probably trying to avoid being seen. After seeing Hideyoshi nod and say yes, yes, as though this was quite obvious, Ava got a little sullen. Well, anyway. This island was like a sketchbook in which Father, with his Western obsession, could draw out all of his dreams. Everything about this island was exactly how Father wanted it. It wouldn't be odd at all if there was some hidden mansion for his mistress to live in. Ava's words spoke for what all the siblings had come to think. For a while, the room returned to silence again, and everyone listened to the sound of wind and rain. That one Greek goddess 06. Hiya, I'm not sticking around because spoilers, I'll only be able to watch the VOD because I wanted to say this playthrough has inspired me to start Higurashi, and I'm currently in the latter half of chapter two. Hell yeah! Hope you enjoy it. Uh, chapter two of Higurashi is definitely one of my favorites in the series. <clears throat> Was there a hidden mansion on this island? And had Kinzo's mistress been living there and hiding for a long, long time? Every one of them had thought they were being too suspicious and had refrained from saying it for the longest time, but it had been a common opinion that everyone shared. Kyrie, who had been listening the whole time with her eyes closed, spoke to no one in particular. How long has this rumor about Father's mistress been around? As soon as we moved to this island, so about 30 years ago. Think about it. Would have been impossible for him to have hidden, had a hidden mansion constructed once we came here. People and materials would have been going in and out. Sorry, I was checking something real quick. We'd have found out in no time. So, if this was possible, it would have had to have been happened before we moved here. It probably could have been built along with this mansion when we were still living in Odawara. It's probably appropriate to assume that he had this plan laid out from the beginning to set up a double life with his family and his mistress. And his relationship with that mistress probably went back to the days when we lived in Odawara. Probably. If, as Father says, she's the source of the vast amount of gold that he used to gain the funds which resurrected the Ushiromiya family, we could probably conclude that they had a close relationship since Odawara, at least. A relationship trusting enough for her to lend him a vast quantity of gold. I can't even imagine how old that relationship must have been. Most likely, she gave Father some invaluable advice for achieving success in business. It's natural to think that out of a sense of gratitude for that, he described it as if, as if this person had given him gold. My god, what are you guys doing? The Nessa Maria family. <laughs> you guys, you guys create so much lore while I'm just like not looking. I'm like sitting here reading this little tense scene and then I look over and you've like invented several different versions of me. You've inverted, like in, in, invented a goblin Austin or something. You'll probably invent some other thing by the time I look back again. <laughs> Lurf is dad now. I, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I call a goat. <laughs> You're all just like assigning yourselves. <laughs> oh god, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Goblin Austin's just Austin. That's true. <clears throat> Have you guys ever seen that video? I forget the guy's channel names, like Glimbo's Gold. Uh Austin is Glimbo. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> Most likely, she gave Father some invaluable advice for achieving success in business. It's natural to think that, out of a sense of gratitude for that, he described it as if this person had given him gold. If you think about it that way, it's obvious that they would have had a close relationship after that. Rather than a debauched relationship with a mistress, it was probably a relationship of gratitude to the person who shaved, saved the Ushiromiya family from crisis. Yeah, if that's right, she shaved all <laughs> Oh, my misspeaks tonight. Goodness gracious. <clears throat> Kitty with the two pounds. In our defense, we were left unsupervised. That is true. It is It is difficult to... S well, actually, no. It's not true. It's <laughs> Lurf. <laughs> Although, Lurf, you, you, are, you are playing into it a little bit. Tisk tisk. I, I can't even trust my, my faithful moderator. <laughs> That way of looking at it might have some sense, too. But even in that case, isn't building a hidden mansion and having her live in it going a little too far? Doesn't that mean there were some emotions in play beyond gratitude? Well, this is all speculation. In the first place, no one's ever found that hidden mansion. Aniki, you're planning on expanding this island into a resort, right? 
You might stumble onto it by chance in the process. Who knows? Maybe you'd even unexpectedly find some gold there, too. <laughs> Do you think Rokenjima's a treasure, tro treasure island or something? Don't play dumb. Although you say you're opening a resort, we know that it's just a cover for a full-scale investigation of the entire island, okay? Although it sounds as if, due to all the trouble and confusion we were talking about earlier, you haven't been able to carry it out, of course? Well, I don't know what you're talking about, but you misunderstand. It's perfectly natural that investigating this island would be the first step in turning it into a resort. Kraus tried to play dumb, but it was plainly obvious to his siblings, who knew him so well. Kraus was definitely sure of the existence of a hidden mansion. And under the pretense of opening a resort, he had been investigating the island in detail, searching for a clue as to the location of the hidden gold. They couldn't tell whether that conviction was just him overthinking things, or whether it was based on some physical proof. However, if Kraus, with all his guile, was convinced, then the other siblings were similarly convinced that there must be a sufficient basis for it. The story about a witch living in a forest is straight out of a fairy tale. But a story about some blonde-haired girl living secretly in a mansion no one knows about in the middle of a forest is a much better. Certainly. Taken on its own, the setting sounds just like some kind of children's story. You like those, don't you, Rosa? Uh, well, yes. When the mansion was built on this island, Father was at the height of his prosperity. With his money, he could probably have obtained anything, made any of his delusions real. A mansion in the forest where which quietly waits. It sounds like the kind of setting Dad would like. Doesn't it? It's like something from an occult or fairy tale. Feels like Dad would be into that. On this island, which the Ushiramiya family had lived on for 30 years now, a hidden mansion that no one knew about had been quietly built, and within there lived a witch known only by her portrait. Even this hard-to-believe story might not have been completely delusional considering all of Kinzo's strange habits and his vast wealth. It might not have been impossible for Father to build a hidden mansion to satisfy such a dream. However, let's be realistic. Would it be possible to house his beloved woman in that hidden mansion for decades without it becoming inconvenient? Well, if there was a love, it could have been possible, right? Think about the facilities needed to let his beloved woman live healthily, and how Father would do it. For example, even if it was on a small scale, it would have had to have been an intricate and pleasant residence. And in terms of upkeep, it would need electricity, gas, running water, as well as some, possibly some people to help her. Even providing for her meals would be quite difficult. She would need clothes and makeup, daily necessities. The needs of a woman aren't simple. Would it be possible to maintain all of that without even any of the family or the servants noticing? When you say it that way, it sure sounds like a weak point in our theory. But that isn't enough to get rid of my feeling that Dad might have been able to pull it off anyway. After all, it is Dad. That's right. It is Father. When Father had something he wanted to succeed in, he would succeed no matter what. Saying that it would be difficult for a normal person, and is, and is therefore impossible, doesn't apply when it comes to Father. Yes. You should never underestimate Father. Dad's madness can't be understood by normal people. Don't assign me Kinzo! That's... I would never want to be Kinzo! <laughs> Oh, goodness no, goodness no. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past the Ushirimiya Kinzo. As long as that word could accompany his name, a considerable amount of credibility dwelled in any story, no matter how, how absurd. However, that didn't shake the importance of what Curie had said. This was different from stealthily raising a kitten in a cardboard box and keeping it a secret from your parents. Hey, let's uh, chill out with the uh, copy and paste spam in the chat, please. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, wait, sorry. I uh, did not read that line. Duh, where, 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 where is it? Okay, yeah, taking care of a person in secret over a period of 30 years would be an incalculably massive task. The legend of Father's Gold started before he gained position of, in possession of Rokenjima. That would mean he, is an, he and his mistress go back over 30 years. How old would that make her? 
In the worst case, she could be as old as us or older, right? By that age, the body starts to break down. I don't care what the mansion's like. I couldn't call living in a place where people's eyes can't reach almost as though she were under house arrest agreeable. June Pop 45 with the five dollars. Guys, I'll take the L. I'm Kinzo and spent all my money on intricately drawn apes. <laughs> uh, I mean, it wouldn't be any, be any smarter than some of the stuff that Kinzo actually does. <laughs> That's right. If what Father told us about Beatrice is true, then that relationship has lasted for over 30 years. She might have been a charming young woman at the time, but it's probably appropriate to think that she's, as old, she's now an old bag like us. I can easily imagine that, given the contents of the letter. You should talk. <laughs> Krauss laughed as though blind to his own shortcomings. Of course, Ava was offended, but she didn't strike back. Quit it, Oniki. So, if everything we imagine is true, she would want to throw out her chest with pride and join in on Dad's inheritance problem. I mean, there's a good chance that this love was mutual, unlike with Mom. She might have been aware she was his mistress, and yet at the same time felt a kind of pride as his real wife. That is an insult to Mother. Yeah, sorry. But everyone knows, it's a pol knows it was a political marriage decided by his elder relatives. Because of that, we can be sure that it wouldn't be odd for Dad to have a mistress. The family sank after the Great Kanto Earthquake, and Kinzo was set up as the Ushirimiya family head against his will. However, in the beginning, he was influenced strongly by the elder relatives who treated him like a puppet while they pulled the strings. He wasn't permitted to decide anything by himself, not even his marriage partner. And by, by his meeting with the, with the Golden Witch Beatrice in those unhappy days, Kinzo's Legend of the Gold was quickly embellished into something dramatic. In other words, it could mean that Kinzo met with a woman he really did love. If she knew his whole story, then even if they weren't marriage partners, it wouldn't have been odd for her to consider herself his true wife inside her heart. And now, the person registered as his true wi wife was already dead. In which case, she might be fully intended to encroach on not just the rights to his assets, but the battle over the headship as well. I see. I'm starting to see the purpose of this letter. The headship to the one who solves the epitaph's riddle. So, that's what it means. Even if that mistress obtained a rank within the Ushiramiya family, since she's not a direct relative of father, she would be inferior to even the children. In other words, she would be right below Rosa in rank. That's not a good position to join the battle for the headship. So, that's it. Someone can solve... Oh, so that's it. If someone can solve the witch's riddle, then they'll receive the headship regardless of rank. In other words, it's the most advantageous condition that Beatrice could get, since she has no chance whatsoever. The revival of the Ushiramiya family had been made possible by the gold Beatrice had bestowed. In other words, the credit belonged to her. She had built that, built that wealth together with Kinzo, so it was natural that she would thought of herself as the one who should inherit it. It would also be natural for her to despise the thought of giving a single cent to the children of the wife Kinzo never loved. How incredibly impertinent! Even if this mistress actually existed, for her to fight over the right to the head's inheritance would be an outrageous action far above her place. What disregard for her own place. Natsuhi turned red, her fist quivering. There were also complicated circumstances behind her entry into the Ushiramiya register. Those who knew that understood more or less why she was so angry for the sake of Kinzo's dead wife. Well, thanks to her outrageous action, we now all have an even chance, right? And also, Father has given that outrageous action his silent approval. Will the person who succeeds the Ushiramiya family be his mistress Beatrice, or one of us, who he may not love, but who do carry his blood? Maybe he wants to make us struggle over that to see who's worthy. As Ava giggled, ro giggled roguishly, Krauss shrugged his shoulders and looked away. However, since it was the other party that brought up this condition, I wonder if, if that means that the other party has a significant advantage. And that's a point, too. In the first place, if Beatrice meant that letter literally, then she's Father's alchemist. In other words, she's the manager of his gold. It wouldn't be strange at all if she knew where it was hidden, would it? What a bad joke this is. It's like she's given us a riddle that she knows the answer to. She'll probably show up rudely, say, Hey, here's the answer. I'll take the head shift now. Snatch everything away from us. Hmm. That's right. The one who sets a riddle always knows the answer. 
There's a good chance that this is all a trap to steal everything from us. If you think about it like that, don't you start to doubt whether she really has the gold in the first place? Why would she tell us about it? And all she'd have to do is stay silent and embezzle it. You're right. Doesn't make much sense. Indeed, it was just as they said. If the epitaph showed the way to where the gold was hidden, why would she challenge them to try and solve it? If they actually did solve it, wouldn't the gold all be stolen? Could it be that this person was trying to stir the siblings up so they tried to solve the epitaph, and would then snatch it up before they did solve it? That was a very reasonable guess. No. If you flip over the chessboard, there might be a pretty good chance that they actually do have the gold. How can you be so certain? Wait, Aniki. Kyria, please keep talking. Why do you think that? After all, do they really think that just telling us the answer to the riddle in the witch's epitaph would seriously be enough for us to hand over the headship of the Ushirumiya family? That we'd be so impressed at the answer to the riddle that we'd just give up? Well, that's true. If they think we'd just give up after being told the answer to the riddle, that we'd just say, here you go, and hand it over, they've got another thing coming. Of course. The headship of the Ushirumiya family is not something that can be handed over so easily. That's it exactly. No matter how one-sided a game Beatrice proposes, and even if she splendidly shows us the answer, there's no way we'll obediently hand over the headship. In other words, unless there's something that forcibly compels us to play this game under fair conditions, this game won't function as a game. That's right. Unless the for losers are forcibly compelled to hand over the headship, the game doesn't work. And what would this compelling force be? Would they bind us in chains and threaten us into handing over the headship? I see. I get it. They would just have to do something which would make us willingly give up the headship. Uh, RP asked, how often do you stream? I love Umineko and I like your reading so far. Um, usually I try to do it every week, but sometimes there are just occasions in which the week is too busy to do that. I see. Then, yes, certainly. Beatrice would have to be in possession of the ten tons of gold. Right. I get it, too. In other words, it's a trade, right? Huh? Oh, what do you mean? A trade? A trade what? The, the Ushiramiya family headship is for, for the hidden gold. Beatrice surely plans to tell us the location of the ten tons of gold and use that as a bribe to gain the Ushiramiya family headship. R ridiculous! They want us to trade the succession to the glorious Ushiramiya family for money? Blasphemy! Blasphemy against the Ushiramiya family! Listen without getting mad. About how much wealth did this glorious Ushiramiya family have right now? Are we really that affluent? The definition of affluence is not dependent on poverty. Uh, property. That's a nice slip. It is about heart. Of what relevance is our financial situation to... Krauss interrupted Natsuhi as she started to go on emotionally. In this situation, the more she went on and on emotionally, the worse it would actually sound for them. Myself aside, I've heard that the rest of you are in pretty unfavorable p p situations right now. Oh, really? I've heard that your financial situation is extremely unfavorable, actually. Repeatedly exchanging collateral for new money to gamble with. Repeatedly dabbling in gamble after gamble, unable to accept your losses. If you really want to talk about our state of affairs, not one of us here is as impoverished as you, Nissan. How much have you lost, Nissan? You have no talent! Who are you saying has no talent? And impoverished, you say? Natsuhi became indignant once again, but Kraus, Kraus raised his hand again and interrupted her. It seems you're making a small mistake. Business is not something that can be judged based simply on progress. When someone conducts business with a view to, be, to the long term as I do, it may sometimes appear at a glance that they have suffered some, suffered some significant short-term losses. Aniki, we've been collecting evidence. Now's not the time to be putting up a front. So, this is what Kyrie is trying to say. Every last one of us is stuck here, is stuck for money. And Beatrice has ten tons of gold. As the only person who knows the location of the ten tons of gold, Beatrice is planning to use it, to, planning on using it to force us to sell the position of family head. About how much is ten tons of gold worth? As a rough estimate, two billion yen? No, twenty million yen. If she threw that much our way, we'd be jumping with joy to accept her as the successor to the head.
I can't take Kraus seriously since that metaphor of him being on a seesaw by himself from chapter two. <laughs> Total idiot sits on the seesaw by himself, loses all his apes. <laughs> the scene returned to silence. Even the rain and the wind sounded lou louder. That was probably also the sound of the windstorm that disturbed the insides of their minds. Y you must be joking. The thought of that just... The... Th the thought that just because she tossed me a little money, I'd give up the family headship to some woman of doubtful origins. Don't talk stupid. You weren't even going to succeed Father as head in the first place. We have nothing to lose and money to gain. Sure, we'll have to calculate our lot, profit and loss, but it's something worth listening to. They knew that much of the Ashuramiya family assets had been eaten up by Kraus. The dregs that remained of that inheritance, versus the compensation for being accepted as the head that Beatrice would pay. It was a shame, but honestly, the former was less enticing than the latter. Well, it probably wouldn't end up as four equal portions. Since Aniki would be giving up his position of successor, his portion would have to be larger. Makes me feel kind of jealous, you know. Dear, the amount of money isn't the problem, right? Wow, my voice cracked quite a bit. The amount of money isn't the problem, right? Your cowardly younger siblings are trying to sell the glory of the Ashiramiya family for nothing. For money. <laughs> Which, I mean, it might as well be nothing. Why aren't you displaying your dignity as the eldest son? Natsuhi, stay quiet for a while. Dear? This is a dizzying proposal. We're planning on getting each two, each getting 250 mil, 250 million yen out of Aniki. The witch would treat us with even 10% of those 10 tons. Um, That's 2 billion. Yeah, that would mean she's treating us with 10 times our original goal. That alone would be more than enough for us. It's not like I have any attachment to the Ashira Mia name. I'd be happy to sell it off. Even if the full 10 tons might be a bit much to expect. I see. It would still be an attractive prospect for us. We're we were trying to form an alliance among the siblings to kick this outsider called Beatrice out. But if this is her plan, it will tear apart the unity between us. Yes, by this point we can state it clearly. The goal of Beatrice's letter was to disturb our alliance. If the three younger siblings, who were never going to have any connection with the succession of the headship in the first place, were paid enough money to satisfy them, they would happily accept Beatrice as the next head. So every obstacle to her headship would be removed except for Kraus. In that case, the negotiations would be one-on-one -on -one between her and Kraus. He tried to look strong, but fi Kraus's financial and political situation was extremely weak. He did bluff in front of his siblings, but on the inside, he was probably thinking that it might be all right to enter negotiations, depending on the sum of money involved. In order to bury his losses, Kraus had taken advantage of the fact that Kinzo had shut himself up in his room and had embezzled Kinzo's personal assets. Therefore, when Kinzo died and the inheritance was distributed, Kraus would be held to account for that. But if he gave up his seat as the head to Beatrice, she would also receive the rights to the assets, and as a result, the distribution of the inheritance to the siblings would not occur. In other words, Kraus's embezzlement might not have to be made known to the other siblings. Of course, the siblings were frightened of Kinzo, but it was doubtful whether they still actually respected him as a father. By this time, they each had their own families, their own wealth, and their own lives. If they were paid enough money in exchange for Rokenjima, the wreck re wrecked remains of Kinzo's dreams. There was a significant possibility that they would relinquish the Ushiramiya family name. In other words, Beatrice's victory was already guaranteed in this game. Not as the winner of Beatrice's game, but as the winner of Kinzo's game. Kinzo had put up the epitaph, and to this day, no one had been able to solve it. So Beatrice had solved it. In other words, this is less of a game and more like Beatrice's declaration of victory. However, Curie still felt something was slightly out of place. If this was a declaration of victory, Beatrice would only have to display the gold openly and state that she would buy the family headship. And yet, even at this late, st late stage, she was explicitly telling the siblings to try and solve the epitaph. Why had she set up this new game where she agreed to hand over all of the gold and right to succeed the head to the person who solved the epitaph? Kyrie tried flipping over the chessboard several times, searching for the best strategy that might have guided Beatrice to this line of thinking. In the end, when she reached a single conclusion, 
arrogance, perhaps. Or maybe she's playing. What are you talking about? The witch sent us a letter of challenge telling us to solve the epitaph. She might be taking us lightly, thinking we could never solve it. However, there should be at least an extremely small chance that we will solve it. After all, we have here four of father's children by blood, right? Four people related by blood to the questioner who, if they tried frantically to work together and avoid having those assets stolen from them, might come across the answer of the riddle by chance. The reason the witch had a superior position on the negotiations compared to the siblings was that she only she knew the location of the hidden gold. But if that hiding place was exposed to someone other than her, the witch's superior position would crumble. In short, Beatrice gains nothing but risk by writing this witch's letter of challenge. Of course, it might have had the effect of splitting apart the siblings' alliance. But if that was her only goal, why would she take this risk, however slight it might be? I think that's reckless. But if you keep in mind a certain type of emotion, it becomes possible to understand that risk. Are you- and you're saying that's arrogance? Yes, that's right. When people have an overwhelming advantage, they tend to get arrogant. And when they do, they sometimes deliberately take on small risk to show off that advantage to the losers. A moderate amount of risk adds a little spice to the joy of victory. Vic nothing is as boring as victory without risk. I understand that. I also like that sort of thing. I understand well. <coughs> I tried thinking of a few other plausible explanations for the true motive behind Beatrice's letter. But I think that this really might be the truth. The emotion hidden behind that letter was arrogance. Arrogance. She's trying to throw her weight around, looking down on us, as if there's no way we could figure out such a difficult, difficult epitaph. It might even be possible, if surprising, that the epitaph wasn't written by father, but by her. Fine by me. Solve the riddle of the epitaph, she says. If only I solved it, I would be made the head, right? I'll solve it. I'll accept the witch's challenge. As if my other brain-dead siblings could solve it. I'll solve it by myself, and then I'll prove that I'm the one who's fit to succeed the Ushira Mia family. I'll take that challenge. I will. Solve the riddle. Hey, remember how nobody in uh, the prior two episodes has actually tried to solve the epitaph so far? Oh boy, oh boy. <clears throat> But before we get to Battler's uh, interjection, allow me to grab some water real quick. I will be back in like uh, two seconds. Ready? 
Let's get back to it. <clears throat> yeah, I have to agree. Um, episode 3 is not my favorite of the question marks. My favorite is episode 4, but uh, it is definitely second favorite, probably. So. Uh, what's the song that plays during the waiting screen? That is uh, the track Door by Preholder, which is from Higurashi Kai. <clears throat> I see. So, not a witch, but a mistress by the name of Beatrice did exist on the island. So, there can be more than 18 people. Which means I can defeat that line of reasoning which says that if it was impossible for all 18 people, it must be a crime involving magic. That's some big information. Excuse me. Battler Sama, would you care for some black tea and cookies? Beato's butler, who called himself Ronofe, appeared out of nowhere in particular. Placed upon the silvery tray that he held was a plate filled with delicious-looking steaming black tea and cookies. I really don't like this guy's smile. For some reason, it doesn't look like a smile used to warmly greet a guest. It feels like he's making fun of me for some reason. I don't know whether he really takes me for an idiot, or whether it's just a joke or something, but it's really irritating me. I don't want any. I'm busy right now. Leave me alone. Oh my, that's a shame. When the cookies have turned out so, oh, so very delicious. Cooked so wonderfully, it's a shame to waste them on a simple human. Truly wonderful cookies. <sighs> I'll eat some when I feel like it. Set it down somewhere over there and get out of here. Get out of here. Will that be acceptable? Then I shall do so. You may eat them when they get cold and stale and then regret as much as you like that you did not eat them when they were freshly baked. <laughs> You really are annoying. Well, you're a lot better than Beato who keeps doing that creepy cackle right next to my ear. Oh, yes, yes, that is quite true. There are times when the lady's laughter becomes quite undignified. Every time I hear it, I think of my noble rank and struggle to comprehend why I must have such a person as my master. <laughs> Man, you're weird. If you don't like it, then could you just not work for her? To continue serving despite that is furniture's joy. One could not serve as furniture without such an attitude. Let us set that aside. How has this game been proceeding? Just now, I believe I heard that you said you have found some good information and were quite pleased by it. Well now, I wonder what your shallow wit has thought up. As Ronove made fun of me and giggled, he followed my earlier words to the letter and placed the black tea and cookies somewhere arbitrary nearby. I imagine it's because you gained increased confidence in the existence of a 19th person. Would you be gracious enough to allow me to hear your opinion? Yeah, sure. I'm just gonna say it again in front of Beato anyways. No reason to hide it. Alright, it looks like there's a hidden mansion somewhere on this island and the grandfather had his mistress living there. In that case, the question that's been torturing me about whether there are 18 or 19 people can be easily resolved. Although you deny witches, you hold the double standard by refusing to exceed a culprit among the 18 and have driven yourself into a dead end. The easiest way to deny the witch would be to doubt one of the 18. It's not so easy for every one of the 18 to have an alibi. Elster, I just want to say the animation at the start was so cute. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, I did that little Maria doodle because I thought of it and thought that it would be a, a fun idea. I'm glad it actually ended up working out with the OBS transitions and everything. The easiest way to deny the witch would be to doubt one of the 18. It's not so easy for every one of the 18 to have an alibi. You'll always find at least one person with a fragile alibi. I could probably continue to deny the witch forever if I just used that person as a sacrifice. However, I will steadfastly refuse to do that. Yeah, that's no good. That's no goddamn good at all! Every one of those 18 people is either a parent, a relative, or a cousin to me. And those reliable servants were sometimes serious and sometimes funny. I won't let myself use one of them as a sacrifice. In the past, my resolve wavered. That's how Beato hit me when my heart was weak. Accepting and understanding your own weaknesses. That is not something which can often be accomplished. Battler Sama, you're using this theory about a 19th person as a spear, or should I say a shield. In any event, unlike how unprepared you were in the games up until now, let us call the fact that you now have a compass bearing on how to now have a compass bearing on how to fight a dramatic leap forward. Uh, Wild Hannah appeared. I am near the Atlantic Ocean and have work tomorrow, so I gotta go. Thanks for the stream, Nesmi, and good night. Have a good day at work. Hope it goes well. 
With this, you need not doubt any of the 18 people you love and respect, and can easily suspect a 19th person and pursue your theory that the culprit is a human. That's it exactly. Like in the first game, when Kanon Kun was killed in the boiler room, and a bunch of other places. There are countless tricks I can use without hesitation if a 19th person existed. In the very first game, Kanon Kun had been killed in the boiler room. One might think that he was attacked by Kumasawa-san who had gone down into the boiler room with him, or maybe that someone who had appeared to be dead earlier was actually faking, and had, had, had ambushed Kanon Kun in the boiler room. Either way, it was a move that forced me to suspect one of the 18. <sighs> However, by simply proposing that a 19th person exists, there's no longer any need to suspect one of the 18 for that murder in the boiler room. In short, impossible for any of the 18 equals the culprit is a witch, is an equation that I can now deny. Using this argument, we can take, for example, the question which has been raised once again in this game, who gave Maria the letter, and come up with an easy explanation. Even if all 18 people should have alibis, I can easily explain everything by saying that a 19th person visited her and gave her the letter. Mm hmm I think that's quite a good move. How would I strike back? Bathersama, despite your understanding, there are still plenty of weak points. Perhaps the 18 people attack will be an perhaps the 18 people attack will be an effective move. As an attempt to judge how strong your defense is, it may be interesting to attack from that angle again. Then how would you do it, Demon Butler? I believe it would be appropriate to attack this 19th piece that you've played. Battler Sama, have you ever met this 19th person? May I ask you for some proof that this 19th person exists? How naive. Of course, I knew you'd probably try that move. My, my. Please respond to it. Witches and demons and the like, there's no, more, no move more appropriate for you than this one. And that is... The Devil's Proof! When we humans are accused of something, we always counterattack by saying to show some evidence, because that's a human move. But I'm fighting with a witch. I'm taking part in a battle with someone who isn't human. And some moves exist which can only be used in a game against a witch. There, there are cheap moves, and that's what this devil's proof is. Therefore, evidence is unnecessary. Let's take the assumption that there's a hidden mansion on Rokenjima and separ separate from the Ushiramiya family mansion and that a woman named Beatrice is living there. In order to prove this, one must find this mansion and actually bring Beatrice out of it. That's called actual proof in the human world. However, if we follow the rules of the devil's proof, you can't disprove that she exists even if there's no evidence that she does, because it's impossible to prove that something doesn't exist. That's right. This devil's proof, which tormented me so much before, I finally managed to use it to my own advantage. Those guys were always trying to force me to accept the existence of the witch by using the Devil's Proof. That was because in response to Beato's professions that witch witches do exist, I physically could not offer any proof that witches don't exist. That's why I've been subjected to this nonsense that witches exist and why I have been unable to counterattack. And that's why I'll flip over the chessboard right now! If I, can disprove that, if I can't disprove that witches exist, then that means if I suggest that a 19th hurt human exists, you can't disprove that either. In other words, the enigmatic mistress in question is craftily hiding herself, so it's perfectly natural that you can never find her no matter how hard you look. So you can't say that the 19th person can't be found equals the 19th person doesn't exist. Therefore, it's impossible to disprove a 19th person. Beato used the devil's proof to make denying her existence impossible. But this time, it's become my weapon. If we can get away with this argument, then never mind a 19th person. This island could be full of people we don't know about. And even if there are 10 or 100 of them hiding, she still can't disprove that they exist. In the last game, and the one before that, among the murder scenes that showed up, there were several that were extremely intricate and must have taken a lot of effort to set up. It's very difficult to imagine that, that a single culprit could have set all of those up. However, it's not just a 19th per if not just a 19th person, but 10 or 100 people were hidden somewhere, there wouldn't be any problem at all. they all split up the work, they could handle any job in a short period of time. Of course, doubts will naturally arise as whether a large group of people like that could sneak around the mansion without being noticed. But those are all settled by the devil's proof, because not seeing or not noticing a hundred people inside the mansion does not disprove that they were there. Even though I'm saying it myself, it's such a stupid argument that it makes me want to throw up. 
However, it's because it's such a dirty as hell move that makes it the perfect one to use against a witch. Well, we're only imagining here. But the thought about of a about a hundred suspicious men wearing goat masks hiding in the shadows, that goes that goes beyond funny. That, that goes beyond funny. It makes me think of cockroaches. Yeah, okay. If you see one, it means there's a hundred hiding in the shadows. Well, I do think this is a ridiculous argument that's horribly twisted. My opponent was human, I'm sure they'd yell at me like I was out of my mind. But my opponent is a witch. And after all, that's the kind of competition we're having, isn't it? I'll use any kind of reckless argument to explain it using humans and deny the witch. Anyway, with this move, I'll never again have to doubt any of the 18 who were close to me. I'll never again repeat the defeat I suffered last time. I see. You've learned from your defeat last time. That's good. It's no surprise that by the third game you've become quite devious. You first strengthen your own defense. That's truly a solid first step. Quite a spectacular move, I think. Well, even if we do assume that there's a 19th person, there are still few, a few tricks left that I can't get past no matter how many humans I add, like the number of master keys. Still, it isn't bad as a first step for the time being. This is your trump card, the important piece known as the 19th person. You counter my move of asking for evidence by using the devil's proof. A good skirmish. Although I have no excuse for making moves by myself when Milady is absent, I find that I too have become slightly interested. I wonder if you'd permit me to make yet another move on Milady's behalf. Go for it. I don't care if you're a witch or a demon, I'll take you all on! The move that you make, the devil's proof, is a specialty of us demons, but there are also various other moves available to us. Do you know of a move called Hempel's Raven? Hempel's Raven? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Just then, ah, uh, that laugh, which gets on my nerves every time I hear it, started just echoing around. The room was filled with dazzling gold butterflies, and in the center of that whirlwind, the golden witch appeared. Why, if it isn't the lady? Good morning. I thought you might be doing something interesting while I was away. Hempel's Raven, was it? What an amusing and nostalgic move. Uh, Daniel the Spaniel, I wonder, when you were talking about Ryukishi making this episode easier, is Ronove a major part of that? Yes, I believe so. If I'm remembering incorrectly, or if I'm remembering incorrectly, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, I do not think that Ronove was originally a part of the episode three that Ryukishi wrote before. I could be remembering that wrong, but I think that's the case. Temple's Raven, was it? What an amusing and nostalgic move. To think that the, the day would come when it would be introduced to Battler. It's a classic move to use against the Devil's Proof. Renove, I will make this move. Do not get in the way of my fun. So, you finally showed up, you flying witch. I see you still have that undignified laugh. This guy was talking behind your back just now, telling me about how your laughing lacks class, right? I'm offended. Is that true? By no means. I have only words of the highest heartfelt respect for my lady. Why would I speak such gossip? I can't believe you can say that so brazenly. Doesn't look like we'll be getting along well together. <laughs> well, that's fine. Let us return to the conversation. Hembel's Raven is used to show prove using the contrapositive. Essentially, it's a move like this. What must you do to prove that ravens are black? Huh? What are you talking about? Pr prove that ravens are black. Wouldn't you just have to catch the ravens and check to see if they're black? That is right. You must simply prove that if it is a raven, it is black. And do you see that if you prove that if a bird is not black, it is not a raven, you would reach the same argument? If you go throughout the world and examine all birds that are not ravens and prove that none of them are black, then as a result you can claim that therefore birds that are black are ravens. This is called an argument by the contrapositive. Is that difficult for you? Yeah, no kidding. I have no idea what you're saying. Battler Sama, what about this example? Let us say that you have two boxes, and one of them is the winner, with a cookie inside. Of course, the other one is a loser and is empty. A missile shoots out of it and blows up your face. 
For example, let us say that we have two boxes here, one being the winner with a cookie inside and the other being the loser, which is empty. Now, if it holds that there is a cookie inside, it is the winner, and at the same time, it also holds that if it is not the winner, there is no cookie inside. When such a relationship exists, we call the latter the contrapositive. If when if A then B is true, then at the same time, if not B, then not A is also true. Well, that's obvious. If the one you picked was the loser, then you would automatically know that the other one was the winner. In other words, if you'd chosen the box at random, whether it's the winner or the loser, you'll be able to figure out which box has the cookie in it after your first move. That is correct. If the cookie is in the box you open, then the devil's proof is satisfied. You can prove directly that this box is the winner equals this box has a cookie in it. However, if the box that you open is empty, then the reverse, Hempel's Raven, is satisfied. Because then it holds that this box does not have a cookie in it equals this box is not the winner. And that means, as long as we accept the premise that there are no more than two boxes, the contrapositive shows that the other box is automatically the winner. Well, I think I'm starting to see your reasoning. Only poison can stop poison, and the only twisted and only twisted logic can stop twisted logic. Then what? How does that overturn my claim that no doubt there's a 19th human hidden on this island? So even if all the 18 people have alibis, that does not amount to an acceptance of witches. Very well. I will tell you my move. First of all, you are stating that if the culprit is not among the 18, then the culprit is a 19th person. <laughs> So if you use the contrapositive, it ends up like this. In short, if the culprit is not a 19th person, then the culprit is one of the 18. What? What the, what does that mean? All I've done is turn your move on its head. It shouldn't be that difficult to understand. Renove, explain. It seems your cookie in a box analogy from before will be easy for Batler to understand. Then forgive my presumption. Allow me to explain using my earlier example once more. Allow me to repeat one, once more my earlier story about two treasure chests, one of which has a cookie in it. In this situation, one of the boxes represents the 18 people, and the other box represents the 19th person. So the cookie would represent the culprit. Badler Sama, you open the 18 box. Because the cookie is not there, you have proven from the opposite direction that therefore the cookie is in the 19 box. In that case, if we reverse things further, we can also say the following. Namely, if it was first shown that the 19 box was empty, it would prove in just the same way that the cookie is in the 18 box. Battler Sama, this move you played in order to avoid having to doubt any of the 18 has in fact been used against you to launch the 18-person attack. Huh? What did you say? <laughs> If I go first and prove that the inside of the 19 box is empty, automatically, you will be forced to accept that the cookie is in the 18 box. All you have done is say this the other way around, you see. So, that move that I was so confident in was actually a double-edged sword? That's right. Your move to explain everything with a 19th person carries the risk that, if thwarted, you will be forced to accept that you can only explain things by using the 18. I see. Hempel's Raven. So, this is a countering technique. Wait, if I really think about it, this countering technique is far more disadvantageous for me than for her. The problem is in thinking about it like a cookie. If I imagine that just one of the treasure chests is a losing chest with a bomb in it, I can begin to understand it quite well. And if I think of it not as two treasure chests, but as 18, one for each person, plus one more for the 19th person. For a total of 19 boxes, it gets even easier to understand. First of all, one of the premises established by the human culprit theory was that the bomb would definitely be in one of those boxes. Because I hadn't wanted to place that bomb in any of the 18's boxes, I had used the devil's proof, and created the 19th box so I could throw the bomb in there. That much was alright. But Beato had struck back like this. If then, the 19th box was empty inside, that would automatically mean that the bomb was set in another one of the 18 boxes. If I could examine the contents of each of the 18's boxes, and show that the bomb was not in any of those boxes, I would be able to safely show that the 18 people were innocent. If that was possible, I would be feeling confident. However, in reality, that's as close as you can get to impossible. The police wouldn't come here in this typhoon. There would be no scientific investigation, no autopsies, no nothing. In short, I can't show anything decisively. 
It's impossible for me to find any proof other than simply gulping down whatever alibis each of the 18 give. The uh, audio stopped? Did it stop for everybody or just uh, one person? Is returned, but I don't know if that's just a me problem. I don't know. Well, if it's back at least, then there's that. <clears throat> Okay, there, there was a brief stop. Okay. Fair enough. It's impossible for me to find any proof other than simply gulping down whatever alibis each of the 18 give. In that case, I have to confirm their innocence both personally and perfectly. Like staying with someone the whole time, never letting them out of my sight for a second. If I do that, I can probably be sure of that person's innocence and that the bomb is not in that box. However, in reality, something like that is impossible. In other words, I have to expend an incredible effort just to check the contents of one box. And there are 18 of them. In other words, unless I bind all 18 of them in chains and watch over them, it's impossible to prove that all of them have empty boxes. However, Beato only has to open one box, the 19th box, and show that it's empty to prove that the bomb is in one of the other 18 boxes. Furthermore, there's no need for her to show which of the 18 boxes has the bomb. I have 18 times more work to do if I explain my pet theory than to explain my pet theory than Beato does for hers. Just as you know from the devil's proof, there are many cases in this world where refuting something would take a vast amount of effort that is impossible in practice. However, Himple's Raven turns that problem around and makes it possible to prove things easily. By using Himple's Raven, various reckless arguments become possible to prove. For example, let us say that I make the proposition all humans except me are foolish. Normally, in order to prove this, I would have to examine all of humanity except myself and show that they are all foolish. However, in reality, it would be impossible to investigate billions of people. It is exactly the same kind of effort that you would need to open all 18 boxes. <laughs> However, by using Hempel's Raven, the contrapositive of that proposition would change it and change it as follows. Essentially, take this. All humans except me are foolish, and to use your style of phrase, flip over the chessboard and you merely need to prove that not foolish equals me. And what do you think that means? <laughs> as soon as I know the fact that I am wise, I finish proving in an instant that every one of the billions of people in the human race is foolish. In less than a second, I can finish proving that the entire human race is more foolish than me. It's the strongest and fastest QED in the world. This is Hempel's Raven. What a ridiculous argument! It's a very, very convenient move. Not only demons, but gods also use it. When you propose blessed equals God's servant, the contrapositive is, if a human is not a servant of God, then he must not be blessed. So, in order for servants of God to prove they are granted fortune by their divine protection, they only have to prove that those who don't receive that divine protection suffer misfortune. Therefore, by bringing misfortune down upon those people who don't believe in their own God, they prove their own blessedness. It takes an enormous cost to give humans happiness. However, the necessary cost to bring humans misfortune is much cheaper. <laughs> so by using Himple's Raven, gods can actually give believers the joy of divine protection at the lowest cost. You, you demon. Oh, I'm Messed up! It seems we've gone off topic. Let us return to it. I've finished describing the move for my counterattacks. The counterattack to your claim that a 19th person is the culprit, therefore the 18 are innocent and the witch doesn't exist, is. In that case, if I can prove the culprit is not some 19th person, do we agree that the culprit must either be one of the 18 or a witch? I await your answer. For a while, I just stood there, shocked, completely forgetting to close my mouth. Just when I thought I'd gotten my own back on them by using their favorite move, just then when I thought I'd got my own ba yeah back on them by using their favorite move against them, the counterattack to that had been this reckless argument that I could not have even begun to imagine. Was it really impossible to continue denying the witch on an island with no more than eighteen people, and yet still believe in the innocence of those eighteen people? Was that just a delusion? Was I just trying to escape reality?
Not yet. Don't give up this struggle yet. Who cares about whoever's raven? They're just trying to speak in riddles by bringing up some weird bits of trivia. I'd use the devil's proof. Don't feel doubt in something you've... Doubt in something once you've used it. Believe in the spear you've lunged forward with. Apply even more force and gouge it in. The game is still in the opening. Do you already intend to spend this long thinking? <sighs> uh, wait a sec. I want to be sure. Well, yes, I did use the phrasing of a 19th person to make it easy to understand. If I can use the devil's proof to raise the number of people above 18, then what I mean is an unspecified large number of, number of extra people. You don't know if it's 10 or 100. Always one more than you assume. Understand? She had returned my twisted logic with something even more twisted. So the only thing that could counter that would be even crazier twisted logic. Hmm. I see. Even if I somehow prove an alibi for the 19th person, as soon as I do, you'll think up a 20th person and claim that they're the culprit. By repeating this infinitely, you would make it so that I keep searching for alibis for all eternity. I see, I see. <laughs> Just like a demon king summoning a plague of locusts. I wouldn't expect anything less from Kinzo's grandchild. It looks like you've been gifted with a talent in summoning. Uh, Daniel, I'm noticing the view count is still beyond 100, even though it's as far as episode 3. That's really cool. I'm glad the series is doing well. Me too, honestly. I'm really glad that you guys keep showing up for these, because I'm really enjoying like having the sort of chat interaction of having people... Uh, react to this stuff for the first time and like give their theories and speculate with each other. It's it's really cool. It's really fun. I am liking it a lot. <clears throat> I wouldn't expect anything less from Kinzo's grandchild. It looks like you've been gifted with a talent in summoning. In short, it's impossible to continually prove an alibi for the ex existing outside of the first 18. How do you like that, Beato? Now that I know that we're having a battle with twisted logic, twisted logic, I won't lose. <laughs> How foolish. Who do you think I am? I am the Endless Witch, the Infinite Witch. For you to challenge me at infinity is absurd. Having control over infinity means that I am also able to kill infinity. When your 19th person folds, you will, call, you will call a 20th. And when your 20th person folds, you will call a 21st. And when your 21st person folds and your 22nd person folds, you will call it a tw tw 23rd, a 34th, a... I can't... <laughs> you don't give me uh, commas enough to pronounce that, Beatrice. Damn. <clears throat> you think you can trifle with me for all eternity? I laugh at infinite regress. <laughs> the infinite doesn't affect me. Oh? Well then, how will you kill my infinity? Just try and show me. I have the power to speak the truth in red. <clears throat> Here it comes. When I speak in red, it contains absolutely no illusions. If I say once in red that there are no more than a hundred people on this island, you will no longer be permitted to create a 101st person. <laughs> Come now, battler. What truth shall I tell in red this time? When sh where shall I strike for the kill and force you into hopelessness? <laughs> Kitty with the five pounds. My GF has started asking me when the next of these streams happens each week because she can tell how much I look forward to them. Aw, that's so cute. I'm glad to hear that. Come, show me your usual frightened face. What? <laughs> Why are you laughing? I wonder what kind of creepy face I had, creepy look I had on my face as I laughed right then. That red sure is scary. Every time it jumps out, I'm driven into the depths of hopelessness. But I had already realized it. There was no need to be unnecessarily afraid of the red. You've brought out your secret weapon again. So? What and how will be how will the great Beatrice Sama speak in red this time? Oh, what do you mean by this? Suddenly looking so relaxed. 
Sorry, but I've been waiting for you to take out that blood-red treasured sword. Let's see. What will you proclaim in red this time? You aren't gonna say the culprit was one of the 18, are you? Let me warn you, that would be self-destruction, self remember? That would be the same as throwing away your own witch theory yourself. A complete resignation. That's right. The red isn't always necessarily to Beato's advantage. On the contrary, she, if she used it the wrong way, it's dangerous enough that she could bring about her own death. If she used it carelessly and said something which ended up denying herself, that would be exactly the same thing as self-destructing. Of course. It would also be sad and difficult for me to accept if you told me in red that one of the 18 was the culprit. No matter who the culprit actually was, it would surely bring me some tough emotions. But before that, it would mean your defeat! Saying it in red that the culprit is a human is equivalent to your proclamation of resignation! If you want to strike me a blow so badly you're prepared to die at the same time, I think that's a pretty interesting move. However, this battle will end in my victory. Beatrice's red was truly her secret weapon, her treasured blade. The things she spoke in red would become solidified as the truth, and no amount of evidence or counterarguments could change them. They had been cut down to size so many times now, rending in two any supports my heart had to lean on. However, if she used it carelessly, then I could find a little information about the truth. In the last game, especially during the chapel's locked room trick, I had taken advantage of that, and had once closed in on her almost completely. But she was also pretty sly. She had learned from experience, and since then had started using discretion in the timing of the red. The feeling of tension was almost literally like a battle with real swords. Our Master Seven, it would break my heart if any of them was the culprit, especially Goda, whom I met two hours ago. <laughs> What can I say? I liked his pudding. It was good. A guy that good at pudding can't be a killer. <sighs> this feeling of tension was almost literally like a battle with real swords. This was a battle of high intelligence. No, not of intelligence. It really was twisted logic. This world's craziest and worst battle of twisted logic. So, now it's your move. That's right, to use your Hempel's Raven. First, you'll have to confirm in red how many humans there are other than the 18. And after that, if you proclaim in red that none of the people in that group are the culprit, that's right, that might be a fatal wound to me. I'm surprised that you no longer even have an atom of fear for that red which you feared so much. You're quite sturdy. Unsheath it, your treasured blade. A single perfect swing and you might be able to break me this time. Who knows? <laughs> Interesting. I wouldn't have it any other way. Agitator. Provoke her. Drive her into a corner to make her speak in red. Of course, her red has always cut right through my only threads of hope. But don't be afraid of that. On this island, overcome with falsehoods and illusions, the only thing I can trust is the information that she speaks in red. It's my only way across the chasm of hell. Just a single tightrope. Her merciless blood-red blade is the only way I can survive. This isn't just walking on a tightrope. It's literally like walking on the edge of a blade. Of course I'm afraid. In terms of her contrapositive, my victory condition, the denial of the witch, meant that the culprit was a human. But I didn't want to search for the culprit amid the 18. Therefore, I held on to a weak point since I had to deny the witch and the 18 at the same time. Since I had been unable to understand that last time, that was where she had hit me, leaving me tattered and defeated. But that's all right. Let her hit me. Let her attack. No problem. Someone said it once in an old sword fighting movie, that a good fortress has one and only one intentionally weak point. The enemy would gather there. They would be lured there. And that would be where the actual battle took place. As long as I understand my weak points, and as long as she wants to attack those weak points, it's as if I've induced her to attack there. Carefully judge the distance from your enemy, and retreat step by step. Make them draw their sword first. The more she recklessly flourishes that red, the more chances I'll have to strike back. Don't be afraid of the red. Keep the pressure on so that she's forced to refute with the red. No matter how oppressively she speaks in red. Yes, that red itself is the same as fresh blood spurting from her wounds. Come on. What's wrong? First of all, why don't you tell me in red how many people are on the island in total? If you don't, your raven can't cut me up. Hmm. <laughs> How surprising that you can be this desperate and yet this difficult. One cannot make light of someone putting their life on the line no matter what the era. 
It's no surprise that you're Kinzo's grandchild. The more cornered you are, the bolder you become. <laughs> Ronave cleared his throat. You appear, you appear to be at a standstill. The black tea I worked so hard to make is getting cold. Uh, what did he just say? I scrolled past it. Getting cold, m'lady. Okay. <laughs> Ronave, who was supposed to be her ally, roguishly rushed her next move. Beato smiled back, probably intending to demonstrate that she was still relaxed, but she couldn't hide the sweat building up on her forehead. By now, she had completely lost that relaxedness which had allowed her to turn her nose up at her worthless opponent. Of course, she probably wasn't really cornered by something like this. She was just being cautious. Until now, I had been inexperienced. I didn't have a good grasp on how to fight, and I was underpowered as an opponent. However, now that we've reached the third game, she realized that I was starting to become skilled. And she had grown more cautious, thinking even more carefully, thinking over, thinking every move over carefully. Sure, that's just fine, Beatrice. And sorry to have kept you waiting. Are you happy now? Well, I kept you waiting, huh? <laughs> sorry, couldn't help myself. Now things are starting to get interesting, right? <laughs> Butler. This isn't going anywhere. Then, should I just dive right in and go with the usual? Huh? The usual, you say? Then by all means. If I don't hear that, I guess I just won't get the sense that we've started. The first move was mine. Here I come, Beato. Repetition requested! There are only 18 people on this island! <laughs> if I hear you say this in red, I'll have no choice but to doubt one of the 18. Since it could no longer be the work of a 19th person, all doors will be closed to me. But I believe that the culprit is definitely not one of the 18. There's no way that any of those 18 could commit such brutal murders! I'll say it again. Repetition requested. There are only 18 people on this island. I decline. I won't say why. Whew! I had avoided what would have been the worst red for me. If she had repeated that, I would have been faced with the two worst choices of accepting the witch or suspecting one of the 18. Like last time all over again. But Beato had not proclaimed my ultimate and greatest weakness in red. She had declined to repeat it, even though there was no reason why she should have, shouldn't have struck even though it was a weakness she should have been drooling at. She hadn't sliced me up with red by using that move, which should have been as good as forking the rook and the king. This was a big sign of my advantage. That's right. The culprit isn't one of the 18 people. I won't doubt anyone. And since the culprit isn't a witch either, it means that a 19th person exists on this island. And that's you. A person who is grandfather's mistress of 30 years, has been living secretly in a hidden mansion in the forest for a long, long time. The human Beatrice! That's right. You aren't a witch or anything like it. You're just a human who's been living on this island in hiding for several decades. <laughs> Did you just call me the Endless Witch who has lived for over 1,000 years a mere human? <laughs> for a while, Beatrice continued to laugh unpleasantly, gloating or maybe spiteful. Are you ready? I'll keep going. Again, repetition requested. There are at least 19 people on this island. Beatrice fell silent once again. The feeling that confirming the number of humans on this island might possibly stand to give, him some, give her some large disadvantage was probably making her extremely cautious. The red had already become a foothold for my counterattack. With that in mind, the red had become a risk for the witch. But, if she could repeat this, her Himbel's Raven wouldn't work. In order to break my Devil's Proof, first, the existence of a number of people outside the 18th needed to be confirmed in red. That's right. She couldn't break the existence of a 19th person unless she used red. I had closed Bea to win, giving her no choice but to speak in red. There really was a way to fight in this witch's game. It's alright to decline. If you can't say it in red, then that will mean the total number of people on this island will be 18 plus X. That X is a pretty huge piece to allow me to have on the first move, isn't it? After all, from then on, all of the tricks with the basis it was impossible for any of the 18 will become explainable with a human X outside of the 18 people. 
and that's a huge piece that can break open any locked room hinging on everyone having an alibi. It's just like a bishop in chess, which can cut a thin line through enemy forces as long as there's a slight gap. It only exerts an effect over squares of the same color, but it has a great ability to control the board. <laughs> it looked like Beato also understood well her current plight. She couldn't let such an important piece go, especially this close to the beginning of the game. If she pulled out her red-treasured sword, it wouldn't be that difficult to save that piece. But Beato was completely aware that I was expecting it. She was afraid that a careless red truth might end up strangling her own neck. Because, in the first place, a witch was something which should be denied in red. Believe. Don't doubt. Witches don't exist! Something like that can't exist in this world! It can only exist in the cracks of reality. They are a fragile existence, curled up in these cracks, frantically trying to protect themselves from the brutal winds of truth. And they can only barely exist like a mirage by surviving on falsehoods and fantasy. In other words, the red which only witches can use is the very reality by which they risk denying themselves. The more they brandish their red words, the more they begin to lose, bit by bit, that crack in reality inside which they can endure. This is why they don't want this is why they don't want, through the red, to carelessly lose that crack in reality which is based on fuzzy information, or in other words, fantasy, because they understand that they would be gradually cornering themselves. Of course, she would never admit it, because if she did, it would be the same as admitting that she is something that can't exist in this world, like an imaginary number. Don't be afraid. Stay strong. She knows this deep down and better than anyone, that her red treasured sword can't be easily used without considerable resolve. wrong. I'll say it again. Repetition requested. There are at least 19 people on this island. Hmm. I decline. At the end of a long, long time spent deliberating, letting a single deep breath escape, she quietly, she quietly proclaimed her refusal. I had just thought that she'd use it. But Beato refused to speak in red, even though it would cost her victory in this opening part of the game. You declined, yes? Which means that from now on, I can create as many fictional characters' exes outside of the 18 as I want. Do as you wish. I have declined your repetition. Isn't that enough for now? The reason I declined was... No, I will not reveal that for now. You will know soon, in any case. <laughs> Still acting tough, I see. Red that I deliberately don't use is in itself a fitting use of red. You called it my red treasured sword. A pleasant analogy. I will use it too. A treasured sword is at its best when it's sheathed. In fact, there are times it can instill even more fear because it is sheathed. That's right. As I fight, I always have to keep in mind when you might turn everything over with those red words. It's some ser pretty serious pressure. And there are times when having a repetition decline makes things harder for me. Those times I can't tell whether you can't repeat because my guess was right, or whether you're just misleading me and letting me think whatever I want. In that sense, yes, I see. A sheathed treasured sword. What does it matter? If I'm going to push you off the cliff anyway, I might as well let you climb a little higher first. We still have barely begun. Much is left to come. I'll resign from this challenge. Go and get drunk on your faint victory for now. Only for now. That bitter comment did, in fact, appear to have marked at the end of the game's opening battle. Even so, I couldn't relax my guard at all. I was unable to relax my feeling of tension until I was greeted by the sound of Ronove's applause. Spectacular, Battler Sama. I suppose we could say that this game has started with at least the opening unfolding to your advantage? No idea. I still don't know whether this piece was something I tore from her with my own hands, or whether she guided me into taking it. After all, knowing you... You probably know that I'm being led into a trap and that clapping is just a barefaced lie, right? How could you think that? I'm innocently celebrating your ability that has enabled you to take one shot at Milady, though granted it is only the opening. After all, Milady is a person who's quick to become arrogant. I believe that a little stimulation such as that makes for a good medicine every once in a while. Oh, you got your cat? Good. Allow the cat to join in the festivities. This butler of yours sure has a vicious tongue. 
Is that so? Sometimes he enrages even me. My, my, how incredibly rude of me. Well then, milady, Bathler sama would you care for some more black tea? The game has still barely begun. Please, leave any to your pastries that might adorn this game to me. Please, do not hesitate to advance further in the game. I will. Let's move forward. Now is when it really starts. <laughs> Very well. Let us advance the clock. Renové, black tea, please. Certainly. What about a cookie? No need. Give it to Beelzebub to keep her happy. Remain silent for now. While listening to the sound of the demon butler pouring, her, pouring tea, the witch closed her eyes slightly and fell into silence. For some time, she was l deeply lost in thought, but eventually a roguish glint came into her eyes. Very well. Why don't I inform you now why I declined to speak in red for the very first move? What? Bring it on. Show me what you've got. <laughs> it really is a big piece that you'd hate to miss. It may be hasty, but allow me to move. I won't use red, but from here on, Rosa will explain on my behalf. Listen. <laughs> of course, I agree as well. You too, right, Rosa? Rosa? Huh, uh, sorry. Uh, me too. I agree. What's wrong, Rosa, son? You've been really quiet for a while now. You feeling sick? From the beginning, Rosa had never been one to willingly cut in on the siblings' fights. But even so, she seemed unmotivated, and had almost said nothing at all during this night's conference. The whole time she had been hanging her head and appeared to be thinking of something else. You've been in a daze for a while now. Do you think you can protect the inheritance like that? You're also the mother of your child, so get a stronger hold on yourself. I... I'm sorry. I imagine you woke up quite early this morning. If you feel sick, you shouldn't overdo it. The beds have been prepared in the guest room. How about taking a rest? I will guide you. No, uh, I'm fine. Thank you. What is it? Is there something you're worrying about? No, not really. Are you sure? It feels like your mind has been elsewhere this whole time. I wonder if that has anything to do with what we've been talking about. At those words, everyone stared at Rosa together. As if in response, Rosa's shoulders quivered. Apparently, Kyrie's guess hadn't been wrong. Nor did Rosa deny it. No. Um... <sighs> she swallowed whatever it was she had been about to say and went silent again. By now, even the other siblings were also beginning to realize that something about her demeanor was different from usual. What is it? You've been weird for a while. Do you have something on your mind? All of us are just sworn to remain united, haven't we? Don't be all friendly now, unfriendly now, worrying by yourself. Let's talk it over. Rosa, tell us. Pressed by the men one after the other, Rosa made up her mind and nervously began to open up. It was almost as though she was trying to confess to some modest prank which she had inadvertently brought about a serious situation. Such was the atmosphere in the room. No, um, this mistress of grandfathers, this Beatrice, is she really, um, still alive? I was wondering. Huh? Obviously she's alive. She's sending letters to us. What more do you want? Whether she's healthy or not's a different story, though. The lovely woman in that portrait must be getting up there in age by now. I think she's healthy. People who are crafty when it comes to money are healthy no matter how old they are. Evil plans might even be the best rejuvenating agent. <laughs> she can't be... alive. What did you just say? Beatrice is dead. I... I killed her! What... what did you just say? What do you mean, Rosa? But, but it's... it's not like I was the one who killed... 
I was the one who brought her to a place like that. I really did kill her. I tried to make myself believe it was a dream. It really wasn't after all. Which means this is a letter from Beatrice's ghost. <laughs> it was so sudden that everyone was lost for words. Rosa kept on talking, unable to stop, holding her head as her hair flew all about. Please, calm yourself. Rosa-san! I, I have absolutely no clue what's going on! Already dead! What do you mean? I think it means two things. First, it's literal meaning. And second, it substantiates that our earlier guess was correct. Which means, Rosa, you have met with Beatrice? I've never heard Rosa speak about that once. Rosa, when was it? When could you possibly have met Beatrice? Long ago. Long, long, long ago. We just moved over to the island, and I was young. It wasn't my fault. It, it's not like I killed her. <laughs> Calm down. Nobody's blaming you for anything, all right? First, drink some water. Okay? Nazi saw the picture, please. Uh, uh, yes. Here you go, Mrs. Sutter. Please, calm yourself. <sighs> Until Rosa was able to regain her calm amidst her ragged breathing, no one was able to speak a word. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I figured the, the water was right there, so I might as well. All right, <clears throat> everybody. This is the last chapter I'm reading for today. But we'll be getting some juicy information in this chapter. Beatrice, I've been calling to you for a while. Did you not hear me? Hmm. Were you? My apologies. I was lost in my thoughts. Forgive me. The weather is pleasant. I see. I can understand how the weather has stolen your heart. Will you drink your black tea here? Who am I? I will bring some black tea now. Wait here for a while. Forget about the black tea. Talk with me. Very well. Kinzo had used the excuse of going to bring some black tea to try and interrupt the conversation for the time being, but his attempt had been very transparent. I sat in the garden chair and beckoned Kinzo to do the same. Kinzo sat down heavily, exaggerating his age. For a while we sat, appreciating the silence. Who am I? To this day, no one has answered me this question. For some reason, everyone averts their gaze and evades me. I've known you for a long time. I think of you as my best friend, even as a father. That's why I want so much for you to tell me. You must know who I am. Why do you worry about something like that? You're a Beatrice, the master of this mansion, is that not so? What more could you want to know? I do not know. What's this? Don't you even understand what it is you want to know? That's baffling. In my younger days, I sometime, sometimes found myself wanting to play in the maze of thought that has no exit. Maybe that is what worries you. What your worries are. Kinzo laughed as though it was a trivial matter. However, I couldn't help but feel that this behavior was nothing but another attempt to force me to stop my further questioning. So not even you will tell me that. After all. There's nothing to tell. You are Beatrice. Isn't that more than enough? No, that's not it. What I wish to know is not of my name. It is who I am. Who am I? What am I? How long have I been here? And how long will I continue my days here? I really should bring some black tea. Do you not think it is a waste of all this fine weather? 
What is this all about? Somehow it looks like the story of your past, right? It appears so. To think that we go this far back. Wondering who you were. Looks like you had some pretty high-minded worries. That is to be expected. At the time, I was unable to understand who I was, or why I was alive. Well, in puberty, everyone's captured by those philosophical worries, wondering what meaning there is to their life at least once. Doesn't it just mean you had this kind of charming period once in your life? What's this track again? Uh, White Shadow. Yep. I have been in that mansion since the time I was born, and I lived only inside the mansion. Of course, I was able to go out into the garden, but the area around the mansion was surrounded by a very tall fence, which I was unable to leave through, and I would be told severely that I mustn't leave. I could walk freely throughout the mansion and the garden, but my desire to take just one step outside of those of my own accord was never granted. What do you mean by that? Are you trying to say that for as long as you can remember, you were always a bird in a cage? I thought that that was just how things were. After all, I had been living like that as far back as I can remember. I didn't even think to question it. What in the world are you? That's it. That is what I also hope to know. <laughs> I'm sure you'll say something like, I wasn't a human, I was a witch, right? No, that's not correct. Not yet correct. Or should I say it was once correct? I was constructed by Kinzo, a human built by a human. No, maybe I should call it a cage made of flesh. What's that supposed to mean? This is starting to sound weird. You probably won't believe it anyway. Listen first. I was a great witch who had lived for 1,000 years, but at some time I was summoned by Kinzo. And by his hidden arts, I was bound as his prisoner for eternity. Never heard of that before. From what us here in the Ashiramiya family, you were summoned by Grandfather. You made something like a devil's contract with him and gave him the gold. Yes, that is correct. Then I was supposed to hide myself until the contract was over. But, well, it's tough being a popular woman. By some turn of events, Kinzo fell in love with me. Grandfather's nearsightedness might have got, must have gotten pretty bad. With astigmatism, too. <laughs> to fall in love with you, of all things. <laughs> Well, to me, it was supremely annoying. However, the power of humans is a frightening thing. He exhibited fearsome power and rooted me to this place. He said I wouldn't be freed until I nodded my head in agreement. Such an overbearing man. Isn't that awesome? Everyone knows Grandfather's obsessed with the occult, but who knew he had the power to root down the great witch Beatrice-sama? <laughs> Ridiculous. You think I believe such a weird story? As I thought, you don't believe. All I believe is the fact that you lived in the hidden mansion in the mi middle of the forest. You're the 19th person on Rokenjima, right? Indeed. Just as you imagine, this is deep in the forest of Rokenjima. A hidden mansion not to be found from the outside world. Its name is Kuidorian. Which means Nine Birds Retreat. <clears throat> Come to think of it, I heard that the guest house's real name was Torayon. I see. The naming sense is similar. So, you were Grandfather's lover who lived here in secret. Isn't that right? Lover isn't the right way to say it. You should probably call it Kinzo's unrequited love. I spoke of it just recently, correct? He fell in love with me of his own accord. He then courted me, but I rejected him. Then, I was shut up in this hidden mansion. No, I shouldn't say that I was shut up in the mansion. It would be more correct to say that I was shut up in this body. I have no idea what you just said at the end there. You'll make fun of it and not listen, right? After all, you said that you don't believe in witches or magic. If you have no ears to hear I, what I tell you, saying it would be, a pin, be the, bleh, would be the pinnacle of foolishness. I'll decide whether I believe it or not. After all, if I don't hear it, the story won't move on. Tell me, the story of your past. All right. I refused Kinzo when he courted me, but he was not a man to lose heart just because of that. He wanted to get my consent no matter what. He shut me up in this mansion and spent an eternity trying to win my heart. He really is overbearing. No one likes a man who can't take a hint, right? <laughs> Regardless of whether I responded to his courting or not, 
to make a man so desperate for me was, well, as a woman, it wasn't unpleasant. However, I never nodded my head. I tried to what I could to escape his restrictions, but the barrier was firm and I couldn't break it. And then? After trying to resist in various ways, I eventually reached the conclusion that to escape from Kinzo's barrier, I would have to throw away my body of flesh. The physical body is a vessel which carries many restrictions in terms of magic. Throw away your body of flesh? What's that? Something like an out-of-body experience? Well, if you want to think of it that way. However, I am not a spirit. Even though I am a witch, in the beginning I was born with a human's body of flesh. So, for me, throwing away that physical body, while it didn't mean the same thing as death, did require a corresponding level of resolve. So in other words, you made up your mind that you couldn't be released except by suicide, is that what you mean? It wasn't suicide. It was nothing more than throwing away my body of flesh. Of course, becoming nothing more than a soul is a precarious situation. When the soul leaves its body of flesh, it is constantly exposed to the strong winds of the sun. It was not easy for me to maintain myself and avoid being scattered by them. It was a final measure that I wanted to avoid if I could. However, there was no other way to break through Kinzo's barrier. <laughs> After all, I am a free spirit. I couldn't stand being kept in a cage until Kinzo's life was over. I couldn't understand this story Beato kept going on about, about throwing away her body of flesh, as anything more than suicide. Grandfather persistently courted her, and to escape from that, she chose her own death? So you're saying you committed suicide? What are you saying? Isn't that you, sitting carefree, there in the garden chair? That's right. That is the new cage I was given by Kinzo. Cage? You mean this mansion? No. I mean my body, relaxing in that garden chair over there. After I became a soul and tried to escape. Even then, Kinzo had no intention of allowing me to escape. <laughs> yes, indeed. He is a frightening person. Normally, seeing the woman of your own one-sided desires take her own life should be enough to bring anyone to their senses, even if their love was a hundred years old. I suppose it makes him somewhat of a mage after all. <laughs> Don't try to speak in riddles with that incomprehensible witch girl talk. In short, what are you trying to say? The Kinzo didn't let me escape even after I became a soul. Human emotions are terrifying, but he would be able to exhibit this much power. Try tying down a spirit of the dead was not a level readily attained, even for a mage seeking that as his specialty. Because I knew that, Kinzo's fearful magical power shocked me then for the first time. Yeah, uh, everybody in the chat right now that's like, uh, Kinzo sucks. Oh yeah, he sucks even worse than you could have possibly imagined. I hate this dude. I hate this dude so much. Then Kinzo seized my soul and brought me back. However, a cage to hold a seized soul cannot be made, not from iron nor from lead. There is but one exception. What? You aren't going to say it was a magical cage or something, are you? Wrong. That body of flesh over there, just like yours or mine, only a cage made of flesh and blood can tie down a spirit to this world. Kinzo shut my soul up once more into a cage of flesh built to be exactly like, the, like me. Hmm. So in summary, is it something like this? Grandfather persistently courted you, you started to hate it, and you committed suicide. But you weren't clever enough to finish the job? Damn, you really took a roundabout way to say something like that. No, that's wrong. My soul was shut up in the seed of a homunculus, and I was born out of a test tube. Huh? Ridiculous! That's goddamn impossible, and you know it! Kinzo accomplished even the miracle of creating life, and only to shut my soul up in that cage. That he would show such magical power simply because of his own love. A thoroughly terrifying person. Uh, okay. It's really gotten to the point of ridiculous now. Ridiculousness now. Say whatever you want. I won't believe a word of it. Just do whatever you like for hell's sake. What is this unpleasant attitude? <laughs> In the beginning, I showed a little interest, thinking there might be some huge hint hidden. But the more I hear, the weirder this story gets. This is supposed to be a game about denying witches, but I get the feeling that I'm suddenly being made to just swallow a witch's story. Sorry, but I don't feel like listening to this anymore. Just keep rambling on to yourself as much as you want. I'll just be digging out some earwax or something. Hm. 
When I started showing a cold attitude, Beato acted unusually discouraged. Of course, her expression was still brazen, but I had the feeling that I was able to catch a glimpse of loneliness because I hadn't found the story of her past interesting in that really easy to understand expression of hers. For some reason, that slight reaction made her seem pitiful. So even though I couldn't keep my so even though I could ki ah, even though I kept my couldn't care less attitude, I decided to humor her slightly. Damn, damn it! Even though she's an irritating witch, I'm still weak against her because of her her chromosomes are XX. <laughs> Dude, Battler, what? I love when Beato's expression changes and then immediately changes again. What a great use of the medium. Yeah, she does that a lot, and it's very, like, subtly used, and it's really, really good. I like the nuance of Beato's emotions a lot. Well, I have absolutely no desire to believe you, but keep going. I'll listen to your story in place of cookies. So you treat the story of my past like cookies? You think that if you abuse me like that, I will so casually tell you? After I made fun of her, Beato, Beato reacted a little sensitively. It looked like, even though making fun of people was her specialty, she was horrible at being made fun of by other people. Just then, my cup of black tea suddenly made a sound, surprising me. Milady's soul was seized and breathed into a cage of new life. In other words, Milady received life as a human once more. Before I had realized it, the demon butler had appeared and taken my cup, and was adding more black tea to it. Renave. That is enough of that story. He says it is too ridiculous to even listen to. I now also feel ridiculous and have no intention of speaking. Some new cookies are currently being baked. I thought that until then the story of Milady's past would be a perfect substitute. <laughs> I already said that I've had enough talking about me. You're both unpleasant people. I'm leaving. Renovate, leave as soon as you're done serving. No idle talking with Battler. Certainly. I'll make an effort. Beato's confusing female short temper took hold of her. Oh my god, Battler! <laughs> there is so much gender going on this episode and you are not helping, dude. And she turned her body into gold butterflies, scattered and disappeared. And after that, only Ronave and the scent of black tea were left. I kind of feel bad for making her angry. It appears that you were aware of it, so there's nothing more to be said. Wait a second. Weren't you the one who pushed her over the edge? <laughs> My, whatever could you mean? Would you care for some sugar and milk? Just milk would be fine. And I also want some cookies. You're aware that baking that co the cookies will take some more time? There's a substitute, you said? Certainly. If you would listen quietly, I'll continue the story. She said something about a homunculus. I know a bit about that. It's that thing, right? From Full Metal Alchemist. I love that anime. <laughs> a manufactured human created with alchemy or something? Yes. Milady's soul was shoal. Milady's soul was shut up in a homunculus, and she was revived into this world, receiving life again as a baby. However, because she was a baby, even if Kinzo tries to profess his love for her, it would be useless. You aren't saying. Grandfather shut that baby up in this hidden mansion until he grew to reach the same age? Yes, that is what I'm saying. However, while her soul was the same, the human spirit receives a strong influence from its vessel. Milady lost all of her memories of the past and grew up as a very normal human girl. And you're saying that's the Beato sitting in the garden chair? Yes, that's correct. She grew to be completely identical. However, she did not possess her powers as a witch. I must stress that Milady was a human. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys, it's fucking rough! Beato, who was sitting in the garden chair, looking up at the sky, asked that same question again. She asked who she was. The meaning of those words was finally starting to click. She couldn't understand why she was living here, all locked up. Grandfather had seized Beatrice's soul, shut it up in a body of flesh, and then shut that up in a hidden mansion. However, since she had lived here since the time she was born, she couldn't even understand who she was or why she lived shut up in there. Wait, wait. Who would take such a stupid story seriously? Why don't I change my interpretation? 
Essentially, couldn't it be something like this? Grandfather met Beatrice. He then fell in love with her and courted her, but she didn't nod her head in agreement. And he got so angry and shut her up inside this hidden mansion. Beatrice tried to escape, but no matter what she did, she couldn't succeed. So she finally chose her own death. And then... Huh, maybe there was a girl that looked just like Beatrice. No, a baby. And Grandfather raised this child with care. But maybe Grandfather didn't view this child as his daughter. Shut my soul up once more into a cage of flesh. Those words probably meant that he didn't view this kid as her child, but as her reincarnation. Maybe that's what it meant. If you interpret it that way, even a story that weird might make a little sense. No, no, no. This might be some bullshit Beato cooked up to confuse me. As if I could accept any of this. In the first place, Kudorian, was it? There's no proof whatsoever that a hidden mansion actually existed. Couldn't this be something she just fabricated on the spot? A hidden mansion called Kuidorian does exist in the forest of Rokenjima. That is the place we were just talking about. Huh? Uh, red? Runaway used the red to say that Kuidorian actually existed. Did that mean the same thing as the red Beato used? Even if I'm not, not, not much of one, I'm still a demon all the same. Please keep this a secret from a lady, yes? I, yeah. Beato, who knew I would try to trip her up, had grown extremely cautious when using red. To think that Ronave could also use that red. Of course, it's the red of a crafty man. I don't know how far I can accept it. But anyway, I might be able to get a hint out of it. So, that Beato relaxing in the Garden of Kuidorian, and that conversation she had with Grandfather, were the truth? Yes, it is the truth. In the past, the pair actually had a conversation like that in this place. Th thanks a lot. I'll ask for some more red. She said that she was born from a homunculus, but does that kind of unscientific magical thing actually exist? I'm unable to answer that question. The reason is that it would cause a stalemate. A stalemate? What do you mean? It's a chess term referring to a state in which, similar to a perpetual check, any further progress in a game becomes impossible. This is the opposite of an endless repetition of moves, and refers to a situation in which all moves disappear, resulting in a kind of deadlock. In chess, this would lead to a draw, just as if there were a perpetual check. However, there's no draw in the game between you and the lady. Therefore, I am unable to answer a question in red that would bring about that stalemate. You're speaking in riddles by saying something that I don't really understand. But when it comes down to it, you're just trying to trick me because you can't say in red that something magical like a homunculus exists, right? If I were to say in red that witches exist, what would you do, Vathler Sama? Hmm. That's where we're having what what we're having this big fight over whether or not to believe, right? If you told me that outright, there'd be nothing more to discuss. It'd be game over. If I said witches exist in red, you would have no room for argument. However, since the reason would never have been made clear to you, Battler Sama, you probably wouldn't accept it. However, after being told that in red, you would have no room for argument and would have not been shown any proof. In this situation, Battler Sama, even though you wouldn't be able to admit defeat, you would have no way to make a counter-argument, and it would become a deadlock. Even though checkmate would not have been reached, no more moves would exist. Since you would not be able to make up your next move, it would never become the lady's turn, and the game would stop there for all eternity. As a result, my lady would be unable to force you to submit. That would be a deadlock situation. In order to avoid that, I'm unable to answer questions of this form in red. So, to cut to the chase, you mean the questions that leave no room for discussion are prohibited? Well, that makes sense, I guess. If I was told witches exist in red, I'd have to give up from the start. I'm pleased that you understand. I believe we might be able to work together if you ask a question of a different form. Can you respond to the repetition request she dodged? about the number of people on this island. If Milady held back on the request, then of course I cannot respond. As Milady's furniture, I am unable to act too forward. Renove made an exaggerated gesture, trying to act like a loyal retainer. This guy's so shameless. <sighs> Just when I thought you might be useful. I'll give up on that and search for a different question. That's right. I was forgetting to check something important. This is a story about Beato's memories, right? When did it happen? It couldn't be happening right now, right? Correct. This is the world of 1967. It is the world of 19 years ago. Hmm. 
Let's go through the story one more time. I wonder if it couldn't be something like this. Grandfather had a person with whom he fell in unrequited love called Beatrice, and he confined her in this hidden mansion and continually courted her. But she was stubborn and didn't say yes. Eventually, she grew pessimistic about being unable to escape from here, and probably committed suicide. And then, her soul was put in a homunculus and... No, no, if I accept that, it's the same as accepting a witch. I can interpret that part like this. She probably left a daughter behind when she died. That talk about the soul being put in a new body probably meant that grandfather raised that child believing it to be the reincarnation of Beatrice. In that case, Beato must have existed on this island for at least the last 19 years as the 19th person, and then, um... I'm starting to get confused. In any event, none of this leaves the realm of guesswork. The only thing I can definitely say in red is that in 1967, in a hidden mansion on Rokenjima, Beatrice existed as a human. That's all. That's correct. In 1967, in a hidden mansion on Rokenjima, Beatrice-sama existed as a human. Oh, thank you. That really helps. Congratulations. With this, you've made clear the existence of the piece known as the 19th person. The 19th human outside of the 18 who you can blame, just as you longed for. A sacrificial sheet that you can shift the blame of any crime onto. And you must be so glad that it is my lady. <laughs> Can we all go up and go out and beat up Kinzo, please? I, yes, please, let's gather a squad. Let's break his knees. Ronave laughed indiscreetly. Somehow I didn't like his phrasing, so I didn't feel like laughing along with him. That's right. Auntie Rosa said it. Beatrice is dead? I killed her? What does that mean? As for that, it may be faster to see the actual circumstances rather than listen to me tell you. Let us advance the clock a little more. Renové pulled a stylish pocket watch from his pocket and made to wind the crown. And as soon as he did, I saw gold butterflies gather behind Renové's back and take the form of a person. Was it Beato? I quickly realized that it was someone else. It was her, that oldest sister of the Seven Stakes, who loved tormenting me more than anything else. If I don't think myself lucky to see, if I don't think myself lucky to see that sexy ass, I won't be able to play along with their torture game. God, Balor, dude, literally being like, oh yeah, it's it's uh it's fine if they uh hack me into a million pieces. At least I get to see a butt. <laughs> uh dude. Renove sama So, you were still here. This is an urgent call from Beatrice sama My, my. What kind of urgent business could it be? It appears as though I've spent slightly too long chatting with you, Battler sama Well then, Battler sama if you'll excuse me. Please continue to enjoy your game with the lady. Yeah, yeah. I'll enjoy it as best I can, because the conversations are more lively with you than be with Beato. And you use the red more graciously. Come talk again any time. Battler Sama, despite how I look, I am the lady's furniture. I cannot do something that the lady does not wish. What I said in red was something that normally should have come from the lady's mouth. I did nothing more than announce the red truth in the lady's place as she sulked. So, she really was sulking then. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing me and Ronove incomprehensibly hitting it off, that st seven stakes chick cocked her head slightly. Ronove Sama, we're keeping Be Beatrice Sama waiting. Let us hurry. Yes, I will come immediately. Well done, Battler Sama. I shall see you later. It appears that we've finally started getting along. As I thought, I have the feeling that we can become good friends. If by that you mean partners at gossiping behind Beato's back. Munave Sama! Yes, yes. Then, if you'll excuse me. Maybe it was because she didn't like seeing him act friendly with me, or maybe it was because she had been told to hurry. The Seven Stakes babe bellowed sharply at Ronove, and he laughed foolishly and disappeared, as if running away.
Uh, yeah, Elster, the, the question that you just asked, I cannot tell you the answer to that. I cannot answer that question. <clears throat> hmm. How could I, the eldest sister of the Seven Stakes of Purgatory, be called on for this level of work? Beatrice-sama could easily have told one of the younger sisters who look like they have so much free time for something like, for something like this. Sheesh. Why so grumpy, girl? I de yeah, I decline to repeat, but it it's more in the vein of what Ronave was saying. If I give an answer like that, then that would just give the whole game away, wouldn't it? One way or the other. So. <laughs> if you're so hungry, eat a cookie or something. Why don't I give you the last one? <laughs> Hmm? How thoughtful. Then shall I take one? I lightly pushed the snack plate with the last remaining cookie on it over to her. Thank you. As though coming as a replacement for the short period at the end of her sentence, a sharp sound pierced the table. The nails on three of her fingers had sharply extended, and were stuck a hair's breadth into the gaps between my fingers on the hand I had used to push the plate. It had happened in an instant, so for a while I didn't even realize that her fingernails had grown. The tips of those sharp nails were like blades with a red manicure. The spaces between the bases of my fingers prickled. Those razor-like blades were sticking sharply into the back of my mind, in into the back of my hand and into the spaces between my fingers. By those three blades, my carelessly outstretched right hand was not even permitted to shake, and all I could do now was allow a single line of cold sweat to drip down. Wowee. Isn't it about time you cut your nails, babe? Lucifer. That is my noble name. Honored furniture serving Beatrice Sama and the eldest sister of the Seven Stakes of Purgatory. I'm not like my disgraceful and cretinous younger sisters. If you don't show the proper respect, you will regret it. How would I regret it? I don't have a clue. <laughs> Stupid kid. Do you really want me to play with you that much? You really can't get me out of your mind. I'll thrust my stick deep, deep into you and make you really enjoy being gouged, got it? <laughs> you bitch. One day I'll push you down and say that back to you. Oh, really? I'll be looking forward to that then. <laughs> Rosa eventually regained her calm. The men wanted to hurry her into talking faster, but Kyria intervened. If something like she had just mentioned really had happened, it was an abominable past that she wouldn't want to remember. After taking several deep breaths with her hand over her chest, it seemed that she had more or less gathered the resolve to talk. God, the, the, the fact that, like, Kyria is the one who consistently intervenes to sort of, like, try to be kind to Rosa when she sees that everybody else is, like, awful to her is kind of interesting. Uh, it should probably not surprise any of you to know that although it's not the most popular ship of the uh, the adult women in <laughs> in this game, uh, Kyrie and Rosa is one that a lot of people uh, talk about. Obviously the other one is Natsuhi and Ava. <laughs> How old was I then, I wonder? Probably middle school, or I don't remember well. Anyway, I think I was about that old. Which means, maybe about 20 years ago? Back then, my grades weren't very good and my mother always got angry at me. I was trying to do my best in my own way. But I couldn't respond to mother's expectations at all. Mother was always very strict with Rosa. I sympathized with her at the time. Hmm. And you could say that even though you were always talking behind her back. Would you give it a... Did you, bleh, wait, did she get cut off or... Sorry. Oh, you say that even though you're always talking behind her back. Would you give it a rest, Ava? So, where'd you meet Beatrice, Rosa-san? Hideyoshi-san. Hideyoshi-san, you mustn't rush her now. It's all right, Rosa-san. Tell us at your leisure. Thank you. It was a day when I had been scolded particularly harshly by Mother.
even though my tutor had promised to keep it a secret. Apparently, they told Mother all about how I had complained. Mother scolded me horribly, saying that I was a disgrace to the Ushiramiya family. Of course, I was doing the best I could. But I had none of Kraus Nissan's dignity. I couldn't get excellent grades like Eva Nissan, and I had no leadership like Rudolf Nissan. I never stood out, didn't particularly excel at anything, and I almost wanted to ask myself why I'd even been born into the Ushiramiya family. I didn't know why I had been born. On that day, I had the experience of my mind going blank for the first time. For the first time since I was born, I realized that in addition to facing or surrendering to my problems, I had the third choice of running away. Even though I say run away, there was no way I could have left Rokenjima and gone somewhere else. But anyway, I wanted to run away from the mansion and the way I was at the time. In a way, it was like running away from home, or maybe a half-hearted suicide. I wanted to disappear. Or maybe it was that childlike form of resistance where I tried to make my parents worry by disappearing. I thought childishly that if I went into the center of the forest, I could escape from the Ashiramiya house. Or maybe I could get back at them by getting lost and making them worry. So then, you went into the forest that you've been told not to get into? Go into? Yes. After reaching the beach, I followed alongside the ocean. I didn't have any particular reason. But I felt that if I went around to the opposite side of the island, there might be a place that no one knew about, which might become a hidden house just for me. Starting by the beach, it'd be impossible to go all the way around. It becomes a cliff part way, right? There'd be no way you could pass that way. Of course. So I kept going wherever I could, and kept going deeper and deeper in. It was a horrible forest without any path, but that was comforting to me then. If I could make it through such a dangerous forest, then it would be that much greater of an escape from the Ushirumiya family. Which made me feel good. How shameful. If you were scolded because of your grades, all you had to do was work harder. You mustn't say that. Doesn't Rosa have her talent as a designer instead? Literally, this could be taken as him covering for Rosa. But everyone knew that Rosa's company was not making any profits. Quit it. Now isn't the time for sarcasm. And then you arrived there by coincidence? Beatrice's hidden mansion. Rosa nodded weakly. About how far did you walk? Could you show it to us on a map? Nazi son, is there a map of this island? No, not right here and now. That would be impossible. I was just walking randomly. Even if you showed me a map, I wouldn't know. And 20 years have passed since then. I probably couldn't reach it again even if I went into the forest. Hmm. Several people let out dejected sighs. It was vividly clear, even in their haste. They had thought of some hint related to the witch's epitaph, or maybe even the gold itself, might be residing there in that hidden mansion. The only part of Rokenjima that got made ready for development is the area around the mansion. The rest is completely uncultivated, and it would probably take considerable effort to survey the entire island. But just knowing that it actually exists is helpful. It would take some money, but if we enlisted an aerial photography company to investigate, or ask the contractors who constructed this mansion about what happened at the time. We could probably find some way to search for it. Yes, there should be more ways to do it now, that, that there isn't a question about whether it exists or not. Hmm. It's probably worth investigating right away. We'll do the investigation together as siblings. We won't let you do it alone, Nissan. But it wasn't certain that the gold was hidden in that secret mansion. But it seemed the fireworks between Kraus and Ava had already begun. Give it a rest for now, you two. Rosa, please continue. Yes. Blindly, randomly, I kept running on and on. Suddenly, it felt like I had come across something like an animal trail. I had no idea how far I'd walked, and I was very tired. So by then, I was just naturally taking the easiest path to walk on. See you later, Ulster. Hope you have a good night. As I did, suddenly, right before my eyes, a very, very tall fence appeared. It was a fence wonderfully adorned, adorned in a gothic style. 
For an instant, I spun around, thinking that I must have might have returned to the original mansion. Of course, there were fences around the mansion to stop us from entering the forest. But this fence was decorated differently, and most of all, it was very tall. It probably reached a full two stories up. It was covered with ivy and created a mysterious, solemn atmosphere. At the time, I believed the legend of the Witch of the Forest, Beatrice. I had been told that she was frightening, but some of the servants told me that she would help sometime. She would sometimes help you if you respected her. But since I had started to lose confidence in how my life was going, I believed that the only way I could be saved was, was by receiving her help. So that's what made me think it. I believed that this was the fence of the mansion of Beatrice, the Witch of the Forest. I thought that if I could meet with Beatrice, she would definitely save me. So I thought I would try to go in. But that fence was very, very tall, and it didn't look like I could go over it. So I decided to walk around it. I thought that if I did, I would eventually reach a gate. But it wasn't that easy. The fence had a length to match its height, and no matter how far I went, I didn't reach a corner. It might have been enclosing a very massive area, or maybe it just felt that way because my child's legs made it difficult to walk in the forest. Anyway, because I couldn't find a gate for a while, I started to feel sad, as though the witch had rejected me. As I did, I eventually came upon a large tree, whose twisted root had bent the fence. I might get my clothes dirty, but if I crawled, it looked like I would be able to sneak in. And that was the hidden mansion. I don't know whether it was the hidden mansion we've been talking about. Still, at the very least, it wasn't a place that we know of. It wasn't as though I came out into a garden as soon as I passed the fence. I had to continue through a lot more uncultivated forest after that. And then, the forest suddenly opened up, and what appeared there was an unbelievably fantastical scene. To think that Rukenjima, where I believed no one other than us lived, had been hiding such a wonderful mansion. A beautiful flower garden spanned the front of the mansion. It was a flower garden of a completely different design from the rose garden we know so well, and was very lovely. Of course, the mansion was also wonderful. It was one or two sizes smaller than ours, but it was very elegant and yet a lovely mansion. Then, I saw her. I saw her sitting in a garden chair, positioned to give a, new, a view of the flower garden, wearing an elegant dress. It was that black dress embroidered in gold that we would later know from that portrait. I hadn't seen an elegant dress like that except in fairy tales and on the stage of musicals. That a person would be wearing it as their normal clothes, that in itself seemed quite fantastical. That magical scene was enough to make me lose my sense of reality. If someone had told me that it was a dream, I might have nodded obediently and waited to wake up in my bed. Since in my shock I had forgotten to hide myself, she eventually noticed me. At first, her expression was quite listless, but when she noticed me, her eyes opened very wide. It was only natural. A guest that she didn't know had suddenly appeared. I automatically bowed my head, feeling that I should greet her and apologize for entering without permission. Who are you? A new gardener? Those were the first words that she said to me. That calmed me down a little bit, because I realized that she could be talked with. Because I hadn't been turned into a frog just by meeting her eyes, like the terrifying witch in that fairy tale. I... I'm sorry. I shouldn't have entered the garden without permission. Who are you? Name yourself. I... I'm Shiramiya Rosa. Shiramiya? Huh? So, you are one of Kinzo's family. Huh? Uh, yes. I'm Kinzo's daughter. Uh, good afternoon. I was just a little surprised. After all, father was a great man feared by everyone, and she had referred to him without using honorifics. So she quickly became frightening. After all, if she could refer to my fearsome father that way, she must be a witch with incredible power. After staring at me curiously, she beckoned me to come over to her. And I obeyed, although filled with belated trepidation. After all, I thought I really might be turned into a frog. And the closer and closer I got, the stronger that fear became. After all, I said it several times already, but... 
that woman in her dress, and the flower garden and the mansion. If that entire harmony was so fantastical and beautiful that it seemed separate from reality, it surely wouldn't have surprised me if she was actually a witch. And I was truly lucky. She didn't turn me into a frog. And I awkward, as I awkwardly stood there stock still, she motioned to an open chair and urged me to sit down. Sit. Welcoming and speaking to those who visit this garden for the first time is my only pleasure. That said, I have nothing else to find pleasure in. As she said that, she showed an unhappy smile for just an instant. Because I was full of a strange mix of tension and excitement, I rudely asked her a question suddenly. Um, are you the witch of the forest, Beatrice? Indeed, I am Beatrice. As I thought, Beatrice actually existed. Did she look just like the portrait? Yes, exactly like the portrait. So she wasn't just a witch from father's imagination. And then what did you talk with her about? As she prepared some black tea, she, uh, as she prepared some tea, I was just so used to it being black tea. As she prepared some tea, she asked me various things about myself. First, she was surprised that I had come through the forest. It seems she believed that many dangerous wolves lived outside the fence. So when I told her I had reached this place by going through the forest, she was very surprised. She asked how I had managed to escape from the wolves. Did I give them biscuits and they let me go? Or did I cover myself in a magic cloak or those kinds of things, I think. <laughs> that sure sounds like a witch. What an interesting person. Quiet, honey. It was a long time ago, but didn't Father threaten us saying that wolves lived in the forest so we shouldn't get close to there? Yes, there was a time like that. Ridiculous. Even though Japanese wolves went extinct long ago. What a childish trick. I don't remember, though. Did Dad really tell us something like that? It was the Witch of the Forest, right? I don't think I've ever heard about any wolves. You were still in elementary school, don't you remember? You actually went and replied that you want to try petting the wolves. So Father immediately gave up the wolf story and changed it to the story about the witch. Such obvious lies. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, the witch story had much more of an immediate effect on you, Rudolph, than the wolves. I remember it well. Don't you remember those nights when you clung to my back? <laughs> I see. Even Rudolph's son used to have that cute period. Oh, put a lid on it. I was just a kid. Well, anyway, if Father was the one who shut up Beatrice in there, it makes sense that he would use the same wolf story. To him, the vast forest of Rokenjima was a wall that shouldn't be crossed. Dividing his two incompatible worlds, the Ashiramiya family and his mistress's mansion. If you think about the height of that fence, it does seem that Father had turned the whole area, garden and all, into a giant jail cell. Like a national border dividing his two separate worlds. Forget the wolves. Were there any kind of stray dogs there at the time? It could have been a fence to protect against those. There are no wolves or stray dogs in Rokenjima, just as Nissan and Kyriasan are saying. The fence was probably a border between us and Beatrice. However, if she innocently believed the story about the wolves, that's pretty naive. That's nothing like the way I'd imagine a witch. That's right. I also sensed that. She was very pompous, just like my image of a witch. But she was somehow very childish and, how should I say it, too honest? She gave me the impression that she didn't really know anything about the world. If I had to describe it, it was almost as though she had come from a fairy tale land. She was truly a mysterious person. What happened after that? Did you end up talking about Dad at all? Yes. Once every few days, sometimes on an arranged day and sometimes very suddenly, Father would appear casually and they would drink tea together or take a walk together or something, she said. And that, by coincidence, she was by herself on the day I visited. I see. Truly a mistress, then. My, my. Well, I don't know how much younger she was, but not bad, Father. Shut up, Krauss. Shut up. Shut up, dude. I remain firmly convinced that it was not an indecent relationship. Gosh, you are an idiot. There's no way a lover's meeting between a man and a woman wouldn't have some sensuality. What happened next? When did you talk, what did you talk about after that? Because I had introduced myself, I then asked her about herself. When I did, the atmosphere quickly grew depressing. 
How should I say it? She seemed very listless and lonely. It was the same expression as the one I had first seen on her face. Well, that's because she was his hidden mistress. If she just walked around wherever she liked, she might have been discovered by mother. I'm sure the situation was almost like a house arrest. Even though she had beautiful clothes, a beautiful mansion, and a garden, she must have felt very constrained. No surprise she felt it hard. And then? There was definitely something on her mind. I remember getting the impression that it wasn't something that I could resolve just by talking to her, and feeling very sad about it as well. She seemed to have forgotten that I was even there. She was gazing vaguely off into the distance and was silent for a long, long time. I thought that I just must have said something wrong, but it didn't seem to be the type of atmosphere where I could offer words of apology. So I too remained silent for a long, long time until she remembered that I was there. When she did, she muttered unexpectedly. Oh, one of my favorite tracks in the OST. <laughs> Are there really no wolves beyond the fence? Hmm? Yes. I've never seen wolves, even in a zoo. What is this zoo? Uh, it's a place where they keep all kinds of animals. They're full of rare ele animals like elephants and giraffes and pandas. <laughs> Are there no wolves in a zoo? Then, um, that might not be scary. Even if there were wolves, all of the animals are put in cages, so it's safe. So you can feel safe as you look at and learn about them. The Witch of the Forest, of all people, was for some reason scared of and didn't like wolves. I remember it looked pretty comical. How does that differ from myself? Huh? She didn't even know about zoos. I explained how fun zoos could be but it was very difficult to get a person like her who had never been to one to understand. Quite the opposite, as I explained it to her. Her expression grew increasingly dismal. She couldn't see the difference. It seemed that although this mansion surrounded by a high fence appeared at a glance to afford her a completely provided for life of comfort, she couldn't see how she was different from the animals shut up in cages. Who am I? Everyone calls me Beatrice. And it does certainly seem to be the name of a great witch, as you say. That's not me. I cannot use any magic. I simply have the soul of that witch sealed inside my body. Hmm? There was definitely something mysterious about her. It wasn't just that she was somehow at odds with the world, but it seemed that she truly believed that a thing called magic actually exists. I think she talked about various weird things, but I don't remember the details. All I thought was, this might be a pitiful person. She was unable to leave the mansion of her own will, a prisoner without even realizing it. And she didn't know anything about the outside world, didn't even understand who she was. She probably vaguely understood herself that she was pitiful, but since she didn't know anything, it seemed that she couldn't realize that this was unhappiness. Nason, long ago when I told you that I felt sorry for a bird in a cage, I remember that you said this to me. A bird that only knows the inside of a cage doesn't long for the outside. But she wasn't a bird. She was, ultimately, a human. Even if she had never been outside the cage, she understood that it wasn't the whole world. So, I invited her. Do you want to try going outside the fence? There really aren't any wolves? There aren't. You'll definitely be safe. I want to leave. The gate is always closed. There's the place I came in through. There's a crack that you can slip through. If we were to go through there, is there a world outside? Yes. There really aren't any wolves? <laughs> no, none at all. I had only planned to invite her for a short walk, but she kept looking over her shoulder at the mansion as though she were seriously deliberating over something. Then I learned what she was preparing herself for. I have had enough of this place. I want to go outside, and I want to know who I am, what's happening in this world, and the purpose for which I was born. I didn't know what her life had been like up until then, 
It was probably something that she couldn't express easily. If it was harsh, she just had to say that she wanted to escape. If it was sweet, she just had to say that she would stay. To liken it to something. Perhaps it was similar to how a hot fireplace on a winter day makes the air get thicker and thicker, giving you a headache. Even though you know that you shouldn't keep things the way they are, you still need the courage to open the window and be tormented by the cold wind. She was starting to realize that she couldn't stay there forever. She was starting to realize that she had to go out sometime. But since she didn't know about the outside world, to take that first step outside must have required an unimaginable amount of courage. And she had taken that into consideration and resolved herself. She had put up that resolution to go outside into words for what was surely the first time in her entire life. I hesitated slightly. It had been decided that she would live here by father. It was as if she was father's beloved bird in a cage. If I just let her escape, wouldn't I be harshly scolded by father? I want to see. Hmm? See what? I want to see. Sue. I was just a little surprised when she finally showed me a very soft smile. That might have been an inner peace coming from her newfound readiness to venture out from her cage. A soft smile which I wouldn't have imagined could, could have come out of that dark face. When I speak with you, I keep hearing about things I don't know. I don't know about this thing called school, nor about zoos. I don't know about movie theaters. I don't know about amusement parks. And I think from the bottom of my heart I want to know about them. Will you take me there? Huh? Y yes. I was nervous about how I would do it and keep it a secret from Father. But her face looked so happy. So I went along with her and nodded. But it seemed that the meaning behind my vague expression was not communicated to her. It seemed that she believed that I would really take her to all of those places if we left. She was pure and genuine. She had probably never been tricked by anyone. No. Maybe it should be said that she hadn't even been taught how to doubt. Her face was somewhat radiant, and yet pathetic. I wanted to somehow grant her modest wish. I have had enough of Beatrice. I want to know who I am. I want to start out as a new human, not Beatrice. So I want you to take me from here. I don't need tea anymore. I don't need this dress. I won't meet with Kinzo again. Please, take me from here, Rosa. However, that responsibility was one that a child such as me couldn't possibly bear fully. But her serious gaze and her brilliant smile, almost as though an evil spirit had lifted from her, made me feel a little courage start to rise up within myself. And this was definitely something that would get me in a lot of trouble. But it was definitely the right thing to do. I don't know how it will turn out, but I'll take her out. Of course, I wouldn't be able to ask help from father, and not mother either. Should I talk to Anisama or Onesama? No. What about that reliable Genji son? Or, that's right, what about Kumasawa san? To whom I could always talk to when, when I'm in trouble. I'm sure they'll be able to do something. Anyway, for now, I'll take her out of here, because this is no longer a place where she wishes to be. And so, I took her to the crack in the fence and led her outside. She was all nervous, checking to make sure there were no wolves around. But after that fear disappeared, she seemed somehow to be having fun even just walking around this dense forest. Every time she found something, she would ask me about it. And they were all really minor things. What's that flower? What's that leaf? And that sound? And that smell? It was really like the inside of that fence had been her entire world. So to her, who had stepped out of the world, this was, you know, it's strange. In the beginning, when I first saw her, I thought that she was the absolute incarnation of a witch relaxing by a witch's mansion. But now it was different, or actually the complete opposite. She had gone out of a world that she had believed to be finite and was full of joy at realizing for the first time that the world was endless. So everything she saw was new. It was almost as though, as though she was the one who had been thrown into a fairy tale. If she was Alice, then I felt almost like a rabbit holding a watch. To her, it was probably a really fun walk, 
filled to the brim with excitement. But as for me, the truth was, I was completely bewildered. After all, I had walked randomly to get there, so there was no way I could have known the way back to the mansion. There were no lights in the forest, and I hadn't brought a flashlight. I realized that it would be terrible if it got dark while we were still like this, and grew impatient. She was too innocent, and apparently she couldn't understand at all how frightening it would to, be face, to face the night of the forest. But I was the one who brought her outside. Somehow, I had to take responsibility and resolve the situation. So I thought that for now, we should just go out to the sea. If we then followed the coast around, eventually we should definitely be able to make it back to the mansion. However, that was much more of a problem than I had imagined. After all, I didn't have a map or a compass. There was no way I could walk in a straight line through an uncultivated forest, and I had immediately lost my sense of direction. I already had no clue by which trail I had come, and was completely lost. At this rate, night would definitely fall before I even knew where I was walking. But I didn't have the luxury to complain, because that woman following behind me was so innocent and having so much fun. Therefore, for the sake of her smile, if nothing else, I absolutely had to guide her out of the forest. Gritting my teeth so that I didn't show her a troubled face, I pushed my way onward through the pathless woods. And although we had various troubles, we were lucky enough to make it to the sea. At that time, I still didn't even have a clue where I was on the island. But for the time being, I was just a little reassured, realizing that if I just went around this way, I would surely be able to return to the mansion. Of course, although I said that we reached the sea, we were on top of a rocky cliff. The beach was far below us. I was tired from walking around the forest for so long, so I thought that even though it was a rocky beach, an open area would probably be much easier to walk in. So I planned to somehow go down the rocky cliff. It did look pretty dangerous, and I wondered if there was some other way. However, Beatrice agreed with my plan without any doubts. Even though she was probably older than me, she obeyed me truly obediently, almost as though she were some kind of chick who believed I was a mother bird. I searched to see if there wasn't some place where I could go down the cliff. Then I found a place where the cliff had crumbled into a slope. It looked a little dangerous, but if I went down on both hands and both legs, like I was crawling, I thought I would probably be okay. Let's go down here. Oh wait, that's <clears throat> Kid Rosa. <clears throat> Let's go down here. It'll be dangerous if you aren't careful. But for now, if we go down to the beach and walk along it, I think we can avoid getting lost anymore. Mm-hmm. If you will do that, then let's go. I'll find... I find this getting lost to be fun, also. I'm very happy. She really had no sense of danger. There was probably no mistake that she had lived a life without discomfort. Even though she knew it would get dark when nightfall fell, she couldn't imagine how dangerous the inside of a forest could be without a light. Furthermore, it seemed that she couldn't grasp at all how dangerous it might be if she fell from the cliff. I wanted her once more to be- I warned her once more to be careful. I cautiously examined the place where we could go down. It looked pretty high up. I think it might have been about 10 meters down. If you looked at it from the bottom up, it would probably have looked shorter than the roof of the mansion. But looking from the top, it felt almost like staring down from the Tokyo Tower's observation room. But Beatrice still appeared to be completely without fear. It felt as though she had never been taught that high places were dangerous. No, maybe she truly believed that she was a witch, and that she could fly, so there wasn't anything dangerous. Please be careful. It's pretty high. Mm-hmm. I will be careful. I see there's a beach if we go down there. Is there an aquarium there? No. There are no aquariums on this island, uh, but I think there are lots of fish in the sea. I see. So there are fish. Are there, um, whales and dolphins and penguins like you talked about? And no, you would have to go to an aquarium for those. And there aren't any aquariums unless you leave the island. Is that so? But I look forward to it. What kind of fish are whales? Um, they're really big fish and... Huh? Aren't they mammals? And they spit out seawater. Oh. And then the dolphins? Um, they're really smart fish and... Huh. Aren't they also mammals? 
If they're really smart and can be taught tricks and stuff. <laughs> then what about penguins? Um, huh? Wouldn't they birds? What's this? Didn't you say that there were fish in aquariums? Um, um, well, um, there isn't only fish. They're full of all kinds of things that live in the ocean. Oh, I am really looking forward to that. She made, some might have described it as a funny, rushed and short voice. No, probably it was a scream, I think. She suddenly made a sound like that. Her body separated from the cliff and gently fell down. I immediately thought to say to her, how many times did I warn you to be careful? It was the thought of a child. It was how a child immediately gets mad when something happens, trying to show that they're not at fault. Of course, I said it too. Are you all right? How many times did I warn you? So, after she fell from the cliff, what happened? What happened to her? Rosa. Rosa fell silent. Her gaze fell to her feet, as though she were seeing through to the floor to some disgusting memory. She died, right? Ava's brutal words were the ones that Rosa had most wanted to avoid. And when she was hit with them, she screamed in resignation. Yes! She died! It was a rocky beach! Many sharp and dangerous rocks lay exposed. Her eyes were still open. The blood kept pouring out. Suddenly, a red carpet was spreading out. I spoke to her, shook her. She refused to respond. Not even a blink. No, she wouldn't even close her eyelids. It was my fault. She was wearing a dress, remember? Even though I knew that her outfit was difficult to move in, I said that we should go down the cliff. She was incredibly innocent. So she obeyed what I said without any doubts! How long do you plan on remaining dead? Open your eyes already. Honestly, just turning into a lump of meat without me. <sighs> I was just flirting with your friend, the sexy-ass chick. More importantly, what is all this? Hmm. It is as you see. I missed my footing, fell down, and died. Did you say? Even though you appeared as the 19th person, you say you died? Don't mess with me. That can't be. Auntie Rosa was a kid, and, and she was just panicking. It's not like there was a doctor. She probably made a mistake thinking you were dead, and you probably, um, were in a state of apparent death or something, but actually alive. Right? It can't be. She's obviously alive. Otherwise, she wouldn't be here in front of me. Right? Madam Zawindis, do you think this is the moment Rosa became unable to move on from her trauma? I believe that this was absolutely an incredibly crucial moment in uh, Rosa's young life. I believe that, like, after this point, there's no way she could have been the same, like, ever again. <laughs> the kid-aged Auntie Rosa was shaking Beatrice's body, crying. I, too, stared into that face, but her eyes were still open, and it really was a corpse. I wanted to brush it off with something vague, like a state of apparent death, but from my angle, there was nothing apparent about it. She really didn't look anything but dead. Beatrice had fallen upside down from a cliff of that height, and her head had smashed against the pointed tip of those sharp rocks. You would die, wouldn't you? From that height, from those rocks. But I can't accept that. No matter how dead she looks, she has to be alive! And she became this damn irritating witch! That way, all of the inconsistencies fit. She'd been confined by Grandfather in a hidden mansion the whole time. And then, to avenge herself, she planned out her revenge and would go on to commit a number of atrocious murders. Auntie Rosa probably just mistakenly thought she was dead, but she was really alive, and as soon as Auntie Rosa left, she miraculously started breathing again. And then, she somehow lived until today and would open the curtain on the scene of her revenge. Otherwise, the facts don't fit together. I won't let you trick me so easily. 
Can you repeat it in red? That she died for certain? She has to be alive, right? It's obvious. How does that look like being alive to you? She's definitely dead. <laughs> My theory that the 19th person was grandfather's mistress, who was a human Beatrice, broke down. I thought I had managed to segue from a defensive position into a counterattack, but... Then... who are you? You just died! This very minute! You aren't going to say that you revived yourself with magic, are you? <laughs> I think that I've already explained it, though. The me that is lying over there definitely has my soul. But that body was nothing more than a cage of flesh tying me to the physical world. And that cage of flesh was thus broken. Do you understand what that means? I don't have a clue anymore. Keep having fun with your witch girl talk. I'll listen instead of eating a cookie. What the... It's empty. Hey, could I get some more black tea? <laughs> Run away. Our guest wants some black tea. When Beato clapped her hands, Ronove appeared. Butler sure are convenient. A refill, is it? Certainly. How much shall I pour you? Well, I've got more than enough to go with it. Half will be fine. Filling it to the brim regardless is the English custom. Even though just enough to wet my throat would have been fine, he filled it to the top with tea. I turned my back to Beato, sipping it in silence. Wait! Open your eyes! Beatrice! Rosa shook me. No, shook the corpse that had once been me. I watched over her from a short distance away. Ah, so I fell from there and died. I believed that was true for a while. After that, I saw Rosa spend a long time beside my corpse, then watched her as she ran away. Eventually, I realized that I was different a different individual from that corpse. That's right. I am me. So I've finally been able to escape from Kinzo's restrictions. Eventually, I felt the memory returning. The fact that I was an endless witch who had lived for 1,000 years. And then I remembered that I had been summoned by Kinzo, and for a long time had been imprisoned by him. While I had been imprisoned in a cage of flesh, I had completely lost my memory as a witch. However, thanks to Rosa, if you could say that, thanks to my accidental but fortunate death, I had now finally brought myself together. Rosa, you're probably regretting that you brought about my death. But as for me, I could even thank you. <laughs> Rosa was already nowhere to be seen. Had she gone to call a doctor, or had she escaped from a scene which had become frightening? That no longer matters. That soulless sh shell is no longer worth anything. All that aside, how frail I am now. Even this glorious midday sun is agony to me now. I destroyed my human form. Then, I changed it to several gold butterflies. Yes, with my magic power as frail as it is now, this form is easier. And to escape even a little from the light of the sun, I rode the wind and lightly passed over the cliff. It will probably be somewhat cooler in the forest. Anyway, I'll take some time to recuperate and regain my original power, as I think of how I pay will pay Kinzo back for all he has done. Dancing alone through the air, I looked down at the shore one more time. On the rocky shore lay the figure I had once possessed, and that I would eventually regain. Yep, this is Distant, which is also Haruka, yeah. For Daniel, who was asking in the chat. <clears throat> to regain the form of that physical body I have thrown away, it will probably take more than 100, 200 days. It might require 1,000 days, or maybe even more. However, I am the Endless Witch. The Golden Witch, who has lived for 1,000 years. Waiting an accountable number of days is no problem at all. <laughs> oh, Kinzo, you may regret that you are not here now. No longer will you be able to capture me.
And then, you changed into gold butterflies, hid in the forest, and waited for your magic power to be restored. Is that what you're saying? That is correct. I take this form to sneer at you, but normally it is easier magically for me to keep my form as gold butterflies. Don't stress yourself and stay in an easy form. I wouldn't mind not hearing your irritating laugh. <laughs> when I turned into butterflies and slipped into the forest, it was already no longer possible for Kinzo to find me. However, Kinzo was not about to stand there doing nothing. Still, he would be unable to immediately prepare a way to catch me. Therefore, he first moved immediately to prevent me from leaving this island. And to keep me from regaining my power. My, my. All I can say is that Kinzo's tenacity does defy the imagination. It is pretty tough to be loved by someone like that. <laughs> a way to keep you from leaving after you became butterflies. What, did he put a bug net around the entire forest? Indeed. He did the magical equivalent. Did you know? On the sea, in front of the harbor, floats a reef, on which sits a small shrine of Eastern magic. Ah, that. It was gone this year, though. It was a small shrine built long ago by a mountaineering es 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 I forget how you pronounce that word again. Ascetic? Ascetic? I don't know. Right? This island was originally an island of distortions. Magical beings and other beings of similar ilk were attracted to it. The lady herself is one of them, I imagine. How about some more tea? Ascetic, yeah, okay. I, I figured that that was probably the, the case, but I just wanted to make sure. How about some more tea? <laughs> Please. They did, they did harm to humans and probably left several eerie legends behind them. That small shrine was built in ancient times by an eastern, eastern mage who heard of them. A long time passed and that power was lost. By repairing it, Kinzo restored this island's barrier and once again tied me to this island. Can eastern magic work on a western witch like you? Normally the affinity is poor. However, for the purpose of sealing me there, in a way, it might have been suitable. If it was western magic, I would have some knowledge. For any barrier, there would have, some, have been some measures I could have taken. But Eastern magic is out outside my area of expertise. It was as if I was been being given chopsticks instead of a spoon for some soup I was trying to eat. In a space strongly controlled by Eastern magic, Western magic loses much of its power. It would likely have taken her a thousand days to regain her power, even under normal circumstances. And now it would take her much, much longer. So you're trying to say that it took you 20 years to regain your power and now you're revived like this? Those were horribly long years. I spent many days in the form of gold butterflies, found Kinzo's mansion, and watched over him every day. I lived through those days with no means to enjoy myself except to ponder how I would get back at him. What was fortunate for me during those 20 years? Kinzo tried to use every magic to find and capture me and failed in them all. A human, be a human cannot bring about miracles very many times. Even simply holding me captive for that long has been a miracle far above his place. It would be unthinkable for me to be captured like that multiple times. Grandfather said something in the previous game. It was something like, magic dwells in probabilistic material, miracles. Mm-hmm. While Kinzo searched for a hidden art to capture me again, he ended up at that. Then, he finally worked out the ritual involving the sacrificing- the offering of thirteen sacrifices to revive me again. Thirteen... sacrifices. That is the witch's epitaph. It is a poem of sacrifices. Six people on the first twilight. Two people on the second twilight. And then five more people on the fourth through eighth twilights. A forbidden ritual involving the offering of a total of thirteen people as sacrifices. Those sacrifices are chosen randomly, and the ones holding the ritual, Kinzo himself, is not an exception. You're out of your mind. Are you saying that of all the gruesome murders that occurred on- Are you saying that all of the gruesome murders that occurred on this island were all part of a weird ritual? I was vaguely thinking that this might be a possibility, but I can't just hear this as the truth from a witch and a demon and say, Oh, really? And then accept it. There are 18 people on Rokenjima. 13 are sacrificed. 
Only five are left alive. Then I revive. In other words, the odds that Kinzo will be able to meet me again are probably around one-third. He bet his own life on those odds, wishing for a reunion with me to be the last bit of his remaining life. You're saying he gathered our family for the sake of that fucked up ritual? Oh yeah, real fucking funny. Don't say stuff like that, damn it! It was according to the contract from the beginning. When Kinzo's life ended, all of the gold I had lent him and all of the assets that Kinzo had created were to be received by me. Kinzo put me through a nightmarish ordeal, but thinking back on it now, it was an extraordinary period, even amid the past thousand years. After all, the natural enemy of a witch is born him. To Kinzo, who offered me a chance to run away from that for several decades, yes, considering that among other things, I might have had a, ha, might have a slight debt to him. I decided to go along with Kinzo's game, and so first off, Kinzo returns to me the Ashirimiya family head's ring. It is the house... It is the house revived by gold, by my gold, you see. Then I choose 13 people arbitrarily as sacrifices. And as that unfolds, you people are thrown into total confusion. And show me various aspects of fabric of human relationships as you stand against me, which gives me great pleasure. I really do like this game of Kinzo's. <laughs> uh, is the Umineko OST on Spotify? Some of it is, not all of it, though. Ah, I definitely won't believe in that kind of magic story. Then who are you? You fell off a cliff and died, damn it! Your soul slipped out, became butterflies, and went to the forest? That's all a load of bullshit! But you are here. Who are you? Aren't you the 19th person? That is true. I most surely am the 19th person. <laughs> but it's no good, I'm afraid. It's no goddamn good at all. There are no more than 18 humans on this Rokenjima. What? what did you say? So you're saying the X of the 18 plus X doesn't exist? Are you saying the piece I took, the X, doesn't exist? <laughs> That's what it means. You have my condolences. However, milady, you truly are a fast worker. I thought that you'd let him flounder around a little bit more before turning everything over at the end. Well then, Battler Sama, would some more tea be agreeable to you? I, I don't want any, damn it! I don't believe. The culprit can't be one of the 18. Uh, then what the hell are you? Uh, why are you here? If the 19th person doesn't exist, then are you saying that you're one of the 18 in disguise? <laughs> For you, although you're reluctant to use it, doubting one of the 18 will serve as a final escape route, much like Castling. Care Baron Ross with the $2 repetition requested get owned battler L no bitches. <laughs> True. However, for me, the hard part is just beginning. You need only throw away appearances, and you can prepare a culprit freely amid the 18 people. Finding a route through those 18 pieces, in order to checkmate you and force you to accept me, will be truly difficult. Like hell I'd do that! I won't doubt any of the 18! I don't want to doubt! Have I really been cornered here again? Damn it, damn it, damn it! It looks like my game with you, which has lasted three rounds, is finally entering the, entering the end game, doesn't it? There's nowhere to run anymore, you know. <laughs> You don't want to doubt any of those beloved people in the 18, right? I can take that burden from you if you want. And yet, why do you refuse me? They say you should play the opening like a book, the middle game like a magician, and the end game like a machine. I'll corner you from here on, slowly, carefully, surely. Or on the other hand, would it be better if I pressed you all at once, as I would be fitting for you? That should suit you. Let's do that. I already have a thorough knowledge of which methods of attack you cannot handle. <laughs> oh. Is it roll call time? 
Battler and Jessica in the cousin's room. Canon in the servant room of the guest house. Genji also there. George and Shannon doing their stuff in the fucking harbor that I, or the little arbor area that I don't want to think about. At least we got to skip it this time, though. <laughs> In the dining hall, we have... Kraus. Rudolph. Kyrie. Ava. Natsuhi. Hideyoshi and Rosa. Goda is in the kitchen. Goaded with the sauce, you could say. Kinzo is in his study. I hope he stays there. I hope he dies. Unaccounted for right now, it seems like, are uh, Nanjo and Maria. Oh, well, we haven't seen Kumasawa either. And that is the strike of midnight, which means that the Epitaph murders will once again begin. But before we can get to that, I regret to inform you all that we have now reached the point that I wanted to stop at for tonight. So next time, the beginning of the ritual, but for a little bit, why don't we do as we always do, once they give me the chance to save. Yeah, all right, shut up, Kinzo. Don't even want to talk to you anyway. And let's get to the title screen. So, oh, okay. I don't even have the character's menu for uh, episode 3 yet, but I'll just hop in here, I guess. Turn on Kyrie and MatPat. Now let's talk. Iconic Laser with the $2. Great VA work this episode. Loving chat reactions. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this episode for quite a while. Even though there is oh, so much here that is like difficult to handle, it is also just like a very well-written episode. Like, God. God. Anywho. Everybody, it's time to chat for a little bit. Give me, give me your thoughts. What do you think is going on? This entire session is a lot. Yep, it definitely is. I have two theorious things to share. Absolutely, go right ahead. Uh, Daniel Espaniel, that red truth was such a boon. We can say for certain that while the magical killer was Beatrice, the mundane killer for episode 3 has to be one of the 18. No ifs, ands, or buts. I suppose so. We'll just have to see how everything pans out and how it's in terms of how it's depicted, but yes, that is a very big one to come swinging with. Um, but... That scene with Beatrice and Rosa drives me insane. Yeah, same. It's so, it's so sad. I actually, like, got really choked up voicing that part. Uh, June Pop. Okay, so not necessarily a theory, but Beatrice in the cage is described as a human. Does that mean she's a direct descendant of Kinzo or some random baby he picked up? Could be one or the other. We don't know. Currently. We don't know where that, where that baby came from, if indeed she's not just a magical baby that spawned from the ether. 
<clears throat> the current state of the Ashiramiya family was only possible to be achieved due to the gold Beatrice granted them, making the eagle as much hers as it is Kinzo's. Thus, Ronave and the Seven Sisters, <laughs> Ron and the Seven Sisters, my new band name, wearing it well as well makes perfect sense. But I'd also like to ponder on this homunculus business. I feel that the servants must be homunculi. This would legitimi legitimize the question of whether they're really human or simply furniture that Shannon and Canon continue to have, mm-hmm, and would make it more than a metaphor, which seems appropriate. I admit this seems incompatible with the servants being literal furniture, but this could be resolved with additional information regarding homunculi or perhaps beloved objects gaining souls. That is a very interesting way to look at it. And I'm glad that you're trying to link like things that were established earlier together in that way. I think uh, that is a really cool uh, perspective. <clears throat> uh, which is worse, Kenzo finding random babies or his? Uh, it's pretty bad either way, dude. I don't think there's any way around that. Um... I think the greatest strength of his writing is the gap between the repetition request and the no bitches moment is so necessary to help hide something. That may be true. Uh, Atropos, I've been reading Higurashi and my whole feeling is that this series sucks. Positive. <laughs> true. <laughs> it, it fills me with emotions that I don't want to think about all the time. You could say that I'm the one crying. Um... Daniel Espanol. Oh, you did. A, yeah, you did a fantastic job as Beatrice in the cage. The subtle differences in the voice was so touching. Thank you. I, I really wanted to try my best to introduce some nuance into that, especially because, yeah, uh, Beato in that in that scene is very different from the Beato that we know now. No more than 18 people, but furniture are not people, according to Beato. So Battler still has a possibility of X of like five, maybe, possibly. <laughs> Uh, I think he was using the orphanage to get servants from to perfect his Beatrice homunculi. Yeah, I mean, you know, some people have definitely talked before about uh, what he'd be using the orphanage for, so it's uh, definitely a theory. Uh, a synthetic human would still have the qual same qualities either way, right? I suppose it depends on who you're asking. But then again, uh, yeah, it would be difficult to, to uh, come down on something like that in the red. Maybe, if it's a, it's a matter of interpretation, I don't know. Uh, I remain convinced of Kyrie being a good witch. Part of why I initially came to view this was because her bearing a cross and Battler bearing this one as well. Someone else mentioned afterwards that it was an inverted cross and what seemed to be a counterpoint. I didn't have time then, but I would like to now respond to that refutation. Though it has in recent time come to be used as a symbol of Antichrist or Satanism, it was initially used as a cross of St. Peter. Some sources state that he's requested an inverted crucifixion to symbolize the inverted beliefs of those who crucified him. Others claimed that he felt a standard crucifixion would be too similar to Christ and that he was unworthy. This makes more sense to me and also works here, in my opinion. Would it not be appropriate for a good witch to feel unworthy to wear the cross proper? Also a very interesting way of looking at it. I, I had never thought of that before. That's actually really cool. Uh, given what happened to little Beatrice, I think Kenzo believes that 19 years after her death, she was enough for a second quote-unquote reincarnation and used the family meeting to start the game. Oh, okay. Uh, that was like one part of a message. I don't think you finished it yet. Uh, theory. The beginning states the objects broken or date fated to break again. Therefore, if one person does, they cannot achieve immortality. In that sense, I think that everyone who has died is doomed to. Interesting, interesting. So because De Beato has died, she is fated to die over and over again as well. Very interesting way of looking at it. Um, ba -ba -ba. Marcy, ever since I've watched your live stream the first episode, it got me to read all of Umin Echo in three weeks! Wow! Watching these streams, the context I have now is making me lose my mind. That's crazy! You read the whole thing in three weeks? I mean, I know that I've done a, a read in like two, but at least that was a reread for me. Doing your first read in three weeks is, is nuts. But uh, I'm really glad that you've been enjoying it. And yeah, it sure does become crazy in retrospect. Um, ba -ba -ba. I don't really have any theories or ruminations at the moment, but knowing that Rosa did meet a Beatrice when she was a child makes the tea room from the former chapter all the more fascinating. Yes. 
want to say thank you so much for your Umi Neko streams. I've been wanting to get into the series for ages after getting to Higurashi. So thank you. Your voice work is amazing, by the way. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. As I've said before, I'm, I'm really glad that people are able to get into the series through these streams. Lurf, you read Umi Neko in a week the first time. That's crazy. You were going at an even faster pace than me. Did you eat? Did you go to the bathroom? <laughs> Did you sleep at all? Uh, okay, it's a historian Sayori. Uh, I think you finished your thing, so let me go back up and read your first message. Given what happened to little Beatrice, I think Kinzo believes that 19 years after her death was enough for a second reincarnation used the family meeting to start the game. The various murders that occurred in impossible situations could be conducted by Kinzo slaying his family members or the family members destroying themselves in the paranoia of the situation. Interesting. Interesting. That's, uh, hmm. Interesting way of looking at it. Hmm. Yeah. When I when I think about that, like you know, if if that's if the ritual is a way of you know doing that of like creating quote unquote a new Beatrice, I don't know. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, I read the entirety of the manga in one point five weeks myself. I was on a cruise for most of it, but still. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the manga is slightly easier, just because, you know, it's not quite as long. Do we know that stuff that far in the past is still the truth to the other games as well? Um, y yeah, I, uh, I, th I think somebody has already said something here, I guess. Uh, but yes, those, those exact events uh, did happen in the past of all of the previous games as well. We are just only learning about it now, but it does apply to the other ones. Uh, da, 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 da. <sighs> Buffering. Oh, okay, I buffered for a second, I guess. But, yeah. I did consider Umi Neko maxing by reading him and watching the stream at the same time, but then I wouldn't be able to appreciate the voice acting from either. Oh. This isn't a theory, but just seeing the seeming relevance that Rosa had as a child for this witch juxtaposed with the hatred and fury she has when Mar whenever Maria mentions witches is an interesting gap to bridge. Absolutely. You can't help but wonder if that definitely has something to do with her feelings. Uh, theory, Kinzo is the devil. <laughs> True? <laughs> Something I always took as if it isn't happening in the two days each game covers. Safe to assume is true, if maybe not the whole story. Uh, otherwise, there isn't a good way to verify things. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, Marcy, this isn't exactly on topic, but have you read Last Note of the Golden Witch as well? Yes, I have read Last Note of the Golden Witch, and, uh, I guess whenever we get to the end of the series, if people really want me to stream it, then I will do so. <laughs> the manga for both series is inordinately great if there is a certain cherished scene you would have, uh, you have which you would like to see visualized. True, because the art is always really good. It's super good. Uh, is it long? Talking about last note? Uh, no. It's not very long at all. It's actually only, like, maybe four or five hours total. Um, also, I haven't actually read last note. Is it required? No. It is not required. It is just a, a fun little extra thing if you really want a little bit more Umineko, basically. I think Rosa might hate anything that reminds her of witches in Beatrice because of how she saw her die and finding her didn't help anyone at all. Possibly so. Um, actually, no, I'm coming in swinging saying that part of why Rosa hates when Maria mentions witches is because she doesn't want to be reminded of that capital T trauma. That could perhaps be the case. Mercy is so impressive to me that you're out here reading nonstop for like four to five hours straight and doing voices with no assistance. Genuinely incredible. Thank you. I always am so tired at the end of these, but you know, such as it is. Yeah, you weren't allowed to rest very much. No. No. Well, tomorrow we're streaming for 24 hours. Yeah. Yep. 
So, uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, I guess I should, uh, disclaim, uh, just in case. So, uh, Austin is doing a stream tomorrow, starting at noon CST, and it is going to be going for 24 hours. It is a charity stream for, uh, Palestinian relief funds and stuff like that, uh, to celebrate the 13th anniversary of Vast Error, and they're gonna be... Uh, guests, there are going to be different blocks, there are going to be announcements about the comic and stuff like that. Uh, it'll be on twitch.tv slash Deacon Reconstruction. Uh, hold on, actually, let me put that in the chat. So, yep, uh, that is happening, and I will be on it at some point, probably. Um, I mean, we live in the same house, so it's kind of unavoidable. Yeah, Marcy will technically be here the entire time. Uh, she will just be busy uh, being quiet and running social media in the background while I make an ass of myself. Yeah, pretty much. But I will join for some of it. By the way, uh, thank you for the very shameless plug. We yeah. love that here. We love to shill. Yeah, we, we do love shilling. Uh, anything else? Mercy is a bit of a goofy stream after reading the eight uh, chapters. Do you know if you'll go through any of the fan games like The Simpsons and D&D &D, mean Echo parodies? Uh, maybe. I, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, there's actually one fan game in particular that I really, really like, um, which is made by a friend of a friend, Umineta, um, called Purgatory of the Golden Witch. That's really, really good. I would, uh, wouldn't mind streaming that, maybe. Um, but it's definitely one that cannot be read until after you finish the whole series, so. You yeah, know. It actually includes uh, a fan interpretation of that scrapped character that I mentioned earlier that was in the original episode three but didn't make it into the final game. Uh, anything else? Anything else? I feel like I should sit down and make a doc that is all of the red truths so far shown in your playthrough. Uh, yeah, if you feel uh, the need to do so, that would probably be uh, helpful for a lot of people to keep track of. Um, but, you know, uh, feel free to do whatever you like. Okay, we are almost 30 minutes past midnight, and I think that the theories are slowed down. I apologize if I'm not going to catch anybody, but I'm very tired and very hungry, and I got some stuff to do still before I go to bed, so I think that that means we'll be closing this episode of Umineko for now, but uh, once again, I have very much enjoyed streaming tonight, and uh, I hope you guys look forward to the continuation of episode three next time we meet, hopefully soon. So, I will see you later. Bye, everybody!